Now we uh, move forward to the next uh, session. The next session will be technical session. And uh, uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six papers presentations. The first one is about deep partial uh, multiplex network embedding. So uh, do we have the presenter here? Uh, yes, I'm here. That would be good. So, um, Shuangi, yeah. can you just, uh, I think perhaps you need to make uh, chief and okay, that's good. You you are allowed to share your screen. So over to yeah. you. Okay. Uh, so can you guys see my screen? Yes, I can. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, this is Chifan from uh, Meta AI. So yeah, today uh, I'll talk about our work on uh, deep partial multiplex network embedding. So this is a joint uh, effort with my colleagues Yi, Anidu, Weining, Bing, Jingang, Xiaojing, and Dongfang. So, okay, here's the outline of today's talk. So I will first give some uh, quick introduction of, of this work and then talk about some uh, related work as well as uh, some motivation. Um, and then I will talk about uh, our model in detail, uh, followed by uh, some experimental results. Uh, finally, I'll uh, conclude the work and point out some future directions. Okay, so so what is multiplex network embedding? I think, um, so basically network embedding is an effective technique to learn the lower dimensional representations of nodes in networks. Yeah, I assume all of you guys already know this. Um, and um, so many networks uh, in, in real scenarios are usually with uh, multiplex or have multi view representations from uh, uh, different uh, relations. You know, sometimes people uh, also uh, call it uh, hit, heterogeneous uh, uh, networks. So for example, like uh, documents can have, uh, you know, hyperlinks, uh, you know, pointing to or connecting to each other. And they also can have, you know, attributes associated with them and tags and also text uh, uh, information. So another example is that like Flickr users have also have multiple views. For example, they have friend view, uh, share view, comments, uh, et cetera. So these are like, um, some examples of uh, real-world uh, uh, multiplex networks. So, uh, so most existing uh, multiplex network embedding methods assume that uh, you know all nodes in the uh, network have full information available in all the in all views, uh, which uh, is not uh, true for all cases. So basically, in real-world tasks, it is often you know the case that some of you suffer from a missing data and were resulting in a partial data. Um, so for example, we use the same example here, like documents can missing hyperlinks or tags and the users can missing, you know, connections or reviews and so on and so forth. So therefore this is a very, uh, you know, important and practical uh, research problem uh, to design, you know, effective uh, network embedding methods on partial uh, multiplex data. So um, I'll quickly talk about some uh, uh, background or uh, related work. So, um, you know, there are uh, single network embedding uh, methods like deep work, uh, node work, or graph stage, right? And um, there are also existing, you know, uh, uh, many uh, multiplex network embedding methods like uh, MVE, ME, and uh, MAGCN. So I don't want to talk about the uh, details about this related work, but uh, yeah, uh, if you're interested, you can uh, dip into our paper, dig into our paper and uh, find details. So what I really want to highlight here is that, um, so if you see the uh, the top uh, rows of in this table, these are like single network embedding methods. So, and the, uh, in the middle uh, of this table are the multiplex uh, network embedding methods. So basically, uh, none of them are uh, uh, dealing with the uh, partial data uh, issue existing in, in real world uh, data sets. And uh, on the other hand, uh, there are 
a bunch of uh, uh, models or, or methods that can handle like uh, partial uh, uh, multi-view data, which uh, for example, PVC or MVC. However, this method cannot be directly applied to uh, you know, uh, network embeddings. So therefore, uh, in our work, we propose a, a method called uh, deep partial multiplex network embedding, which are uh, trying to you know, handle this kind of uh, partial uh, data uh, scenario in network in multiplex network, network embedding. Okay, so uh, having uh, so the model details. So, so our model essentially contains three main components. Uh, which are uh, deep uh, reconstruction within each view. And second component is like a data consistency among views. And third one is like the uh, uh, standard uh, proximity preservation within each view. So I'll talk about uh, all these three components in detail later. So, but before that, let, let's look at a, a, a quick overview of the, uh, our model architecture. So in this, uh, uh, overview, uh, we have a network of five nodes, basically V1, V2, V3, uh, V4, V5. And we, in, the, in this uh, uh, scenario, we have uh, three views. So uh, V1, V2, and V3. So if you can see here, um, so each view suffers from some missing data. For example, uh, the node V4 has uh, missing the all the information in, in V1, as well as in V3 and the node V5 are missing all the information in, in view two. So, and our model uh, has uh, three main uh, components, as I just mentioned. The first component is called a uh, reconstruction uh, uh, component. Basically, we have uh, a design the audio encoder that can learn deep representations of the, uh, of the features in V1, sorry, in each view, I mean. So basically, for example, in V1, V2, and V3, we all, we all have its own, um, uh, audio encoders, right? And the second component is the called latent sub common subspace learning. So basically, all these hidden representations were projected to a common uh, 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 a representation, which we call it Y1 through Y5 here, right? So basically, if you can see here, uh, for example, uh, the node V4 here, uh, they're missing from V1 and V3. So here, Y4 corresponding to the representation of uh, uh, node V4, uh, you know, they, it don't have any information coming from V1 or uh, uh, V3, but it, there's information about this node in, in uh, V2. So, and uh, similarly for V3, uh, sorry, similarly for like uh, uh, node V1, uh, we have information from V1 and V2, but missing from uh, uh, V3. So basically we build this kind of latent common subspace uh, uh, module that can ensure the data consistency among uh, different views. And then the missing data can be uh, complemented from other views. And the third component is called uh, proximity uh, preservation. So basically uh, for each, uh, within each view, based on the, uh, the graph um, of, the, of that view, we can uh, calculate the, the proximity uh, metrics and then um, you know, all this latent, the, the latent uh, representation, the final latent representation, a uh, Y uh, would be, we will have, you know, a, a, a you know, consistency uh, or proximity preservation term, uh, which we make this, make sure that all this uh, latent representation are consistent with all the uh, proximity in, within each view. So, okay. Um, so here are the, some details of our, uh, of all the three components. So the first component, as I just mentioned, is a deep uh, audio encoder. Basically, it learns a deep representation of the node uh, feature using audio, audio encoder model. Uh, basically here, H is the encoder, and um, which encodes uh, uh, the original feature X into a latent representation. And then another decoder will decode uh, this uh, latent representation H uh, in, uh, back to the original uh, features. X tilde, and then which the loss is defined uh, by minimize, uh, you know, the reconstructed uh, feature with the original feature. So S here is the index of the view. Basically, from view one to view to the T uh, uh, view, uh, we, we with some other uh, reconstruction losses, and we want to minimize this 
kind of uh, uh, autoencoder here with, with respect to the autoencoder parameters here. So for the second uh, component, we call it uh, latent subspace learning or like data consistency among views. Basically, we learn a latent, we, we use a latent uh, common subspace learning uh, to ensure that the node embedding generated from different views are consistent. So, so here, H is the, uh, 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 the latent uh, representation from the autoencoder, and Y here is the common uh, uh, representation. And B here is the basis matrix for each view. So here I is the indicator matrix that representing whether the data is missing or not. So here you can see uh, this is a, a very standard uh, latent common subspace representation here. And the right part, the R here, is just a regular regularization term uh, 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 on top of uh, these uh, three uh, metrics we're trying to optimize over. The third component, as I just mentioned, is the proximity preservation uh, within each view. Basically, we use a graph uh, Laplacian uh, to uh, uh, enforce uh, that uh, linked nodes within each network have uh, similar uh, embeddings. So here, like uh, for example, uh, if PIJ is very, you know, is very high, then we want the the, the YI and YJ, which is the uh, latent representation of these two nodes, uh, to be as close as possible. And then we sum sum over all the uh, views. Okay, so the overall object, overall objective is uh, you know the uh, combination of these three terms with some hyper of trade-off parameters. And uh, we use a standard coordinate descent uh, or a method to iteratively solving this kind of optimi op optimization problem with respect to uh, each of the uh, parameters we want to optimize over. OK. Um, let, let me also talk about the, uh, also talk about the experiments. So after we obtaining the uh, embeddings uh, the common embeddings Y here, so basically Y here, we, uh, we can use that to do a downstream uh, uh, classification, node classification and uh, clustering tasks. So the data sets we're using are uh, four benchmarks, um, which are a coral, which is a coral data set, which is a, a you know, document corpus for paper citation network. And DBLP is also a network for DBLP data set. So Flickr is a data set that containing the Flickr photos uh, sharing from from the Flickr photo sharing service, and last phone uh, is a collection from a music network. So the, basically, here are the data statistics. So uh, the, the 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 second uh, uh, column is the number of nodes within each network, and then the third column is the total number of edges. And uh, uh, the fourth column means the total number of uh, views within that network, and then followed by the number of labels. Um, so for the last column, which so PDR is called a partial uh, data ratio. Uh, basically, it means uh, how many data is missing. How what are, what is the uh, portion of the missing data? So basically, if if it's large large mean so basically large PDR means uh, a large data are missing. So for example, if you see from for coral, um, you know the PDR is very low, which means um, we almost got all the features for all the views, like the, these two views. And for last phone, you can see here um, uh, almost half of the uh, you know features are missing, or information are missing from uh, these twelve views. Okay, so uh, here are the base some baselines we are uh, using in this work. So including a uh, single uh, network embedding method, deep work, graph sage, and uh, SD um, and some and one uh, and four uh, multiplex network embedding methods. Um, so um, so the metric we are using here is uh, micro F1 and uh, macro F1. So we we compare our method with this the three sing, single mat, uh, multiplex network embed sorry single network embedding methods and four multiplex uh, number embedding methods. So the first, the top table shows the uh, node classification results on all data sets. Um, if you can see here, our method achieves uh, the best performance among all the uh, 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 you know, uh, data sets and uh, uh, compared to all the uh, baselines. 
So, but uh, one interesting uh, result here is that uh, on the coral data set, you can see that our method uh, is, is comparable with, uh, you know, the state of art uh, uh, multiplex network embedding method. Uh, yeah, the reason is that, um, you know, this data set doesn't suffer too much from the missing data. So, but however, but, uh, uh, however our method is still, uh, can still perform uh, reasonably well. And for other three data set, you can see that uh, our method, uh, you know, uh, outperform the best uh, base science uh, with a uh, big margin. And uh, we observed the similar uh, uh, results on node uh, clustering uh, uh, experiments. So basically our method uh, can achieve the best uh, overall performance. Um, so on the third set of ex experiments, uh, we modified the PDR. Basically, we manually re or, or randomly remove some of the uh, informations from the, from the graph. Uh, so basically, we are changing the uh, or, or varying the uh, PDR from you know uh, uh, its original uh, PDR. For example, in coral is zero to some uh, uh, ratio, and um, we then run all these uh, uh, baselines and our method on the you know on these data sets with different PDRs. Um, so we can observe that um, our method, uh, can, it, it's, it's better on, uh, especially when, you know, uh, the PDRs uh, goes up. Basically, uh, uh, in, in, in other words, um, our method can handle missing data uh, much better than all, the, all these baselines, especially when uh, with higher P, with uh, uh, with higher or larger PDRs, so which uh, further demonstrate the effectiveness of our method on uh, dealing with uh, partial multiplex network data. Uh, by the way, oh, these uh, results are on node classification uh, uh, tasks. Okay, uh, I'll quickly uh, conclude uh, uh, this uh, uh, presentation. So basically. Uh, we present a deep multiplex network embedding method to deal with uh, uh, missing data in the uh, multiplex network. And we conduct comprehensive study on four benchmarks to demonstrate the effectiveness of the proposed model, especially on the large PDRs. Um, there are a few uh, future directions. Uh, the first one is like we want to adopt distrib uh, distributed optimization to speed up the, uh, the training process. We also want to uh, also plan to uh, extend the subspace uh, partial view learning to some nonlinear uh, cases. Um, so there are a lot of uh, details I, 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 I haven't covered uh, in this talk, but um, if you're interested, feel free to uh, look, at our, uh, look at our original uh, paper. Yeah, I guess uh, I would just end here and, um, and take questions. Thanks, Chief. And so we have time for one quick question. Any question from the audience? So you can raise your hand or post your question in, in chat box. Last call. Okay, a very short, quick one from me, basically. So uh, you talk about, uh, you, in your experiments, you used um, a few uh, data sets and uh, of different size. I mean, in terms of lumbar nodes and also edges. So basically, um, I'm just curious, um, does the size of data sets or you can see the scale of data sets matters um, here? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually, we, we do observe that, um, you know, uh, our, most, our method, uh, like, uh, it's more like uh, 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 robust uh, with uh, larger or uh, scale data, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, for small small scale data, like for example for for coral, like uh, 
we need to carefully tune the like hyperparameters uh, to achieve you know uh, good performance. So um, yeah, that's uh, one of the quick uh, uh, you know findings in, in our experiments. Yeah, thanks, Stefan, again for your uh, wonderful talk. Um, and uh, um, we move on to the next uh, presentation. Okay, um, let me see. So the next presentation will be um, multi view omics uh, translate with multiplex graph neural networks. Yes. So uh, we hi, have the presentation. Yes, that's great. Yeah. Over to you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Right. Um, so let me share my screen. Uh, so, um, so hello, my name is Costa Vigantas. I'm a PhD student uh, in the Translational Machine Learning Lab at Shiv. Uh, and it's my pleasure to present to you MultiView or Mixed Translation with Multi-Based Cross Neural Networks from uh, Jonas Richardi, my supervisor, and myself. Um, so first of all, what is uh, onomics? So onomics refers to any type of um, biological measurement. It can be genomics, so from DNA, transcriptomics from RNA. And um, our task is to take some of these omics and try to infer uh, different uh, measurements. Um, this data has the particularity that generally we have a relatively low amount of samples, but a really large amount of features per sample. And so we need to design methods that can effectively leverage uh, these types of data. Um, one family of methods relies on building similarities between samples. Um, so here I am showing you um, uh, similar net simulated network fusion, which is one of the most popular methods for uh, anal analyzing these types of omics. So um, our initial data is uh, just uh, tabular data from, uh, so patients are rows and columns are under MRN expression or DNA methylation. From this tabular data, we then draw uh, similarity matrices, which are obviously close to uh, adjacency matrices. Um, and then from these uh, similarity matrices, we build the graphs and then we do some kind of analysis for graphs. So this is, this, uh, is an application for clustering. Um, and we propose to do something similar for, um, for omics translation. Um, in our method, instead of building one kind of similarity per omics, we decide to uh, concatenate these omics together and then cluster the individual features. Um, so uh, from these clusters, then we can uh, build also similarly similarity matrices. The difference is that now um, we are not uh, bound to having only one similarity metric per omic. We can have multiple, and this becomes an upper parameter we can tune. And then from these similarity matrices, we build a multiplex graph um, where, for instance, we also ensure that the nodes are, uh, the, this multiplex graph is fully connected, so no nodes have uh, our neighborless. Um, now, with this graph, we uh, pass it through a neural network. Our, archite our architecture is pretty simple. It's just a, an encoder decoder structure. There's some uh, sugar on it, but I will not get into it. Um, so the idea is to, um, is to encode the, the, the samples into a much lower dimensional latent, latent representation and then decode it with a simple MLP. Um, in addition, so our graph neural network also has an intention mechanism so that between layers, we can identify which layers are most relevant for the translation of the given sample. Um, now, uh, we tested our approach on the Kessel Genome MATLAB dataset. This is the largest openly available multi-omics dataset. It contains three omics, DNA methylation, gene expression, and microRNA expression. Um, and we have a bit less than uh, 2,000 samples. So we choose to infer uh, microRNA expression from DNA mutilation and gene expression simply because uh, any other setup would uh, there will be too much missing information for for many other any other setup. We also split uh, this data set into two different splits. So one to try to simulate a low 
training data regime, which we often have, and one with more training data. Um, and uh, so we compare our method with uh, just a simple multivariate last regression, because at the end of the day, this is just a multivariate regression problem. Um, a standard variational encoded decoder structure. So instead of our using our graph encoder, we just replace it with an MFP. Uh, and Omitrans, which is the current state of the art for this type of um, for this type of problem, it's a GAN-based network. Uh, and finally, our network. But instead of using our graph construction method, we also use the graph construction method from simulated nasal fusion that I showed you before. Um, now on to our results. So for the first split, um, first we can see that uh, our, for, our net, for our network uh, works better than the current state of the art, uh, at least for mean square error. But however, we are not able to show that our graph construction method does really uh, have any significant improvement. So we are testing on mean square and mean absolute error, as well as the coefficient of determination, which is the percentage of the explained variance between the reconstruction and the, the true um, representation. Um, however, when we include, we, we increase the amount of training data, um, we see that our uh, method is validated and actually this was tuned on more training data. So suddenly having more layers into that multiplex graph becomes more um, beneficial. Um, now, um, to really quite try to understand why this is the case and why we perform better than just having uh, uh, just an MLP, uh, we try to plot the, the latent representations of this um, um, of our uh, of our encoding. So this is uh, the Disney. Um, uh, so this is just the Disney plot of uh, of our latent representation and uh, the VED. So just uh, the MLP, and so you see that. When you try to only use fully connected layers, the, the latent basically collapses. But with our multiplex graph, we can keep that locality. Uh, so similar nodes, we have similar latent representation. And this is really why our, our method works better than, uh, than if you just try to use fully connected layers. Um, so in conclusion, we showed that uh, we can construct Omics, the graph construction set for these omics, which uh, a lot of metal rely on, does not only, we have more, more options than using one similarity per omics. And finally, we also showed that a graph based neural network can achieve state of the art results for uh, this type of problem. Finally, we made the code available. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, do you have any questions? Any question from the audience? I think we, we have time for one question. Yeah, I think I may, um, uh, I have a, a small question, observation. Uh, hello? Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, it's just uh, the uh, in slice 14 uh, for the baseline the embedding, uh, this is the embedding visualization. How come it looks so like uh, like a circle? It looks so. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is an. an so you mean this? Yeah, this is an artifact of the of the Disney. Um, basically, the the, the, the the latent collapses. So uh, each representation basically gets this, almost the same latent with with some noise. And then when you do the Disney, um, the Disney uh, collapse, the, the Disney representation, then uh, you get this kind of weird shape. But basically, this is just an artifact. Um, uh -huh. yeah. okay. It just means random, right? Yeah, basically, yeah. It's, uh... OK, thank you. thank you. We have another question uh, from Michael. So uh, in the chat box, so Michael, would you like to? I can. Can try. I'm yeah, sorry, this is yeah. working. Yeah, so my question is based on slide eight. You, you did mention that uh, um, that, that the graph will be fully connected, uh, but I just yeah. don't understand how you can make sure that this happens. Uh, because, I mean, you well, just if your you data can... if your data is not connected, then your graph is not connected. 
so uh, we uh, we make those connections basically from the similarity metric matrix we connect uh, close enough nodes and so nodes are samples and we connect them um, based on uh, some metric so yes we do we do not have the same kind of graphs that you have in uh, social graphs or um, uh, or, or for instance for gene interactions we kind of have to build our own um, so then we can, but for instance, we also, so let's say that we have an outlier, we also try to connect the outlier with its k nearest neighbors so that uh, it's still connected in the graph. Okay, so you, you use like basically a local, so the metric is like you don't have a global cutoff as a threshold, but it's, you're just to a k nearest neighbors. It, it, it's, a, it's a combination of both actually. Um, uh, it's a combination of a global uh, threshold value plus a local, um, a, a local uh, genius neighbors. Okay, then I understand. Yes, thank you. Thanks uh, again, Costa, for, for the presentation, and also thanks for um, thanks uh, for the answers, of course. So, thank you. Um, yeah, let's move on to next uh, um, presentation. And the next presentation will be uh, talking about a triangle framework. So do we have the presenter here or video? Yeah, same exactly. Hello, everyone. My name is Meng Jiao Guo. And Sorry, please go ahead. I come from Suiwen University of Technology. I will be giving you an introduction about my paper, which named a triangle framework among subgraph isomorphism, pharmacographer, and the structure function relationship. Next, I will introduce from the following aspects. First, introduction. Formocrofer is a medical chemistry term that refers to the spatial arrangement of structural features in a drug molecule that are important for activity and function. It has been found that molecules with the same activity tend to share some uh, certain characteristics in structure. Formocrofer can help when searching for and designing better drugs. Therefore, the concept of a formographer has been proposed to identify those structural characteristics that contribute significantly to activity and function. There is a considerable amount of research for identification of such patterns. Common formographer identifications could be converted into subgraph querying problems. Due to the chemical structures can also be converted to graphs, which is a naughty problem pressing for a solution. We adopt a simplified representation pharmacographer graphs by reducing complete molecule structures to abstracts to detect isomorphic topological patterns and further to improve the substructure retrieval efficiency. The proposed quantitative structure function relationship approach can not only identify isomorphic relationships but also can give a topological distance among compounds. Next, uh, related work. Um, the subgraph isomorphism problem is a computational task in which two graph GA and GB are given as input, and uh, one must determine whether GB contains a subgraph that is isomorphic to GA. In this work, we we focus on a structural directed matching subgraph isomorphism problem. Like human VF2, VF2+, VF2++, quick SI, graph QL, SPAS. These algorithms mentioned above exploit different representation orders to search potential objects, pruning rules to exclude amplifiable passes and auxiliary information to automate false candidates to speed up the progress which becomes even challenging with increasing number of vertexes in the query subgraph and the large graphs. Next, I will introduce our proposed subgraph isomorphism algorithm. The graph shows the basic structure of our proposed model. 
The matching candidates here are small strings. Small is the simplified molecule input line entry system, which is used to express the three dimensional structure of a chemical into a line formula. The small expression is a string commonly used uh, in chemistry to denote the relationship between uh, elements. It aims to express the basic information contained in a molecule system in the shortest formula, such as uh, elements, connectivity, and connection properties. Our methodology is transforming small expressions into directed graphs. Because of the linear structure of strings, our proposed method can deal with linear data structure by transforming them into graph structures and can then be further converted into two-dimensional matrix forms. And that is firstly, projecting the element and uh, bounce features to a vertex and, uh, and adjacency matrix. Secondly, we employ the permutation theorem to evaluate row sum of vertex and, uh, and adjacency matrix of the two small strings. Lastly, our proposed uh, scheme deploys the acunumerosity theorem to verify if two candidate graphs satisfy the isomorphic relationship. Transformed graph generation means convert the small strings into graphs. The method of generating a transformed graph is to create two lists, with which are an index list and a small identifier list. The index list marked uh, in blue here should contain all antiplicate uh, identifiers from the union of the two given small expressions. The vertexes in the index list include all element symbols and uh, bound features. In addition, we also add an extra vertex at the end of the list. It means the vertex is unknown or empty, which ensures the length of the two given small identifier lists are in alignment. A small identifier list marked uh, in green here includes all the symbols in the small expression. If the lenses of the two small expressions are not equal, some extra vertexes should be added to the end of the short ones, thus ensuring that they have uh, an equal length. Finally, the principle of generating single directed graph edges between these uh, nodes should be uh, constructed between each element within index list and the small identifier list respectively. Well, these double directed lines should be uh, created between the elements in the index list and the elements in the small identifier list, sharing with the same identifier. Based on the transformed graphs, we further convert the transformed graph into binary vertex adjacency matrix representation form. The binary vertex adjacency matrix is a square matrix. The elements of the matrix indicate whether a pair of uh, vertexes are adjacency or not in the graph. We create a binary VK1 in link and the VK2 all link to represent one, one vertex of VK, where K equals 1 to N. The subscript 1 indicated there is an in link to the vertex. That means uh, a link going into uh, the vertex. And the subscript 2 indicates that there is an out link to, to the vertex. That means the link going out. For example, in the Graph G1, V12, and uh, V12 is an uh, adjacency with V21. Then in the binary vertex adjacency matrix, V12 and V21 equals 1. Each vertex can be represented by two vertexes with a subscript of 1 and 2 in the binary vertex adjacency matrix. The size of the matrix is 2n multiple 2n. 
We also need to convert the transformed graph into binary and adjacency matrix representation form, like the vertex adjacency matrix. In the same way, we create a binary in-link and all-link to represent one edge. The number of edges is m. The subscript 1 indicates the edge is an in-link to the vertex. That is a, a link going into the vertex. And the subscript 2 will indicate that the edge is a going out link to the vertex. If two edges are connected by a vertex, two edges are adjacency. For, for example, in the graph G1, E12 is adjacency with E21. Then in the binary edge adjacency matrix, E12 and E21 equals 1. The size of the matrix is 2, 2m, multiple 2m. Next, I will give some details about uh, permutation theorem given two natural number size of array A and array B. A equals A1, A2, 2an. B equals B1, B2, 2bn. If and only if sum of side A equals sum of set B, and the sum of square of each element inside A equals the sum of the square of each element inside B, until the sum of the n power of each element inside A equals the sum of the n power of each element inside B. A is uh, a permutation of B and uh, vice versa. The table shows the computational results of um, binary vertex adjacency matrix for G1. Likewise, the com computation of a binary vertex adjacency matrix for G2 and the computation of a binary and adjacency matrix for graph G1 and G2 are the same. In the permutation distance formula, x indicates um, sum of row, y indicates square sum of row, Z indicates cubic sum of row. The subscript 1 indicates uh, graph G1, and the subscript uh, 2 indicates graph 2. Now I would introduce what is acunumerosity theorem. Theories A and B are acunumerous if and only if the cardinality of the set of same elements is equivalent, and the number of the set of the same elements is equivalent to. For example, the two arrays 1, 2, 2, 5, 3, 3, 3, and 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, 5, 5. The frequencies for different elements in the corresponding array are both 1, 1, 2, 3. So the given two arrays are acunumerous. Here I will clarify how to verify the acunumerous relationship for corresponding vertex and, and adjacency matrix. Small 1 and small 2 indicate the corresponding vertex and, uh, and adjacency matrix. We perform the singular value decomposition for two corresponding adjacency matrix. First, check the singular, singular values of two matrix are acunumerous. If so, go to the next step. If not, the graph small 1 and small 2 are asymorphic. And then, check if the maximum independent vector set of the corresponding P multiple eigenvalues of the left and the right singular vector are acunumerous. If so, go to the next step. If not, the graph small 1 and small 2 are isomorphic. Check the isomorphic based on um, equinumerosity theorem for and adjacency matrix follow the same rules mentioned above. The acunumerous distance only has two possible values. Uh, 0 and 1, which 0 indicates they are acunumerous, and then 1 indicates they are not acunumerous. Topological distance measure procedures contain 14 steps, while re uh, regarding the majority calculation of compounds, the matching stops uh, executing at step 3 based on the results of our experiment. Based on the quantity graph uh, distance measurement, the topological distance between two given small strings is uh, 
zero point three o five. This is a flowchart of our proposed quantitative uh, structure function relationship algorithm. It contains three uh, key steps. The first one is the generation of uh, vertex and uh, and adjacency matrix. The second one is uh, permutation calculation. The third one is uh, acunumerosity calculation. We present a systematic evaluation of human VF2 and our proposed subgraph isomorphism algorithm which shows our method has a noticeable efficiency in detecting subgraph performance in terms of uh, integrating the prediction accuracy and the running time. Next uh, conclusion. The key insight of uh, our work is uh, straightforward. The first, firstly, we convert the smile strings into uh, graphs by transformed uh, graph generation method. Secondly, we use permutation and the acunumerosity theorem to verify the isomorphic relationship between the two small strings. Thirdly, our approach can decrease time uh, complexity from a theoretical perspective compared with the existing subgraph isomorphism methods. Thank you very much. So thanks for the presenter. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any author of this paper here with us, but uh, um, I think if you have any questions, please feel free to reach uh, the authors. So the next uh, presentation will be about, um, I think it's a deep or regressive model. So the authors, um not able to uh, be here so um, it will be a video recording hello everyone this is Faiza Faiz in this talk i'm going to briefly introduce our study on the novel problem of class conditional graph generation and i will talk about our purpose deep autoregressive approach called CCGG to solve this problem. This work has been done in collaboration with Yosaman Omid, Mazin Mustafa Badi, Amin Mushtaba Sabur, and our advisors, Professor Hamid Reza Rabi'i and Professor Mahdi Soleimani Bakhshah at Sharif University of Technology. In this presentation, I will first give the motivation behind our research. Next, I will explain our proposed method in detail. Then, I will, uh, I will review the experiments performed to assess our method's effectiveness. And finally, I will discuss the obtained results. Graph generation is an important research line in studying graph structures dating back to several decades ago, which used to be solved by classic and hand-engineered processes. Recently, due to the advances of deep learning techniques and algorithms, this field has attracted the attention of many researchers. Therefore, Deep graph generation is a relatively new research area with a number of less explored or even unexplored subproblems. Class conditional graph generation is one of those subproblems that has not been addressed yet. In this problem, we have a set of graphs and a set of graph classes or labels. There, each graph is categorized in exactly one of these classes. The goal is to train a generative model to generate new graphs with the desired class label. Our proposed CCGG model consists of three main components. The first one is the core generator component, which adopts and state-of-the-art graph generation method, namely the GRAND model. In fact, the core component is responsible for generating new nodes and edges of the graph. Moreover, for the specific task of class conditional generation, the CCGG injects the class label into the node representations. The second component is the graph classifier. 
It introduces a customized graph classification loss to incline the model to generate graphs of the desired classes. This is done by employing a promising framework, namely the GraphSage framework, to calculate the associated loss. The last component is the node classifier, which uses the variable node information to better capture uh, the class-specific characteristics. It also introduces a customized node classification loss. In the next slide, I will better demonstrate each component and what they do. This is an overview of our CCGG model. It adopts a stepwise generation strategy which is similar to the grand model. That is, in each step, the model generates one block of nodes and their corresponding edges. Here, I will review what exactly happens in each step and how each of the aforementioned components plays its role. Suppose T steps have passed and this subgraph has been generated. The first component is the core generator. It uses a condition injector. The condition injector concatenates the class label of the graphs into the initial node representations. Then, the core generator proceeds the generation step and updates the input subgraph by adding a new block of nodes. It also computes a part of the total loss regarding the generation process. Next, the updated subgraph is fed into both the node classifier and the graph classifier, and they each compute their associated losses. I will further elaborate on each part of the total loss function in the next slide. The core generator loss is designed to incline the model to maximize a lower bound on the log likelihood of the generated graphs. Next, the graph level classification loss is the cross entropy loss of the generated graph classes multiplied by a power of a discount factor at each step. Lastly, the node level classification loss is also calculated with a similar formulation. The intuition behind using these discount factors is that both the graph and the node classification tasks are expected to be done more accurately as the generation steps proceed. That is, the model should be more penalized in the case of incorrect classification in the last steps. The CCGG's total loss function takes into account the loss of each component. Here, lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both the model's hyperparameters. In the remaining slides, I will elaborate on the experiments performed to validate the efficacy of CCGG in detail. We have used two datasets in our experiments. The first one is proteins, which consist of 1113 graphs with a number of nodes ranging from 100 to 620. Each graph represents a protein structure with amino acids as their nodes. An edge connects two nodes if they are less than six angstroms apart. These graphs are categorized in two enzymes or non-enzymes classes. The second dataset is NCI1, consisting of 4,110 graphs with 8 to 11 nodes. Each one represents a chemical compound. These graphs are also categorized in two classes of positive or negative to cell lung cancer. Moreover, as the problem of class conditional graph generation is a relatively unexplored one, not many baseline models are available for comparison. Therefore, we have used the most relevant model, namely the Congen model, as our baseline. It has reached state-of-the-art results in conditional graph generation using GANs. We have evaluated our model from two aspects. First, 
we have assessed the quality of the generated graphs in terms of some graph-based statistics, for instance, largest connected component or triangle count. In this table, we have reported the absolute values of the differences between the statistics of the generated and the original graphs. Therefore, smaller values indicate better performance. As the results show, CCGG outperforms the baseline in almost all cases. In addition to testing the quality of the generated samples, we have evaluated our model's performance from the viewpoint of the graph classification test using two metrics, namely the classification accuracy and the area under cave or AUC. Aside from the graph stage, which was used both in the training and the testing phases, we have utilized two other graph classifiers, namely DeepPool and DGCNN. These classifiers were only used in the test phase. This was done in order to better demonstrate our model's robustness towards the changes of the graph classifier in class conditional generation. As you can see, CCGG outperforms the baseline model in most cases with only a few exceptions. We will further discuss these exceptions in the next slide. Despite the superiority of CCGG's result in most cases, there are still a few places where the baseline outperforms us. We can find the reason behind this by examining the classifiers themselves. The study performed by Erika et al. provides a fair comparison of graph classifiers which shows that these classifiers do not guarantee perfect performance. More precisely, according to this study, their classification accuracy never exceeds 80% on NCI1 and proteins dataset. Therefore, it brings an intrinsic and unavoidable error in our training phase. This is because we compute the part of our training loss concerning graph classification with imperfect graph classifiers. We also use them to classify the generated samples in the testing phase. Considering all these, the CCGG model outperforms the baseline in almost all cases. Thank you for your time and attention. So again, uh, but thanks to the presenters. So uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact the authors. And now may we move on to the next uh, presentation, which is, I think, mining uh, multivariate implicit relationship in academic networks. So. Do we have the presenter or video recording? We have the presenter. Yes, please. Presenter? I'm playing the video recording, just give me a few minutes. Okay. Hello everyone. Today I'd like to introduce our related work on relationship mining. The title of the paper is called 
mining, multi-railroads, implicit relationships in academic networks, the traditional advisor-advisee relationship mining only analyzes the binary relationship. But we transfer the capsule network to multi-railroad relationship analysis based on the scholar own attributes and integrated the characteristics of the cooperative network. In addition, we generate large scale multivariate academic genealogy using the trained model. Considering that the capsule network takes a long training time, we adopt a warm restart method to speed up the training process. I will introduce our work from the following five aspects. Related work, problem definition, experimental design, results and analysis, and conclusion. Multiple re cooperative relations exist widely in the academic society. With the increase of academic data and fusion of information, the research on multivariate cooperative relationships in academic networks has data support. The binary relationship is the most popular studied object in the field of network science in the past few decades. Through the abstraction of the real world, the objects in many systems can be simplified into binary relationship data for modeling and visualization. In some specific scenarios, multivariate relationships can be accurately divided into binary relationships. However, binary relationships can only represent simple pairwise relationships, and in most cases, Multivariate relationships cannot be divided into this way. The use of a binary relationship will lead to overexpression or misexpression. Currently, the mining and analysis of multivariate cooperation relationships in academic society are mainly based on following three types of methods statistical analysis, relational algebra and network science. The goal of this paper is to obtain a vector representation according to the scholar's characteristics, attributes, and network structure, which can be effectively used in the mining of advisor advisee relationship. And the figure shows a simple example of problem analysis. Uh, through the paper publication information, we can get the author's cooperation network and infer possible advisor and advisee relationship. Next, we introduce the relevant contents of the experiment. The dataset used in the experiment consists of two parts. Microsoft's academic graph dataset is the largest public dataset provided by Microsoft. It contains the publication records of scientific paper and the citation relationship between these papers, as well as the information of authors, institutions, journals, conferences, and research fields. Mac dataset has seven different types of entity data, paper, author, journal, conference, conference areas, conference instance, affiliation, and field of study. Their relationship is shown in the picture. The academic family tree is a non-profit, user content-driven online database designed to publish share the academic pedigree of current and historical researchers in various fields of academic. It's divided according to disciplines and stored academic records in different fields. There are still some problems to be solved before using the data for training. 
Mac only provides information related to the published paper, such as title, author, year of publication, and the author's name is not pre-processed, which means that if two scholars has the same name, they cannot distinguish their public papers. At the same time, the paper names in the MAC dataset cannot be one-to-one -one corresponding to those in the academic family tree. And in this experiment, if the author meets one of the following criteria, it's regarded as the same author. First, two authors have cited each other at least once. Second, two authors have at least one same calibrate. Third, the author have at least one same organization. The termination condition of the program is that there are no author pairs to be merged. Node features represent the inherent attributes of each node itself. In this paper, we mainly select node attributes for authors, including institution, academic age, number of published articles, and so on. Those attributes can be used to measure the author's academic influence and the similarity with other nodes. And the edge features mainly used to describe the relationship strengths or other properties. In this paper, edge features are mainly used to describe the cooperation intensity between scholars, such as the number and duration of cooperation. Compared with other cooperators, the cooperation mode between teachers and students is more special. For example, in the early stage of their career, most advisees scientific research level is not measured and need to rely on the academic guidance of their teachers. At this time, uh, advisees tend to cooperate with their advisors frequently. And the node to vector method is to is used to sample the network structure from the cooperative network to obtain the structural characteristics of the network. And the above three features are fused and the capsule network is, to, is used for relation mining. And we use computer science and the neuroscience data to compare algorithms and from this picture, we can see that the data of different disciplines, the performance of the model um, is also different, indicating that the cooperative network structure constructed by the data of different fields is also different. Among all classification methods, the method based on neural network is better than the method based on machine learning, which shows that the neural network can effectively identify data features and better fit data in experiments. The LR is not very good at fitting data of such nonlinear relationships. The classification performance of SVM is slightly higher than that of LR, and the FE score of LSTM is lower than that of CNN. Um, it speculates that the super parameters of LSTM need to be further adjusted for current parameters. LSTM cannot well capture the relationship between nodes.
capsule network can better capture the cooperative relationship characteristics of scholars in their early academic career and accurately mine the advisor advisee relationship from the data of network. The capsule structure can better mine the network representation vector than the ordinary neural network structure, although it has better performance and more accurate judgment of relationship, it requires more, much more computing resource and training time than CNN. We analyze the influence of parameter setting on the experimental results from the following aspects. Uh, first, the dimension of network feature vector. Second, routing times and normalization. Third, optimization of capsule learning rate. We can see the results from this picture that the vector dimension has little effect on the results. The FE score increase slightly uh, with the increase of dimension. When the number of routing times is small, the accuracy and FE score show a linear upward trend with the increase of the number of irritations. However, after three times, the improvement speed of accuracy gradually slow down, and normalizing the input vector can also increase the performance of relationship mining. In this experiment, the method of adjusting the learning rate is used to speed up the training process of the capsule network and prevents the capsule network from falling into a local minimum. Compared with baseline capsule network, using warm restart method can shorten the training process about four epochs. However, warm result has little effect on the improvement of accuracy. And in this work, we use the capsule network to extract advisor advisee relationships based on node, act, and network attributes. The experimental results shows the effectiveness of the model. Unlike the training method that only focus on binary relations, we obtain multiple relationships by aggregating binary relationships. We also prove the effectiveness of warm restarts method for shorten the capsule network training time and finally use the trained model to the MAC data to generate academic genealogy. The above is our work content, and thank you for listening. Thanks to the presenter. So let's um, move quickly to the last presentation of this session, which is about schema work. So do we have the presenter? Uh, yes, sir, I'm here. Yes, please, over to you. Thank you. You see the slides? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello, hello everyone. It's nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm today. I'm presenting my work, uh, Schema Aware Random Mocks, 
for heterogeneous graph embedding. Uh, my name is Ahmed Imad, and uh, I am a PhD student at KTH, uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, so, uh, as it was like established today, um, heterogeneous network and information network hence have a lot of information, uh, which make them uh, different semantically, uh, more complex semantically than the uh, normal homogeneous networks. What you see here is a small ex uh, is a toy example of heterogeneous network that consists of more than one type of nodes and edges. And if we try to build the network schema of it, uh, on the right will be uh, how it will look like. So you have uh, uh, first uh, node is author, second node is of the rest of the nodes actually is a venue, paper, and topic or keyword. And you can see because we have more than one, one, one type of nodes, we have also more than one type of edges in the network, which makes it very uh, complex um, semantically. Uh, and um, that motivates uh, the need to learn uh, a good representation out of this network. You can uh, work with homogeneous embedding method, learning methods, uh, the traditional ones like deep walk, and they will work just fine. Um, but however, um, they are oblivious to the types of the nodes that they are actually uh, different types of nodes. Therefore, um, you can also uh, work on embedding, embedding, embedding methods that were designed specifically for um, heterogeneous network, uh, similar to schema walk, the work we are, that uh, work we are presenting here today. So, uh, and usually they give, uh, they give the result uh, on heterogeneous network according to actually our results too. Uh, learning the representation of this, uh, of, the, of this network means that you learn a vector for each node, uh, which we call node embedding. These nodes, if they are rich, uh, if these representations, if they are rich enough, you can use them for countless downstream uh, applications like uh, uh, drug, uh, like drug disease interaction, that was also presented today. Uh, DNA was also presented today. Uh, recommender systems for movie and for um, for any kind of relation relation between uh, persons like to you uh, users on the internet on social media uh, to uh, followers maybe to authors also in TPFB graph. All of these we have seen today. Our approach uh, is schema walk. Um, that is start with a research question of how we can exploit the heterogeneous net the knowledge in the network. And to solve this, we, we, um, we paid attention to this concept network schema, which basically is a blueprint or the like template of the, uh, of the hen, uh, uh, of, of hen, which contains like the small sub uh, the small meta graph that contains all um, the, the node and each types uniquely, as you can see here. And this network schema give you like a high, uh, a high, um, high, high level view of uh, of any heterogeneous network you have. And now, now comes uh, that uh, we wanted to design a schema random walk that's aware of such a schema, and we call schema aware random walk. And the idea is, uh, you, the random walk should explore all the edge types equally and uniformly without any pipe, without any differentiate, without any preference. Um, and uh, after you generate the walks uh, to do the learning, you include the, uh, you, we use just a normal um, the skip gram, uh, and I hope you are familiar with that. Um, yeah, so how does this actually work? We start with, um, this is the same graph, uh, as same for example, and the same schema walk, uh, and you will see on the schema here on the left, uh, um, all, all the edge types have like equal probability at the start. So no walks, so all the edge types could be visited um, in the same uh, probability. Um, and here I put uh, um, like number of uh, the, visits, the visits for each edge type uh, so far. So let's say we have a walk that starts at node A1, which is type, type A. And from this, the walk chose to jump to P1. As it's doing that, uh, from A1 to P1, from author to paper, that AP or author paper means public, it means like right relationship uh, or each type has been explored. What happens here is that the probability of this each type go down and the, all the other, the probability of other each types goes up. Probability of to be, choos to be chosen next term. But let's say the walk up continue and as it does the same, that, uh, it chose A3. So again, it chose the same each type uh, author paper and, uh, and you can see the probability of 
uh, of that to be chosen in the future is going down and the others is going up uh, and so on. And you can see that now it's at its lowest. Uh, from there, the walker will like now rising to choose a different edge type, trying to balance uh, to balance out the uh, sampling for all the edge types. So now when B1, once when B1, you can the probability goes down and the other probabilities for all for the, the probability of the other edge types go up. And the same here for uh, even for AP that went down, it can go up again. And we keep on doing that uh, till we uh, most of the time at the end of the walk, you maintain a uniform distribution among all the edge types. It's um, yeah, it's as simple as that. Um, and that's how we achieve this idea. That's in a very simple nutshell, but for more details, uh, I think you need to um, to refer back to the uh, the, the paper. Uh, for experiment, I only included one 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 experiment from uh, from the experiment we had. And you can see uh, just uh, this approach, just uh, and make a buffer a random walk uh, piece of approaches that were designed for heterogeneous network. Yeah. Uh, schema walk is our approach, the walk by directional by the directional walk passes them on, like tra a, tra a traditional uh, homogeneous inference. Uh, you can see that we are the red uh, and we are um, here achieving um, on a classification task. Um, we are achieving like a good address, a, a good uh, micro, a fun, a fun micro, and with a 10% of the training data, we actually we start to uh, the genius, a full the genius embedding the start uh, has a good have a good really uh, have a really good start compared to the homogeneous ones. Uh, viewing the experiments, I mean, I'll just include here the result given the time. Uh, heterogeneous network embedding can be essential, especially if the heterogeneous knowledge are, are, are imperative. Uh, also, schema work uh, compared to the two heterogeneous embedding here, uh, and through all the experiments, actually, schema work is consistently the best heterogeneous embedding performance so far, even with 10% of training data. Uh, by training 10% of data that has labels, so only we need to start actually having a good performance. Um, uh, finally, uh, between schema work and just process and embedding uh, regimes and embeddings, but schema work is based on each type, and uh, we the results show that each type based embedding approaches similar to schema work is actually work actually works better than the new type based method that are like just just basically trying to maintain a kind of uh, uniform distribution, but even the new types rather than the each types. And that's um, that's just uh, an insight to the evaluation. Uh, here, um, something uh, quick I would like to uh, show. This is an, a toy example of some network schema. And uh, let's assume that the each type uh, BD has been chosen a lot, like have been visited a lot in your walk. And uh, if you go to uh, on the left uh, approaches that work on new types, like just uh, they are trying to penalize uh, the new on the new types. So basically, because D has been chosen a lot, the worker will no longer visit D. Uh, and because of that, you can see once it removes D, then live on that zero, uh, the worker will remove all the edges around it. Basically, it will not visit all the edge types around it, even the one that weren't sampled enough. Um, by doing that, uh, the worker, um, the new type is worker will lose information. Um, and just being a very rigid uh, sampling strategy. But uh, analyzing on the each type gives you more fine grained, more flexible approach to do so. Uh, also, there is a challenge, uh, uh, an issue we had to face. Um, honestly, we didn't solve it, uh, not yet at least. So, while exploring a sampling on the heterogene in this heterogeneous um, network with schema work, you can have this issue, which is basically P1, P2, P3. Uh, these three nodes out of this less than half of the of the other of the total number of P's in the like papers in the network, right? And these three have an edge type between them, PP, which is paper papers, that means like citation, right? So this um, only the three of them, less than half, have this kind of edge type, but the other papers do not have it. And what happened is schema of trying to maintain a balance and would like to visit this paper paper because it, it, the worker is aware of such uh, of such edge type, but they can but they cannot find it. Okay. Uh, as for, uh, so what happened is that 
starvation happens. Basically, you spend a long time unable to visit this age type. The same issue can happen in a different way. So it's not just fully connected network, um, fully connected small subclass that intense, but also you can have a, a scarcity. So age type paper venue is very rare, only with two, uh, two three nodes that you have it, and the rest of the network doesn't have. Again, starvation can happen. So basically, the worker is um, had the urge to uh, visit this age type because of the probability, but they cannot. Uh, that's bad because by the time it uh, the worker gets here or here, you're trying to over to compensate for such lacking. So it keeps oversampling that, and somehow that's destroyed the presentation uh, in the end. Um, a solution for that you can build a high order random mock, a fully connected, uh, basically a fully transform this graph to a fully connected graph. Um, and all the ages basically uh, have weights according to between them according to the number of neighbors that uh, that you have in common and according to the distance. And by doing that, you can actually work on this high uh, high high level graph and you cannot have a starvation. But the results actually wasn't when weren't as promising um, in the paper for such a approach. Uh, what I didn't cover today, but you can find it in the paper, uh, it's in the, in the quite the analysis analysis over different sampling strategies, the differences between them, what how they uh, how they operate on heterogeneous network, what they could be, when they can be, when you can use each uh, each strategy. Uh, I didn't include parameter sensitivity of some hyperparameters, the decay hyperparameters that I couldn't explain today given the time constraint. Um, also, there's a big limitation for escape gram if you use it in heterogeneous uh, network because escape gram is like oblivious too. Um, and these are were the things that I couldn't cover, but I think it, I mean you can cover, you can read them, uh, you can read about them in the paper. Final conclusions is the core insight of this work is when when you work with heterogeneous graphs, you cannot and you, you cannot uh, assume, or cannot have assumptions about the ages um, physically. You have when you when you don't have an explicit domain knowledge about which age type or which node type is more important for your task, all you can do is you can have a fair sampling over the age types, which which is the thing we try to uh, uh, achieve um, in our paper. Genetic network um, present rich structures and homogeneous embedding methods can fall uh, a bit uh, behind uh, at uh, representing this uh, this rich semantics or structures. Uh, finally, unbiased uh, exploration of the age types can be uh, provide a fine-grained approach to heterogeneous network compared to the net node type that ones. Um, at last, the homogeneous nature of escape gram, yeah, makes it a bit um, like not convenient for heterogeneous network embedding. And we're currently working on this point uh, as um, as we're talking. Uh, so this is uh, my paper, and this is acknowledgement for uh, for the fund I have. Uh, thank you all. If you have any questions, please let me know. Any questions from the audience? So, I made one quick question from me. So, uh, to me, the network uh, schema is a very interesting. So what's the deep, my question is, what's the difference between network schema and um, super graph? Um, I am really not familiar yeah. with super graph. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, yes, uh, I'm just uh, cu curious, basically, there, is there any connection between them? So I think, so uh, because you said, said network schema is kind of meta graph. So what's, um, I'm not uh, very sure what's meta graph, but uh, so links remind me of um, some super graph, mm -hmm. uh, super graph. I, I, I don't know if there is any connection between meta graph and the super graph or... Uh uh, I really cannot. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm not familiar with, with uh, super graph. I um, I, I never heard of that, so I really cannot answer the question. Fine, but yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, for schema work okay, is uh, all the appearances. Uh, I mean, all the 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 nodes exactly doesn't matter. You present all all of them with just a new type. 
So basically, you say there is authors, uh, uh, nodes of type author, group of nodes of type authors that, that will have a relationship of like authorship with other nodes of type papers. So you present this as like author and paper, you put the relationship as like authorship right. And you do that with like, uh, they can also papers have a relate, relation with each other, which could be citation or mention keywords of topic or be published in a venue. So, so that's why I, I called it meta, uh, meta graph or network schema. But I didn't, uh, again, I didn't know uh, about super graph. I will try to look this, this down. Um, but I think it may, it might, it might have a different characteristics perhaps. That's good. Thanks so for your answer. So any, any questions, last call from the audience? Okay, thank you guys. Okay, uh, thanks, um, Ahmed. And uh, also, I would like to conclude this session by thanking all the presenters um, for this session. And uh, I think we will have a break until, let me see, um, until 10.45, I think. So the workshop will resume at 10.45, that's uh, CST. Um, for me, it will be 6.45 PM. So um, enjoy the break and uh, welcome back at 10.45. So uh, I can see uh, Professor Donatino Count is here with us. So I would like to make a start. And uh, um, for those who just uh, attended this workshop, um, I am Feng Xia from Federation University. And uh, I will give a very brief um, introduction to Tane um, Tano and uh, then uh, hand over to him. So, Donato Nell Count received his PhD degree in 2006. He has been assistant professor from 2006 to 2013 in Italy at the University of Salerno. From 2013 to date, he is a associate professor at the Computer Science Laboratory of the University of Tours. He is currently head of the Computer Science Department at Polytech uh, Tours School of Engineering. Currently, he is co-head of the RFAIT at the Computer Science Laboratory, and he participates as member and sometimes as local coordinators to several regional um, projects on image and video analysis. His main research fears are uh, structure pattern recognition, video analysis, and effective computing. He is author of more than 70 publications and the reviewers in the mind journals in his research field. He is a member of an editorial board of many, a few journals. So uh, that's about Donatino. So uh, let's welcome Professor Donatino Count to give the talk over to you. So thank you. So do you hear uh, me? Sorry? Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, I think, uh, I'm not sure if you are allowed to share the screen. Yes, I think you, you can try. Yes. Uh, I, oh, that would be good if you can, because uh, I cannot see the vol volunteer here. Yes, over to you. You, you see, so the presentation? Yes, I can see it. Okay, so I I, I will start. <laughs> okay, so first of uh, all, let me thank you for inviting me to this uh, workshop. Uh, 
so I, I'd like to uh, make you an historical uh, overview of the how graphs are used in uh, computer vision and and how then uh, has been evolved with the deep learning era. Um, so this is uh, the outline, but I, I will detail something uh, later. Uh, let me start with some introduction, for, with some consideration. Uh, so for, for, for many years, uh, computer vision was uh, approached uh, almost exclusively by statistical approaches. So in that is in uh, Euclidean space. Uh, and some, some approaches was proposed with the structural representation, uh, in particular graphs, uh, but performances was not good as um, um, performance with the uh, statistical approaches uh, for several reasons that uh, I will uh, explain uh, later. But uh, um, anyway, there, there was some approaches uh, and um, there, there was uh, some advantages and disadvantages for uh, using uh, structural representation in, and in particular graphs. Um, so here I, I point out some, some of these. Uh, so surely uh, graphs are more richer uh, in, for representation and can carry out more information. Um, particular uh, relationship with the uh, object, with, uh, with data. And this is uh, uh, more rich with, with respect to vectorial representation. But in, at the same time, this, this representation is a bit rigid, a bit constrained. So uh, algorithms are less able to, ca to generalize on, on data or, and on the examples. Um, so so the, the use of graphs could be useful, but uh, at the same time, uh, it needs more data, more data to, to, to generalize, to, to give a more generalization for algorithms. Um, so some other uh, benefits are that uh, some data are intrinsically structured. So it's better to use structure uh, with respect to uh, vector. So uh, think about uh, uh, chemical uh, uh, molecules that are, are graphs. So it's it directly um, better to use as, as uh, graphs um, uh, than a vector. Uh, but uh, at the same time also, uh, this is a, a disadvantage. Um, uh, this uh, this representation is um, is um, results are very very linked to, to representation. So I'm very dependent to representation, and so uh, it can change a lot. Uh, changing representation of, of data. Uh, also, um, another disadvantage, but is less uh, less true today, is the the surely is the time complexity because to deal with graphs, uh, we need more time, and uh, um, and so computing is more uh, more difficult in the from complexity in point of view. Um, so in uh, in this talk, I'd like to show you some existing approaches, some some approaches that uh, uh, we proposed with uh, uh, me and my colleagues in uh, in our, our group, uh, just to have an idea an idea uh, to how graphs uh, was used in uh, computer vision uh, before uh, deep learning era. So before uh, uh, the advent, uh, the emergence of deep learning. Um, because some of these ideas even is now are uh, quite old, but maybe it can be um, useful. Um, it can give some idea uh, to use also in, in some of new new techniques and current techniques. So I, I, I present you some, some of application of in computer vision and how we approach this with, uh, with graphs. Uh, so first, uh, first application is people identification. So in computer vision, people identification um, is the problem of identifying a person when he, uh, 
enter in the scene and then exit and re-enter in the scene at a, a later time. And so the, the idea is that we want to re-identify it uh, to follow it in a long time, uh, in long term uh, um, sequence. Uh, so the problem is because uh, that uh, uh, the appearance of the, the person can be different when it enter and re-enter in the, in the scene. Also, um, this, this problem could be applied also in a, a network or cameras. So uh, the appearance is uh, uh, very different when uh, uh, the same person is viewed from a camera or from another. And we want to associate the same person between the network of cameras. Uh, so for, for this problem, as I said, there are many, many statistical approaches, but uh, we, we proposed some, uh, some graph-based approaches in um, 2011 and 2013. Um, so for the representation, we present uh, people, uh, so the appearance of people by graphs uh, in two manners. Uh, so one with the region adjacency graphs, so uh, we segment the appearance of the, the image of the uh, people and then uh, each node represents a region and the, the edge uh, represents the ad adjacency uh, between, uh, between the regions. Uh, and uh, another representation we use is uh, by uh, key points, uh, key point representation. So we extract key points like uh, for example, uh, SIFT or also HOG or some other uh, key points. And then nodes represent the key points and edges represent the, uh, the proximity of, uh, of, of points. So uh, some, some, some distances for, uh, from between, in, between points. So then now we use this representation for, uh, for the identify it. Uh, the idea is to embed graphs in a, in a cleared space uh, after the representation uh, by uh, graph kernel. Graph kernel techniques are, is a technique that implicit embed graphs in a vectorial space. And then we can use, uh, <coughs> Sorry, um, some uh, typical uh, uh, classification task with uh, with um, within a uh, Euclidean space. So uh, 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 the 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 key point is to uh, define this kernel and verify that this kernel is uh, same definite positive. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so here are, um, I, I don't go into detail, but the, here are some proposition of, uh, uh, of the, these kernels. Uh, so um, mainly it based on paths of graphs. So the idea is we have a graph, we extract all paths from graphs, and then we calculate uh, given two graphs, the similarity of paths. And so uh, this similarity give a measure of similarity between uh, graphs. So this similarity can be used uh, for classification tasks. And here I present some, uh, some results of this approach. And I want to highlight that uh, this, these are uh, results. This was the result proposed in the paper. So I'm quite told. Uh, so um, most likely, uh, these results are all that uh, are passed and um, are over uh, over performed by other techniques. But it it just to show you what the, what was the performances at this moment when we don't use, for example, some machine learning and uh, some deep learning techniques. Um, anyway, we can see that uh, uh, for some data set, existing data set use it for people identification, we can have some uh, um, quite good result with, uh, with, with uh, these techniques with the graph kernel. Uh, this is an, another table uh, for um, seeing the, the comparison with some existing, existing at, at this time, so in 2018. Uh, uh, then, I, as I said, maybe uh, now uh, these re results are, um, 
are not uh, are uh, have to be has to be updated, uh, but at this uh, at the, at this period, uh, the 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 approach was quite competitive. So this was a first technique uh, using graph in uh, in uh, in uh, computer vision. Uh, so the the technique is to embed graph in a Euclidean space. But then I want to show you some other technique using directly graph in graph space, not to embed this in a, a Euclidean space, but uh, uh, using it directly. Uh, and so for this, uh, for this, uh, I take the application of object tracking. Object tracking is the uh, the the goal to follow the follow object during a video. So the idea is to determine trajectories of uh, moving objects, and the technique, the main technique, is based on associate, associated object between frames. So the uh, uh, again we calculate some similarity between uh, object in uh, between frames, and we uh, give the identity uh, between previous frame and uh, current frame. Um, so in this, uh, within this context application, um, uh, we use it graphs uh, mainly for uh, solve the occlusion problem. In the, in the object tracking, the main problem is the occlusion problem. So when uh, two objects are overlapped from the point of view of camera, because of two two D representation, they are seen as one only uh, only one object. So the, the, the problem is to uh, separate this in in more regions. So here you have an example: uh, two people that uh, overlap it, uh, uh, on the ca camera, and if you see the second row, uh, the the region when the people are overlapped is unique. So the goal to solve the occlusion is to segmentate segment the region uh, in. To, to identify the two people belong to the unique region. Um, and so in this in this case, we use the, an, a structural representation based on graphs, but in particular also based on graphs at different resolution. So uh, using pyramid of graphs. Uh, the idea is when we have an object, uh, we segment the object at more um, many resolution level, and we um, we represent at each resolution a graph representing uh, the person. So here, for example, at the first level, we have only one region representing the uh, the whole object. At second level, we have a certain uh, level of segmentation, and each region represent graph and uh, node. Sorry, and uh, edge the yeah, adjacency with nodes. So here again, we represent uh, object with the region adjacency graphs. And this is uh, um, repeated at different level of resolution. So given this representation, uh, the algorithm, I won't just show you an example to show you the idea of the algorithm um, without going into detail. Uh, then if you have some question, you can, you can ask me some details, but what, what is the idea? Uh, uh, let me uh, show you this example. We have two people at previous frame, and then at current frame, these two people are overlapped, so are uh, mm -hmm. formed a uh, unique region of segmentation. Uh, so the idea is to start with the um, first level of uh, segmentation, uh, in which we try to associate the Two graphs, or uh, the two graphs uh, of the two successive frames. Then, if we cannot associate because of the occlusion, we go further at um, at down level, or uh, so with the, a high level of resolution in uh, trying to find association with some nodes with the nodes of the uh, of the of the different graphs. So I can show uh, here uh, in this example just uh, the the idea. So at at the frame t minus one we have two objects, and at frame t 
we have an object, we want to identify it. So at the first level, because of the occlusion, we cannot associate nodes of the graph at the left with the node uh, at the, the graph of the graph at the right. So in this case, we go at a high, higher level of resolution, and we have uh, more nodes uh, for the graphs at level uh, at 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 frame uh, t minus one. So the graphs that you see in the left, and uh, we can associate some of the region of this graph with some of the region of the graph representing the unique region occluded in the frame t at right. So you can see, for example, that we can label some nodes of the graphs at right with some with the, the label of nodes at um, at left and we can repeat this when we uh, until we have all the region uh, labeled and so this is the uh, a further level of a resolution and uh, many level of resolution then and then this is the solution of the uh, the algorithm so you can see again at um, at left uh, the unique region that uh, RBA has been able to separate the two people uh, because we find at different level of resolution the uh, the labels of the two objects belonging uh, to the region, and this is possible with this kind of representation, pyramidal uh, um, representation uh, of, uh, of, the, of, of people. Um, another idea, uh, always in the context of object tracking, uh, uh, object tracking uh, is to use uh, particle filter, um, because particle filter has uh, used the, um, successfully for um, for object tracking, but mainly for single object tracking. Uh, the problem is to use particle filter for multiple object tracking. In this case, we proposed some uh, graph, graph representation. Um, so here there are some, the, the, just the, the definition of, a, uh, of particle filters, but I, I want just to, um, show you an example of a particle filter in the case of single object tracking. I, I, I don't know if we can, I can share the video, uh, maybe. Just, I don't know if it's visible or not, maybe not. I. Okay. Yeah, I uh, I think it's visible uh, the video, so uh, you can see the application of particle particle filters in case of single object tracking. So we want to track this person, and you see uh, particles in the that are the points in the blue and yellow. Uh, so the blue uh, points are all the um, uh, all the particles and the the most probably uh, particles are colored in, in yellow that indicate uh, what is the uh, position of the object. So there are uh, many, uh, many proposals with particle filters and uh, the most likely uh, in sense of probabilistic, uh, so the uh, performing the likelihood of uh, each position with the, the appearance of the object give us give us the position of the object. So just to give you the idea, but maybe you know this uh, technique in case of single object uh, uh, tracking. So if we return uh, on this uh, for multiple object tracking, tracking there are some problem of using particle filter. Uh, here I point out some some of problems uh, that are uh, that when we have more objects, this needs more particles. So there is a problem of time complexity and also the problem of associating particles with objects. 
so the problem is still open and we proposed uh, in, uh, to use a, a graph representation. So what is the idea? The idea is, is to use one graph to represent a particle. And uh, one graph is one particle and uh, uh, each, um, uh, and so one graph, it represents the entire ensemble of the object in the scene. And we use graph kernel, again, uh, as in people uh, recognition, uh, re-identification problem, uh, we use graph kernels uh, for measuring this likelihood between particles and to take the, the best um, uh, the best symbol um, of, of particle to the solution of, uh, of tracking. Uh, so again, I, I show you uh, just an example of this technique. Um, we have uh, again a frame T and the frame T plus one, in which there are two objects uh, that occlude each other. And so we have the representation of the, the scene at frame T. Uh, we, um, we generate some particle, uh, that is, we generate some new graphs starting from graph uh, at frame T. And uh, this graph represents uh, some uh, symbols of the generation of the particles uh, of frame uh, graph at frame T and measuring measuring uh, the uh, likelihood by graph kernel, we can give the best the best solution and so we can give the we can give the result as uh, you can see at the right of the slide. So here again, I can show you uh, a video of this proposal, and you can see how graphs uh, are used in in this context of object uh, object tracking. So still, there are some problem in this in this approach, but uh, it, it's quite good to use uh, to use this kind of uh, this kind of representation. And then uh, last uh, last uh, technique that I want to show you is in the context of action recognition. In the context of uh, action recognition, uh, the, the goal is take a video, given a video, uh, we want to uh, classify video in terms of action. What, what is the action that is used, uh, it, it is uh, proposed in the, in the video. Uh, so in this case, we have a video. And uh, what I want to see you, uh, I, I show you that uh, here we deal with the uh, sequence of uh, sequence of frame, as so sequence of graphs. So here the uh, we have we have a, a dim, uh, one dimension uh, in ad in addition that is the time that is the time. So here we don't deal with only one graph, but we deal with a sequence of graphs. Um, uh, and so uh, how we um, we deal with the, a sequence of graph here we propose it and a classification using bag of graphs so the context is uh, like bag of words that is uh, a well-known techniques to classify uh, classify videos uh, so the idea is to um, transform sequence in an histogram that is the frequencies of graphs uh, with the respect of a code book. So we generate a code book, so some sequence of graphs that represent action. Then given a, a test video, we transform this in a sequence of graphs and we account the uh, frequency of these graphs in the in the code book. Uh, so, so, having, uh, so having an histogram that is the bag of graphs. And then this histogram is classified uh, using some uh, uh, classical technique like uh, SVM or other uh, classification technique. So here, the, the, the key points is to construct the uh, code book that is, um, is based on a sequence of graphs and, um, and, and then to compare graphs with these sequences. 
So to construct this, we use some video in the training, uh, in training set, and then uh, to compare this sequence with the, a sequence test, so a sequence graph in the test, we use um, a, a similarity measure um, based on graph edit distance. So the graph edit distance me measure uh, in somehow the distance between two graphs. Uh, here uh, again, uh, we uh, I show you some some results that are the results we proposed uh, in 2018 uh, in SSPR uh, conference. So this was uh, just an overview of some techniques used, uh, old techniques um, using graphs in computer vision. Now, uh, as all of you know, uh, uh, graphs are used with deep learning so uh, i will not go in the in depth in this this part because uh, uh, all the workshop is dedicated to this uh, but it's just to uh, to give you uh, the evolution of graphs how they are used in uh, computer vision and so uh, here there are some techniques some some architecture uh, deep architecture using uh, graphs um, so just the principle, the idea is to having a graph at the input and use uh, some message passing techniques between nodes and in the, in in a deep in a deep fashion uh, in order to have a new representation of uh, uh, features on each node of graphs. So uh, so then this feature can be used for classifying node, for classifying edges, and also with some uh, read out function that aggregate the feature or nodes, also some graph classification. And uh, uh, deep learning are used also for sequence uh, of graphs. So, so for example, for action recognition that I presented before. And uh, also from, uh, there are some proposition uh, from, uh, uh, for, for autoencoder. So to, uh, to embed the graphs in a latent space and also to generate new uh, new graphs. But as I said, I don't want to go into details for this. I just to, uh, want to show you that there are many propositions now with the, with the deep learning and these kind of proposition are used in this domain, uh, in this application domain that I, I showed uh, before. So for example, uh, spatiotemporal spatio graph representation are used uh, for action recognition or message passing neural network are used for object tracking and also for other kind of computer vision tasks like uh, segmentation. So I want to conclude with some uh, remarks. Uh, now with the uh, combination of graphs and deep learning, these are, are um, almost eliminated the gap that was between statistical and structural pattern recognition. Now more and more structural pattern recognition and graphs are used in the computer vision, but still many improvements are possible. Um, and uh, I think all the ideas like as this, um, these ideas that I, I was presented in this, pre this presentation can be used also to improve some new techniques uh, on using deep learning. So I, I think that uh, uh, we, we can use some old idea uh, to use in the new uh, architecture and in, uh, in particular in deep learning. Um, in particular, to conclude, I think the most important part is the representation. We have to work more on how to represent data graphs and then use some existing architecture to solve a problem with, uh, I think, good results. So thank you for, the, um, for your uh, listening. And I, I want just to you, uh, show you, um, um, if you don't uh, know this, um, the website of uh, IAPR uh, Technical Committee 15 that is devoted to graphs. So if you are interested to, to continue to, to have uh, some idea and uh, also some uh, uh, news on this, you can, 
you can uh, um, see this. Thank you. So, uh, any questions from the audience? We do have uh, time for some questions, I think. So. You can raise your hand or um, post your questions in the chat box. Both will work, I think. Perhaps, uh, Donato, I, I do have one quick question, basically. So uh, you mentioned about that uh, graph learning and also deep learning to definitely make it, make, um, uh, it possible to, to improve structure um, pattern recognition. So in that, in that space anyway. So um, I'm thinking that Yes, um, both graph learning and the deep learning, they definitely bring a lot of changes to in terms of techniques. So, but uh, what I'm very um, curious that if there is anything that have not be um, changed or um, should I say, uh, do you think or what techniques will be kept even we have deep learning or, or, or graph learning because we do we, we we did have a lot of very also i think effective techniques in old days i mean before graph learning before deep learning so but i'm just curious um what kind of techniques old techniques let's say will be still working uh, even in this um, age of deep learning? Yeah, yes, thank you for this uh, question. I, I, I agree with you that uh, uh, we, we can keep some techniques because uh, there was uh, a lot of research on this, many years of research on uh, techniques with graphs. Uh, um, sometimes not effective in terms of uh, results, but a, a, a anyway, in terms of uh, some ideas, uh, uh, it can keep. I, I think it's more on uh, uh, representation. For example, all representation of uh, uh, images, video uh, by graphs. So there are many, many ideas in terms of, for example, uh, yes, in uh, pyramid of graphs with some uh, different uh, uh, resolution levels or region touches graphs, uh, all these kind of representation uh, uh, can be used. Uh, so, so, and so not using only just graphs, uh, just images like in terms of pixels, but to have a, a, a research on uh, how we can represent this with, uh, with graphs. Uh, so I think this is, uh, could be a key point for improve uh, also uh, deep learning with some uh, of good representation and also some techniques uh, like graph kernels. I think graph kernels can be also uh, still able to have uh, some uh, good results with respect to some, some, some tasks. Yes. Yes, uh, thanks very much for the um uh comments so any other questions from the audience last call if there is no further questions i i would like to thank you again uh to uh donetano so for the wonderful talk and very we appreciate your time and the talk. So thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you. Thank you.
I know you're busy, so uh, you're free to go, but you are welcome to stay, of course. So uh, we will move on to our technical session. So um, let's move forward to uh, the second technical session. And in this session, we will have see another six paper presentation. The first presentation is about graph augmentation learning, which will be presented by Shou Yu, I think. So over to you, Shou. Uh, yes, um, the, I am trying to share my screen and... Um... Um, it, it seems like I have to uh, log into the meeting according to uh, through the Zoom meeting, and I will be back very soon. So, uh, Steve, I think uh, you are the volunteer, right? So, can you please make yourself the host of this meeting and make me the co-host? I think uh, in some cases we need to make our presenter our co-host so that they can share the screen, I think. So so Steve. Or do you have any volunteer here? Because in this meeting room, we don't have any host. Hi, all. Can, can, you, uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Uh, please go ahead, show. OK, sorry. Um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Shu Yu from Dani University of Technology, and I am here on behalf of all my co-authors, including Hua Fei Huang, Min Zhao, and Feng Xia. And uh, the work we presented is entitled with the graph augmentation learning. So um, my presentation will be divided into the following six uh, parts. So first, uh, let me introduce the uh, background very, uh, very uh, clearly. So um, we are now gathered around because of the um, we we have high recognition about graphs and graph learnings. So graphs have been widely used to formulate uh, different relationships, such as uh, social networks, uh, traffic networks, biological networks, and co-author networks and communication networks. So. Graph learning has attracted really considerable attention uh, because of these widely applications, uh, such as data mining, uh, knowledge discovery, and graph, math, graph learning methods have gained really increasing popularity for capturing the complex relationships among the graphs. And, um, but uh, in, real, in real world, we cannot uh, always have some perfect data such as uh, we might lose many uh, ages, nodes, as well as some labeled data uh, through the process of data collection. And also uh, current uh, graph learning models have some uh, limitations such as over smoothing or one uh, WL limitation. Uh, so uh, over smoothing, I believe uh, you are quite familiar and one WL limitation is also a recognized uh, limitation uh, because uh, GNN has the limitation uh, of that it cannot really uh, recognize the two different graph structures as shown in the slides. And so uh, in our work, we focus on several important questions. One is what is graph augmentation learning. And another is what scenario 
GAL techniques should be employed? And then what GAL techniques are applicable for different tasks? So our, our survey paper is first, it is a semantic review, and it is also the first review devoted to GAL. We classify the strategy of existing GAL uh, from three levels, micro level, meso level, and macro level. And this survey paper is um, also uh, give three scenarios to describe uh, what GAL techniques should be employed, including data specific scenario, model specific scenario, and hybrid scenario. And finally, we implement some experimental uh, re uh, experiments to validate the GAL techniques in different applications. And the effectiveness of GAL is also be um, is also be proved. So here we listed a, a general graph. The, the first part, the upper part of the process uh, represents represent the process of general graph learning process, including input data, propagation, representation, optimization, and so on. And the graph augmentation techniques uh, widely exist in all the process of uh, graph learning, including node aids of uh, modification, attribute com completion, decouple representation, and the construct learning and pre-training and fine-tuning. So what is a GAL? So graph augmentation learning is essentially a kind of graph learning methods, and that integrates a class of augmentation strategies, mechanisms, and models. So here I also list three very typical um, augmentation learning uh, way. So the first one, uh, it adds a denoising layer in the process of G, uh, GNN, and it is published in the WSDM. And the second, uh, the second framework also add uh, another, uh, another process from the uh, constructive learning. And the third one is also an constructive learning with no dropping and age perturbation. So uh, we classify GAL strategies into three levels. That is micro level, meso level, and macro level. So the three different levels focus on different structure in the graph data. So micro level um, focus on the node level uh, because uh, it generally change the uh, the graphs uh, in a very minor way because uh, it focuses on the those ages and the attributes of nodes or the ages. So for the muscle level, it focuses on the uh, subgraph or the substructure uh, or the substructure or the paths in the graphs, and they employ the substructure information to enhance the graph representation learning. So from the macro level, uh, graph uh, GAL target to improve the graph learning methods from a global view. And um, we divided different strategies and list them in these slides. And, and the macro level, including node dropping, age adding, age dropping, attribute completion, and the macro level include uh, graph denoising, multitask learning, pre-training, and meso level include uh, subgraph sampling, subgraph cropping, and so on. So uh, in general, uh, GAL is of many advantages. First, it enables the original G uh, graph learning model to have better uh, robustness or the performance. And then, GAL do not have to modify the original graph learning model structure, and it can also achieve uh, good performance um, or even better, yes. And the GAL will um, share the, if, if two different graph learning models have the same, you use the similar uh, structure and I believe the graph learning uh, GAL strategy will have help them to achieve better performance as well. So that is uh, uh, we call it generality. 
And also it is possible to use two or more GL techniques in one graph learning methods. So they can jointly enhance the original model in their respective aspects. Also GL techniques can work on all levels of graph tasks and new GL techniques are emerging all the time. Uh, here we uh, divided, developed the uh, we divided the application scenario into three different um, ways. One is data specific, another is model specific, and we also have hybrid uh, scenario. So uh, for few label data, we can use pre-training or fine-tuning, constructive or adversarial loss. And for low quality data, we can complement node attribute or denoise the graph structure. So for uh, the model specific uh, situation, we can, uh, we can to handle the over smoothing problem, we can add a regularization term, introduce subgraph information, use decoupled representation learning, or, and for one WL limitation, we can introduce identity information or use higher order structure feature around nodes. And all these techniques can combine together to together enhance the performance of graph learning. So next, uh, we also implement uh, one, two, three, four, uh, three different uh, tasks for uh, to uh, validate the effectiveness of augmentation techniques. So uh, we use uh, four data sets to uh, to implement our experiment and all of the augment, augmented graph learning method achieve better performance so that also prove the effectiveness of the graph learning uh, the graph augmentation learning techniques uh, still now uh, GEL still faced uh, several open issues that first comes to the heterogeneity because due to the diversity of types or of nodes and edges in heterogeneous graph as the uh, in the keynote uh, keynote speak in uh, session one uh, professor Zhang also uh, introduced uh, her work about the uh, heterogeneous uh, network and it will be more difficult to study graph augmentation learning than on the homogeneous graph and the second open issue is about the spatial temporal dynamics. So the spatial temporal networks vary over time and the loss and the inaccuracy um, happen every time. The increasing data complexity also have a significant influ influence on GAL techniques. The, th the third uh, open issue is scalability. So the large scale networks are um, really everywhere in the real world and contains lots of nodes. Uh, so the graph learning models are generally very time consuming and leading to GAL techniques also, uh, also uh, have the unaffordable space complexity. Finally, it comes with the generalization. Although GAL approaches have been proved to be effective in many different tasks, uh, most appro approaches or strategies are designed to uh, for a specific task or data set, as we listed here. So uh, we are uh, we are aiming to uh, develop, or we are heading to a next generation of graph augmentation learning that. Uh, that the, these techniques should be very generalized. So it can be a, a, a unified framework that for all of the GNN methods or GNN graph learning frameworks to um, directly employ to enhance their uh, performance under the situation of uh, imperfect data such as uh, 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 missing value, missing ages or missing label. Also, um, GAL techniques will overcome the many limitations of current graph learning have, such as uh, over smoothing problem. And it will also handling some uh, difficult tasks that current graph learning might not perform that well, such as few short learning and something like that. So um, 
that's all for my presentation. And please feel free to uh, ask and communicate with me. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the audience? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yes, please yes, go please. ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, thank you. What do you think work, um, works better, um, model-based augmentation or uh, data-based augmentation? Have you tried uh, any experiments on that? You mean this slide here? Uh, yes. Yes, he, here I list the, um, actually the, the here comes to uh, three, Thank you for your question. Uh, here comes for three different uh, scenario. One is data specific, another is model specific. So technically, um, both data specific uh, techniques and model specific techniques, we the, the same aim is to achieve better performance or a more stable, a more explainable result. Uh, so uh, here we divided them into different scenario just because um, it is quite straightforward for uh, the readers can understand. Uh, but um, but uh, the constructive uh, loss or some denoised graph structure might also have some function on uh, model specific scenario. That is also true, but that might uh, function not that directly instead of it is function um, yeah, another way and achieve the same or similar performance as well. Uh, yeah, um, just I would like, uh, thank you. I would like just to see, uh, I mean, it makes me curious to see the uh, from empirical uh, perspective, which one works better data or model um, uh, or, or model or model uh, specific uh, augmentation. Uh, I mean, uh, be, because like I'm trying to think of scenarios where which one uh, which one should work better. Uh, for example, when the data is lagging, like uh, like a few shot learning, uh, perhaps uh, uh, perhaps at time uh, a, a data augmentation or model augmentation could be better. Maybe I'm not sure. So uh, I, I will be. It would be nice in the survey if it could include uh, some insights about this. Um, but thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so sometimes we, we might um, mix use the different st uh, strategy together to achieve the performance that we wanted. And the question you raised is really uh, very critical and very uh, close to the reality because um, actually uh, uh, in, in some scenarios we can use both or both uh, techniques together because we we generally do not use uh, if ah oh, sorry if we we use just a single uh, uh, augmentation strategy can achieve better performance that is also great but most time we we might need to combine them together in different process of the graph learnings. Thank you. Thanks, Sho. Very well done. So um, with that, we will move on to the next presentation. Uh, the next presentation is about multi-graph-based uh, multi-scenario recommendation in large-scale online video services. I see John is here, so over yeah. to you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Okay, so let me uh, share my screen. Uh, maybe can you uh, can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. It, it says you have started the screen sharing. Double click yes. to enter. Oh, okay, yes. Now I can see you now. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Okay.
Okay, uh, so let's begin our presentation. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Fan Zhang. Uh, I'm a machine learning researcher at OPPO Research Institute. And this is, um, okay, so we are really honored um, that our recent work is, is accepted by Graph Learning 2022 here. And thanks for all the comments and suggestions in advance. The work we are going to present today is titled uh, Model Graph Based Model Scenario Recommendation in Large Scale Online Video Services. Um, the work is done last year in, um, to study graph learning in the area of recommendation systems, especially practice in shipping video online recommendation system. Okay, so let's uh, So the introduction is composed of the following parts on um, the background of the study, motivation. Uh, how we construct uh, the model graph upon given data, the model architecture, uh, offline and online results, and our conclusion. Okay, so talking about background, actually at first uh, we were working on, oh sorry, let, let me minimize the, okay. So talking about background, actually at first we were working on improving the performance of graph neural networks in the homepage recommendation scenario in shipping app. Uh, however, in practice, we found it difficult to beat traditional algorithms with single graph neural networks. For traditional algorithms, we mean the famous deep neural networks from YouTube, the deep FM and the recommendation strategies. So we start thinking about improving model performance from the data end. And that's when we were given browser data and found out the two scenarios are very similar to each other. So the picture in the slides below is an illustration of the two scenarios. The homepage recommendation scenario in shipping app on the left and the feed scenario in browser app on the right. So, uh, so notice here that shipping and browser are two pre-installed applications in mobile phones manufactured by our company, Oppo. Um, they are similar to the pre-installed pre -installed apps in iPhones like Podcast and Sephora. Uh, it can be told from the illustration here that the two scenarios are very similar, where the user interaction pattern is similar, which means the backend user logs share the same data format, and they share a same survey logic, and, um, and, the, and most importantly, the videos from the two scenarios are provided from a same third-party service, which means that the item proofs are the same. So given shipping and browser data, a question comes to us, is there a method to incorporate interaction pattern from the two scenarios with similar recommendation settings so as to improve user experience in the target scenario? Okay, so the most straightforward method is to simply concatenate user logs from the two scenarios and feed it into a neural network. However, if you think carefully, it's not feasible since the data distributions of the two scenarios are different, which means user preferences and behaviors are different. Um, so such a difference in data distributions is often called the exposure bias problem, which means although the, although the initial item pool are the same, but circulations of machine learning training on human interaction history leads algorithms to repeatedly suggest exposed items while ignoring less active ones, such that suggested items from each scenario usually biases to more exposed items, such that simply migrating browser algorithms to shipping will not improve model performance in shipping scenario. Right, so, um, so that is the problem in our situation, how to combine shipping homepage and browser feeds data and to improve recommendation in shipping scenario. And there are several exist existing solutions based on transfer learning in the field. Uh, however, we argue that they do not apply to our case. For example, the feature alignment method is not feasible since videos, videos show the same features across scenarios. Uh, and the label alignment method may result in loss of domain variant interaction information. And the third transport learning method is knowledge transfer, whose most famous solution is called domain adaption, but it fails due to invariance in interaction patterns from exposure bias. And another famous transport learning method is multitask learning. However, it's also not applicable since the two scenarios are not trained simultaneously. 
Therefore, we propose a graph-based item to item recommendation solution here to learn multi-scenario video rep representations here. More specifically, we construct a multigraph, the cross-scenario multigraph to encapsulate interaction data from multiple scenarios. And we propose a multigraph fusion networks to capture scenario-wise pattern with graph learning modules and to learn a global video representation by combining scenario-wise representations. So the advantages of these methods are, first of all, the base single scenario graph format is already proved is already proved effective in um, Pinsage, the Pinterest model, and EGS, the Alibaba model. And secondly, the structure of Multigraph is naturally able to formulate one type of videos with nodes and various types of transitions with edges, and it's easily extendable to more scenarios in the future. And thirdly, the, me uh, the message passing mechanism allows for easy integration on scenario-wise interaction with graph learning modules. So it's a naturally good solution for such type of multi-scenario recommendation problem. Okay, so let's see how we construct the cross-scenario multigraph from given shipping and browser data. The plot is shown in the figure below. The nodes represent videos and edges represent interest Trans transitions between videos. The multigraph is constructed, constructed from user logs, where for each user U in scenario S, we iterate over its watch sequence and collect each adjacent pair of videos as one edge. Since the I plus one node is recommended by deployed algorithms, this amortized edge from the I plus the I node to I plus one node represent um, the intensity of global user preference between videos. After iterating over all the data from two scenarios, we can obtain a cross-scenario multigraph. But the question is, why the multigraph is especially effective in multi-scenario recommendation? In order to explain this, we split all the edges from the multigraph based on their functionalities. So the nodes are split into three types, the blue nodes represent those videos who have only appeared in shipping log data. The yellow nodes represent those videos who have only appeared in browser, browser log. And the green nodes represent videos who have been watched in two scenarios in the past seven days in our data log. Then the edge from browser can be split into three types. First of all, uh, it's the co-shared edge. Uh, which is made of green nodes, and they have appeared in both scenarios before. They, use, they usually compose of training videos, which have acti actively been watched in both apps or are generated from strongly correlated videos. This type of edge is supposed to align node representation learning across scenarios, so they can guarantee a base performance for cross-scenario learning. And the second type is the browser-only edge, made of at least one co-shared uh, co videos. The videos forming this type of, uh, of, of this type of edge have been exposed in shipping scenario, while transitions between them haven't been captured in shipping yet. However, I think these transitions could appear in browser. It means better capturing these transitions of videos may shorten the distance in the multi-scenario embedding space. So this type of edge is the most important type of edge that we want our method to learn, and they may bring the most benefits to our cross-scenario model. And the third type is the browser-only edge, composed of browser-exclusive videos. They represent inner browser transition, pat transition patterns. They exist in the multi-hop neighborhood away from shipping exclusive videos and are connected to the shipping exclusive videos should uh, throw out the co-shared edge. The message passing mechanism of graph neural networks allows for distant modeling for this type of edge, and consequently, is expanding the receptive, receptive field of our recommendation algorithms. Okay, so coming to the model, model architecture, based on the understanding of our cross-scenario multigraph, the modeling part actually becomes very simple. We use multi-layer perceptrons to transform video features into 128 dimensions, and we used graph sage and G graph attentional 
networks, the convolutional modules, followed by um, concatenation operation to fuse video representations in browser subgraph and shipping subgraph. And then a final multi-layer perceptron is applied to generate global video representations. After this, the latent factors are uh, fed into BPR loss for training or fights with nearest neighbor search for online serving. Um, special note here that um, during generating negative samples, instead of randomly sample negative nodes from all the videos, we used a cross scenario negative sampling strategy where negative nodes are sampled based on their global degree distribution. In all flying experiments, this negative sampling strategy performs the best. Okay, so at last, we, test, we tested our idea on two offline data sets. The data sets are generated from real world user logs in shipping and browser scenarios in last June and July. Each graph is composed of millions of nodes and tens of millions, millions of edges. Um, the offline results are, list, are listed in table four. We can tell that our proposed model outperforms all the other multi-scenario models. And the online results are listed in table six, where our proposed measures also demonstrates an overall positive performance over the deployed set of baseline models. Okay. Um, however, the most important question is, how can we prove that our model is effective in solving exposure bias and post out problems? The answer is actually to look at the important number of browser exclusive videos. They are the videos which have not been watched in the past seven days in shipping log data. So they will not be suggested by the online system since they just do not appear in the training set. But now they are now able to be brought to users by our algorithms by using the browser interaction data. So we counted the number of activated browser video watchers after deployment. In the first, in the first 10 days, the data concatenation method, um, which is also the vanilla multi-scenario modeling method, it's activated 85,000 video watches on average. In comparison, in the last 10 days, our method activated 185,000 video watches, increasing by 116%. And, um, and by looking and um, by looking at the unique number of activated videos, the number increases by 25%. Therefore, the result combined with an overall positive performance, we confirmed the effectiveness of our proposed model in activating code videos. Okay, so therefore, based on our reasoning and experiment, we concluded that, first of all, the multigraph is a naturally effective data format for multi-scenario modeling, and the mechanism is explained. And secondly, the multigraph Fusion networks is an overall uh, is overall effective in multi scenario recommendation, and thirdly, the multigraph based solution demonstrates an outstanding effect in activating less less watched videos to enrich target recommendation. And to take a step forward, the solution can be easily extended to other real world business cases. For example, the recommendation of popular products overseas across e-commerce sub-markets or integration of similar scenarios with same user interaction, with same user agent interaction patterns. Okay, so thanks for listening. Um, is there any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, thank you again for the presentation. Um, it's, it's actually a nice work, but uh, I would like to know what kind of loss function did you use? Yes, uh, for our network, we use the BPR loss, the Bayesian pairwise um, loss. Uh, it's actually a specific um, pairwise loss function for link, predi link prediction problem. Uh, it's usually used in recommendation algorithms. Because now I'm thinking um, uh, how this could relate to the previous presentation about uh, self-suburb, about contrastive loss. 
So basically, you can see this two multigraph as uh, as a different augmentation learning. So how you see it from this perspective? Uh, actually, I'm not sure about how to apply the constructive loss in our um, uh, in our recommended in our recommender system. Um, because although we have two multigraphs, right? Actually, we use a graph encoder to um, pull out the uh, embedding for each subgraph, and then we concatenate um, the embeddings together into one global embedding. And then we use this global embedding and feed it into the um, the pairwise loss function to um, to how to say to update the parameters and to learn the model parameters. Yeah, yeah, I understand the architecture, but I was thinking if the two graphs, uh, the blue and the yellow graphs, uh, they have a lot of like share, uh, like they have shared edges and nodes. Uh, perhaps you can use one of them as the augmentation of the other, and then you will change. You don't need to do uh, MLP, you don't need the same loss function, you will change the task and you don't need concatenation. Basically, you will replace the concatenation with uh, contrast of loss. Uh, that might be interesting to do. Oh uh, yeah, uh, I think our uh, mean is uh, is uh, actually to use the multitask learning, right? So um, by contracted uh, constructive loss, uh, 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 you can how to say to improve the um, parameter learning in the blue graph, and then um, um, to do a uh, separate um, learning for the yellow graph, right? Uh, uh if uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was thinking mostly like both of them. The yellow is augmentation for the blue, and instead of multitask learning, you do contrast of learning. Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, yes, we can do that. Um, but uh, if you want to, how do you say, deploy the model to our online system, uh, you will have to, uh, how do you say, deploy the, uh, the model into the blue system, right? And then the yellow system, which is the shipping and browser uh, recommendation backend, right? So if we have to deploy the same model into two backends, we will have to do some actual engineering pipeline stuff. Um, but for now, on the, I would say the backends for the two recommendation pipelines are separated. So we can just, uh, so we not, um, improve the learning for the two scenarios together, we have to, how say, uh, import the browser data into our shipping scenario instead of, um, instead of the constructive learning for the two scenarios at the same time. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, thank you. So, uh, Thank you, Fan, for the wonderful uh, talk and also um, the answers and also the in interesting discussion here. So thanks again. Great, thank you. And uh, um, the next presentation presentation uh, will be about mining homophilic um, groups of users using edge attributed node embedding from enterprise social network networks. So do we have the presenter here? Uh, yes, but uh, we have a recorded video. So um, volunteer? Steph, are you with us? Because I don't have the video um, recording, but um, do we have the conference volunteer here with us? So in that case, Priyanka, would you like to do the presentation here? 
Sorry about that because uh, I, it's, it's very um, odd that we don't have any volunteer here. So, so and basically, I don't have the video. Or if you like, you, you can play your, your recordings. Uh, that would be helpful. Uh, OK, that would be helpful. Yes. Please. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk on my. You may need to share your screen. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk on mining homophilic groups of users using edge attributed node embedding. I'm Priyanka and I shall be presenting our work. Through this talk, I shall introduce the problem in mining homophilic groups of users, followed by details on our algorithm for the same. I shall then present our experiments and discuss our evaluations on a few enterprise social network data sets. We observe that any large and geographically distributed organization has redundancies. There are people working on similar work contexts, but in different parts of the enterprise. They may be behaviorally, operationally, contextually be similar and peers, or in fact, peer groups, that is a group that they behave similarly or even work towards similar goals, but they may be unaware of each other's presence. We note that people who are working in the same role, say human resources, engineering, or executive, have similar patterns of communication. Communication not only from the perspective of number of messages they send and receive, but also the psychologically relevant aspects of communication. Please note that engagement on enterprise social networks, be it activity or the unstructured text that they post, can be assumed to arise from conscious thought and effort on part of the individual, as again, say, on general social networks, which are informal. In order to mine such peer groups, I represent the communication between people in an enterprise using an edge attributed multigraph of their communication. The graph is composed of employees represented as vertices and communication between them as edges. The edges are multi edges where each edge is directed and weighted on a behaviorally relevant attribute of the communication between the users. This can be represented as a multilinear array or a tensor as opposed to an adjacency matrix. As I have described the enterprise communication as a graph, I firstly describe the existing algorithm graph wave, which calculates structurally relevant node embeddings in a graph where the adjacency matrix is weighted. The graph wave algorithm takes the adjacency matrix as input and calculates the Laplacian of the matrix and then the eigenvector decomposition of it to identify the orthogonal basis of the matrix. Thereafter, structurally, the effect of the neighborhood of a node in the graph can be calculated using a heat kernel, which is the spectral graph wavelet surrounding that node. Empirically, that is determined by taking the evenly spaced sample points and calculating the wavelet that is the effect of those column vectors on the node to give rise to a node embedding. 
which is a series of real and imaginary parts of the D points, resulting in a, an embedding 2D size long. The distance between two nodes may be the L2 norm of respective embeddings. I extend the graph wave algorithm to propose a node embedding algorithm for my enterprise communication graph representation. In my case, the input is a weighted adjacency tensor in place of a weighted adjacency matrix. Therefore, I use higher order singular value decomposition in place of eigenvector decomposition to obtain the orthogonal basis. As in the graph wave algorithm, I apply the heat kernel on the core tensor values to identify the effect of the structural and behavioral position of the node. Empirically, I take these sample points to calculate the multidimensional characteristic function of the effect of neighborhood on nodes. Since the features that I consider contribute non-linearly to the phenomena, I use a deep convolutional autoencoder to reduce the dimension of these embeddings to result in a vector of size 2b, which are then the node embeddings of the Melty graph. The resulting node embeddings are used as distances between two nodes by their L2 norm. I have also experimented with cosine distance. I run k-means clustering to cluster structurally similar nodes together to observe that they have similar roles, role labels. Using these structural la cluster labels as role labels, I iteratively group nodes together based on the Jacquard similarity of constituent cluster labels of k-hop neighbors. This allows me to identify homophilic peer groups. I apply the algorithm on two data sets, the stack exchange data set and the Enron email data set. Within the stack exchange platform, I work with the workplace community that discusses work-related issues. We observe here in a sample cluster and the distribution of batch labels that they indeed are similar. For the Enron data set too, we see that the cluster has the same batch label. I'd like to note here that many users do not have role labels in our data set and, and are part of the graph and they are part of the clustering as well. For each data set here, I present the various features that I have considered. For the Enron data set, I have considered the size of the vocabulary used, the number of emails sent and received, sentiment intensity and polarity in those messages, parts of speech used uh, by the part, uh, parts of speech used in the messages. While for the stack exchange data set, I have used a reduced set of features, including an enterprise social media structured attribute, such as popularity. The impact categories in both these data sets that I have used as features is a deep neural network that is word to vec like adaptation of the psycholinguistically studied ling linguistic inquiry word count categories that I have used earlier. Therefore, the pre trained MPAT model that I have used has 200 psycholinguistically relevant categories of words that are found in social media and provide higher coverage than LIWC alone. I study the goodness of our resultant clusters and groups using a few measures. For a clustering using node embeddings, I use Jacquard similarity measure that provides a score of how much the clustering matches existing available role labels. Further, I have used Davies Bolden index, which is a known internal measure of clustering goodness. Here I first calculate the average intercluster distance between points in a pair of clusters, which is used to normalize the sum of intercluster distances between points within the cluster. For each cluster, I identify the maximum such values against all other clusters. I sum them up and normalize by the total number of clusters. A lower value of Davies boarding index indicates better clustering. I also use the well-known entropy-based robust measures such as normalized mutual information where I'm calculating the mutual information between role labels and identified cluster labels. A higher NMI denotes better clustering. Entropy is usually P log P. 
Here we present some of these measures on experiments on the data sets. The first column in the table lists, lists the algorithms used. My algorithm is termed as multivariate, and I compare with graph wave and node vector. We observe that Davies Bolton index is lower while normalized mutual information is relatively higher. In the heat maps, we see how cluster labels co correlate with existing role labels. From the heat maps, we observe that indeed for some well labeled roles, our clustering algorithm does indeed cluster them in one cluster. Thank you. For, uh, from all of us for attending our talk. Me, Dillis, and Ritu are available here for any questions you may have now and throughout the conference on Gather Town and Goa as well as over email. Thank you. Thank you, Any questions for Priyanka? Last call. If there's no questions or comments for Priyanka, then I'd like to thank Priyanka for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next presentation will be about REPS. Yes. Do we have the presenter here? Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'll be taking you through the REPS paper. Um, let me share my screen, please. Uh, let me know when it's up. Can you see my screen? Oh, yes, I can. Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So uh, REPS is basically an entity alignment method which uses different notions present in a graph uh, to perform optimal entity alignment between two entities. So I'll start by describing the problem statement and what is the significance of uh, this entity alignment task in different corporate networks. So first of all, the problem statement, entity alignment is a very uh, popular problem, especially in terms of databases, where the idea is we want to fuse two different uh, databases which have complementary information about the same entity but we don't really have a primary key to fuse them on. So, uh, sorry. Um, so uh, why this is important is because uh, let's say in a corporate network, let's take, we take the MasterCard framework as I work in MasterCard uh, as an example. So the idea is let's say we have two databases where uh, we have different information about a card holder and we want to analyze a card holder using all of these informations in, in one space. But we can't really uh, merge these two information until and unless we have a primary key of card holder on both the da databases, which uh, let's just assume for the sake of discussion is absent. So how do we match these two databases and how do we get all the information of a card holder at a single place? So uh, this is what the problem of entity alignment is. And uh, uh, we started working on this problem and noted that there were several uh, problems in the existing method. So I'll uh, briefly describe what these problems are. So first of, of all is non-isomorphism. So the way we are tackling this problem is by using graphs. So the general notion is that we build two different knowledge graphs using the two databases that we want to merge. And then we generate representation for each of those entities. And the entities which fall very closely in the representation space, we say that those are uh, the same entity. Now, uh, where does non-isomorphism comes into picture in all of these scenarios? So let's say we have an entity uh, A in both the graphs, but now because of data incompletion or because the data not being very coherent, the 
subgraph surrounding node A in both the databases could be very different. And because earlier methods have you have primarily dependent on GNNs, which embed the information of neighborhood information into the embeddings, because their uh, neighborhood uh, structure is different, we, we will not get very optimal matching at the end state because GNNs uh, primarily capture the neighborhood structure information. So that is where uh, existing algorithms struggle, whereas to match the entities which have, uh, which don't really have similar neighborhoods in the graph. So that was one of the problems. The other one is effective and interpretable utilization of relations. So in a knowledge graph, when we are trying to generate representation of an entity, if we just take a plain graph neural network, uh, it will not assign different importance to different attributes. So it could be uh, that node A lives in Europe, whereas node A plays for, let's say, Liverpool. So because the, the sample space of Liverpool, number of people who play for Liverpool is very low, the importance that should be given to that particular relation should be higher because a place for Liverpool helps us to distinguish that particular entity more than lives in Europe. So uh, utilizing each of these different relations with different uh, importances is very important when generating the final representation. So that is, again, some of the areas where our method focuses on. And then the last one was hard negative sample. So this is, uh, we basically, negative samples are used to train our model effectively. So the idea is that we generate negative samples, which are nothing but pair of entities, which we tell our model that these two are not the same entity. And then we train our model such that we take the representation of those two entities as far as possible. But uh, actually generating such negative sample is a tough task because if we want our model to distinguish very finely, have a very fine uh, dichotomy of where it wants to call an entity as same and where it does not want to call the entity as same, the negative samples we are using to train our network should be very tough. As in, when I'm, I'm saying that, I take node A and node B as my negative sample, and node A is a person who plays for Liverpool, whereas node B is 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 a navy ship. Then these two entities are inherently very different, so it will be very easy for our model to distinguish between them, and hence the model training will not be very optimal. So we want those negative samples to be as close as possible, but not the same, so that we tell our model that these two entities are different and it, it trains our weights more optimally. So these are some of the problems which were which were existing in the current method and which we tackle by the proposed method, which is REPS. And I'll, I'll, now I'll go more into the architecture as to how we actually uh, come about doing these things. So a very bird's eye view of the architecture is somewhat of this sort. So uh, we start from random initialization of all the node embeddings and relation embeddings. We pass them through uh, two parallel layers. So the first set of uh, layers is a GCN, which is backed by GRN. A GRN is a graph relation network, which is which has been proposed by us. I'll be talking about this in more detail below. And RPA is again so a module which which has been proposed by us, which uses position of a node, which we'll uh, describe further. Now we take the representation coming from both these blocks and merge them using a highway gate. And this is how we get our output embeddings. And then we use a uh, similarity based matching to get which embeddings are closest to each other. Now I'll uh, go on explaining each of these blocks in more detail. And then we'll talk about what results we get got and what analysis do we have. So starting from GCN, GCN is just a graph convolution network, uh, which, which uh, outputs the embedding as the average of its neighbor embedding so a node output embedding would be the average of all the embeddings of its neighbors so that is gcn very straightforward then moving on to grn so we modified gcn a little bit to incorporate of that problem of assigning different importances to different relations so uh, if we talk about grn this is the update function here so uh, if you look closely, what is happening is uh, HL, we are trying to generate the output embedding for the node uh, K at the LH layer. So we, are take, we take all the neighborhoods of node K and we take node K itself and we learn some coefficients for each of these nodes. So we learn a self coefficient for a node and we learn a, a relation coefficient for every relation. So these relation coefficients stay the same for every relation. 
independent of which node it is assigned with. So we'll try to learn a scalar for each relation, which defines its uh, importance. Now, there are a lot of methods which uh, do certain things, which assign a vector to a relation and then try to model it in that manner. But uh, now, why we wanted to move on to a scalar rather than a vector? Because we wanted a more interpretable matching. Because when in a, in a corporate scenario or in a real world problem solving scenario, when we say that two entities are same, right? We need to also explain that why we say that these two entities are same. And if we assign the relations as vector and, and those are not very interpretable. So we wanted to assign every relation a scalar and then we, uh, we saw what those scalars actually mean so that we can explain why two entities got matched with each other. So that was the idea behind choosing a scalar for uh, representing a relation. This also helps in the computation power of, of, of such algorithms and it takes us less time to achieve similar performance than other algorithms with, le with less number of parameters. So yeah, coming back to GRN, we assign a self coefficient for every node and a coefficient for every relation. And this is how we aggregate it. So this is just a weighted uh, sum of individual representation of all the neighborhoods and self node with the coefficients that we're learning. And this is nothing but just an activation function. Sorry, just a linear layer to learn the output representation. So uh, G this is how GRN works. And this, this is one of the blocks that we had proposed. So rather than learning a, a vector for a relation, we are saying that we want to learn a coefficient for a relation which would be global. And by global, I mean that each of those relation weight relation coefficient would be same for a relation, irrespective of uh, where that relation is getting paired with as to what the head and tail of that relations are. So yeah, moving ahead to RPA. So uh, until now we have been using the intrinsic property of a node as to what is its neighborhood uh, structure are. And we are just looking at the local properties of a node. Right, but uh, because of the problem of non isomorphism, as we had discussed earlier, if we just look at the local properties of a node because uh, of data incompletion and, and uh, not very coherent data sets in real world, we often see that uh, even same entities have very different local, local uh, information. So that is why we propose RPA, which takes a more global look at each of these nodes' information. RPA uh, abbreviates for relation aware position aggregation. Now, uh, till now, I would GCN, uh, we define it as, as a more structure aware method, as in it is learning which nodes are uh, surrounding a particular node and it is incorporating that information here. Uh, PGNN, which was pro proposed a way back, introduced the notion of position for learning representation of a node. Now, position of a node is defined with respect to some uh, fixed set of nodes. And how we basically borrow that concept and apply it uh, with some modification into the entity alignment uh, space. So uh, what we say that if two nodes are same, so especially in a cross-lingual graph where uh, the two data sets that we have are nothing but a translation of each other. So we say that position of a node uh, of entity A in, a, in, in KG1 is, should be very much similar to position of that node in the other database with respect to same uh, same uh, fixed node. Because we define position always with a set of reference nodes, we say that with, with if we define, if we are able to define such reference nodes, which is same for both the knowledge graphs, the position that we get for same nodes would be the same. So that is where the motivation came of using the notion of position for entity alignment. Now, anchor sets, so the fixed nodes which I was talking about are uh, named as anchor sets. So uh, this is a supervised framework. So we have a uh, very few number of labels in the beginning as to uh, we have some pair of entities which we know are same in, in both the graphs. And, and we use those pair as our anchor set. So for KG1, I sample some randomly, uh, I sample some entities randomly from my seed nodes, which, which I know the labels for, and uh, I say that those are my anchor nodes and the corresponding labels for those entities uh, are said to be the anchor set for data set two, that is for KG two. And then we define the position of these nodes with respect to those fixed anchor nodes for both the graphs uh, using a relation aware distance. Now, 
I'll, I'll briefly take a minute to define what this relation of air distance is with an example. So let's say we are trying to get the position of this green node using this yellow node and this purple node. So yellow and purple are my anchor nodes and I want the position of my green node. So the position representation is a vector, which is which dimension is equal to the number of fixed nodes that we have. So here we have two nodes. So the position of this green node will be a vector of, of size two. Now the position in a very simplistic manner as proposed in PGNN, what they did was they take the path length from a node and they say that that is the position of green node with respect to yellow node. So the position of green with respect to yellow is two and the position of green with respect to purple is three. So the position of green would be two comma three ideally, but we change the notion of distance calculation by incorporating relation as well, so that the position that we are getting is has more rich information about its its surrounding. Now we define a coefficient for every relation, which is inversely proportional to the frequency of that relation occurring into the graph. Now the idea is that rarer a relation, more is its discriminative power. As in, if if a relation is occurring only once in a graph. That means that if, if I'm trying to define an entity using that relation, I can define it very accurately. Whereas if, if a relation is occurring everywhere in the graph, I'll not be able to point that entity out using that relation only. So we define such, such a coefficient for every relation and we take the average of all those coefficients which are encountered in this path. So that is our relation with the path. And this is how we define our position vector, which is uh, this this is my fixed anchor node, that is the yellow node, into the distance of green node with the yellow node, and we aggregate over all such anchor nodes that we had randomly sampled before. And this is an activation function at the end. So this this gives us the position representation of every node in in the graph. So as, as you as you would know, there are two blocks in our architecture. One that that gives an output from GRN, which is more of the local information of the node, which is capturing which which nodes are present in the neighborhood, which relation it is uh, attached with, and the other block is RPA, which is which is concerned with more of its global properties, and it is telling where the where the node is actually located in the graph with respect to some uh, set fixed set of nodes. Now, both of these uh, representations, both of these set of representation, one the local representation and the other the global representation, have uh, varying. Um, uh, Importances. So let's say if there is a node uh, whose corresponding similar entity has this has the similar local information, the weight given to the the local representation should be higher than given to the global information because we know that those two entities don't exhibit non-isomorphism. Whereas if the local uh, information is very different, then we should give more importance to the position representation that we are learning, and that is why we use a highway layer here which is nothing but a way to aggregate these two representations that we're learning, the local and the global one, by using a dynamic weight. So this dynamic weight is learned uh, using a weight matrix, which takes an input as the position vector and gives out a coefficient between zero to one, which defines how much importance should we give to the position vector for this particular node. And we use that coefficient to aggregate the embedding that we get from the two blocks, the position and the GRA. So uh, this gives us the final output embedding for, for, for a particular node. And we use this using some any similar automatic to get which entities are, are the same. So moving uh, ahead to the result section of for this algorithm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, talking about the hard negative sample that we had discussed on one of the problems. So uh, the prop the popular metric to do this is uniform negative sampling or epsilon truncated negative sampling. So uniform negative sampling, what it does is for any node, it just randomly picks uh, any other nodes as negative sample. So for node A, I'll just randomly pick any node and we'll call that these two nodes are not the same and we'll gi give them as negative sample. So that is uniform negative sampling. Now the problem with that is again, that it, gen it does not generate very hard negative samples and those are very easy to distinguish for our model. And the training which occurs using uniform negative sampling is not uh, very optimal. Then this was uh, modified using epsilon truncated negative sampling, where the negative nodes which I'm sampling is restricted to nodes which are closest to in the latent space. So this is again another popular method how to perform negative sampling. But still, we see that this does not generate a very uh, hard negative samples like we require to train our network. So then 
we propose another we proposed our hard negative sample which if given two seeds in the negative sampling world we sample the uh, the node as negative sample which is sharing at least one relation common with that original node so and this as we can see from the example here for smooth dog uh, the rapid the negative samples that we get using our method are are all either musicians or or rappers as you can see here so this is this was just to generate as negative as hard negative samples as we could so that uh, the training that occurs uh, over the time is more finer so this was just on the last piece moving on to the results that we got so the data set here i have described only the english and french data set we experimented on other data sets as well including english chinese and english german um so yeah um the the baseline comparison here as you can see reps we uh, achieve comparable if not better performance with other state of the art methods on uh, almost all the data sets this is due to the three problem statements that we addressed uh, and the novelty claims are based on those problem statements only so these are from the baseline now uh, giving a brief sneak peek into what those values which we are learning what is the importance of those values actually and how, how it is helping if at all so for uh, grn if if we take only grn as our embedding generation module and we compare it with other relation aware modules that are present in the literature like rgc and mra etc we uh, the number of parameters that we use because we are uh, treating our relation as a scalar is significantly lesser which help us in getting a better training time and overall similar accuracy but if we just use grn we see comparable performance and do a little worse than others but our overall architecture is uh, very much comparable if not better with all of these methods uh, moving on to efficacy of rpa so here is an example to show uh, where rpa actually helps as in the notion of position actually helps so as you can see these both this is the english knowledge graph and this is the french knowledge graph and united states army is just one of the anchor nodes for uh, all of these nodes here uh, node a is navy cross and in knowledge graph b uh, node b and c are two nodes where node c and a are the correct matching um no so what what we saw here was uh, node b which is not the correct match of node a was getting matched by other existing algorithms but if we introduce the notion of position we see that a node a and node c have closer position as compared to node a and node b and finally in our results we saw that our module was matching node a with node b whereas the existing methods were getting confused because these two have a very similar local neighborhood and are very close together in the graph but if we actually look at the position of these two nodes with respect to some certain nodes it, it is very much different and this is how our model is being able to distinguish so this was a brief overview of the work we did for for uh, entity alignment and introducing the notion of position uh into it yeah so that was all from my head so uh thanks deepak and uh, i think we don't have time for questions so if uh you have any questions please feel free to reach uh deepak i think so thanks deepak yes yeah. Thank you. So next presentation will be about scaling RGC and training with graph sum summarization. So yes, I see Michael you. here. So yes, over to you, Michael. Yes, thank you. So I'm sharing the screen this way. Let's see whether this whether this works uh, properly. Um, yes, yeah, so I will be presenting our work on basically exploiting summarizations to uh, scale graph neural network training specifically on uh, heterogeneous graphs. So as we already, as most of you know, so we're working with graphs. Uh, so you have basically things which are related to each other by, by relations. And as we already discussed in the morning during the keynote, um, what we're very interested in is graphs which have um, entities in them, which have things in them which have their own types and which have specific more complex relations between. And so what we are then specifically working on is we're taking this kind of graphs and we are trying to use graph neural networks or other kind of architectures to 
um, do something with that graph to incorporate it into a machine learning pipeline. Now, this goes very nice. We see a lot of, of papers, um, and especially we see them on small graphs like the one on the slide here, right? So, uh, and let's say by small graphs, I mean things up to like 10,000 nodes, uh, even 100,000 nodes, they are still reasonably small graphs. So for these, we're actually quite um, quite much set. We have, we have all kinds of techniques which, which work. Now, once the graphs get bigger um, and much bigger, then we start getting into trouble, right? So we are not able to uh, take these things into our, uh, into our methods. And the main reason for that is because um, they do require a lot of memory. It's not just the memory used to store the graph itself. It's also the memory which is used to um, on top of that, uh, store gradient information, for example, or store other kind of information like, um, let's say, textual information or video information, which is included inside the graph. And so what we want to do is we want to basically reduce the amount of memory which is needed for the graph neural network. Now, several techniques have been uh, already proposed. For example, there is one with sampling. So several of the works uh, presented today even used, uh, used these techniques. Right? And this works reasonably well. So you can, you can use sampling to uh, to basically create these uh, or to use graph neural networks on this kind of larger data sets. It has some issues. So for example, you, you need to try to sort of cover the whole graph with your sampling. It's going to be more difficult to capture very, uh, let's say, let's say like, like more global effect because you take the smaller samples and so on. You could do also another thing, uh, partitioning. So what you can do is you can basically try to cut your graph in multiple parts. Um, especially now if you have some disconnected components or let's say nearly disconnected components. Um, in that case, you can basically take each part of this partition, separately feed them into your graph neural networks. And then, for example, use a multi-GPU training to, um, to basically train your, your network. This works reasonably well. Uh, the problem is this is usually very costly. So you need uh, rather heavy hardware. You need to have multiple GPUs. Uh, and again, you're actually doing the training on the full graph uh, in this kind of cases. So what we are trying to do um, is trying a slightly different approach and basically trying to reduce the size of the network. So we have the original graph. We're first going to make a smaller version of the graph basically by making a summary. We are going to feed that summary or we're going, going to train our graph neural network on that summary. And then we're going to um, solve all the problems, hopefully. Okay, so how are we going to go about it? Well, basically take that original graph Right. We are then going to recognize that we have some parts in the graph which have similar, uh, which are structurally similar, basically. And then we're going to reduce that uh, graph into a smaller one. All right. So in this case, it perfectly works. So we have that, uh, that smaller graph. Then we are going to train the model for that smaller graph, which we can do because it is just smaller in size. And then we are going to do a sort of transfer learning back to the original model. Right. So we have that summarized model and we're going to go back to the uh, original graph. Um, now the thing is that the final models, the one which we've transferred back, can also be trained further. So we can take that original graph and still try to continue training if this is if you can do this in a scalable way. Um, and our final comment here is that what we are now proposing is you first doing a summary and then training on the smaller one. It sounds very nice. The thing is, of course, that when doing this, you also have to take the cost of doing that summarization into account. Right. Okay, so how are we going to summarize? Well, basically, the goal is to reduce the size of the graph. That's right? so what you're going to do is you're going to partition the nodes that are equivalent on what you call summarization relations. What does this mean? We're going to basically assign each of the nodes in the graph to a specific uh, part of the partition and going to represent it with one large node in the summary. Uh, there are three major aspects right, to the summarization. So we are going to need, we are going to look at graph size, the summary size and the heterogeneity of the graph. And of course, we are also interested in the quality of that summarization. So concrete, we have, we have two methods. So one is attribute summary. Um, basically what it means is that when you are looking at one of these, uh, on the edge, let's say we look at v, V1 and V2, um, they both have a title attribute. And so we're going to summarize these two nodes into the same summary node uh, S2 in this case. The same with V3 and V4, they go into, into S1, and V5 is going to go into S3. So basically you just look at the attribute set of the node, and then you're going to uh, use that to create a, a summary node or the partition. And so you get a smaller graph. Another one is, is uh, forward or K forward by simulation. Um, 
it's more towards creating more precise graph summaries so that you can basically um let me summarize it by saying that you can perform the same kind of random walks in the summarized graph compared to the original. And what we are doing there is basically like if you have here, uh, let's say node V1 and V96 here, going to be summarized into S1. And um, the point here is that uh, um, whenever you look at a node in the original graph and you look at the node in the summarized graph, you can basically take the same paths going outwards from this node, right? So for example, for V1, you can follow T1, T2. Uh, and for S1, you can also follow T1, T2. So you have basically the same uh, walks which are preserved. Okay, so now we have, well, we have our original graph, we have our summarized graph. Now we want to train with that summarized graph. And what we need to for this training is we need to have some, um, basically we need to have labels, right? So we are going to do a node type prediction. And for node type prediction, you're basically trying to predict the type of, uh, of the node. And so for the summarized graph, we need to train somehow in a similar way. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the labels of the original node and modify them such that we can use them as labels for the summary nodes. So on the original nodes, uh, we actually work in a multi-class uh, setting, so we have multiple types. So you see on the right-hand side what the original node labels look like. So we have just a one-hot encoding. So V3, for example, has here two labels. What we're going to do for the summary nodes is that we're going to take the types of the original node corresponding to that to that summary node, and we are going to basically average these labels. So, concrete, if we have an, a summary node S one in our summarized graph, and V one and V two in the original graph, we're going to look at the types of V one and V two, and we're going to to basically average these two uh, these two labels. So this way, we get labels for the summary node, and then we can uh, perform a train. So the experiments exactly look like this, right? So we have the original graph. We summarize it, we create our model, then we train our model as well, right? So we train that summary, and then we evaluate back on the original graph after uh, transferring. Uh, then we also experiment with continuing training that original one to see um, whether that can further. What do we find? So basically, wait. Seems like my internet was cut for a second. Let's see. Okay, so I, I just said that we had this um, this summarized model. We transfer back and then uh, we evaluate on the original, and then we can continue training uh, the original graph. And so, what do we see? Well, basically, there are two important parts. One is the very beginning of this graph. So we are interested in the red and the green um, lines there. And so what we see is basically that after we have transferred back from the uh, summary to the original, that's basically what you see here in the red at uh, point zero, uh, we are going to get that's like 0 0.8 uh, performance basically out. Now, this is actually pretty high. Um, for the normal network, you would after just, it's actually just one epoch basically at that point, uh, you would get a performance of 0 0.6. The other thing, so that means basically that uh, uh, the transferring works. That's the main thing this, this basically shows. The other thing which we see is that even when we can continue training the original network, so the green one is basically the original uh, model in the full network, um, it just doesn't, after 50 epochs in this case, does not catch up to the performance of the transferred model. And this is quite consistent in our experiments. Basically, we see first that um, we get a better performance at the start after the transfer. And then the other, net, the other thing is that we see is that basically the uh, original network does not catch up to the performance or only catches up after a, a very long time. So a couple of conclusions, right? So the first thing, the main thing which we wanted to investigate is that uh, training on summaries is possible, right? So that, that's our main, main conclusion, I would say. So we can train on summaries and then transfer. Um, we saw this jumpstart learning, right? So what I mean by the jumpstart learning is basically this gap the gap which we see here between the green and the red line, we immediately get perf better performance at the start. Um, and now finally, the performance at convergence point is the same and it's sometimes better. Now there are several things which we want to still work on looking forward, right? So there's a lot of summarization techniques out there. Um, we want to experiment with more of them. Uh, we can also do multiple at the same time. So we now just use one, we can do multiple. Um, then there is how to incorporate node and edge attributes. Uh, we also work on a lot on hyperrelational graphs in this context. Dynamic updates on graphs, uh, how to support query answering with this kind of summarized graphs. 
Um, then in the morning, we saw this interesting idea of uh, accounting for the number of edges from the original graphs, it's actually similar to this uh, KP core models, which were discussed in the morning. And then, um, of course, now we just evaluate an RGCNs, but there's nothing stopping us for using any kind of other graph neural network models. So yes, that's what I wanted to convey. Thanks a lot. So very interesting work, and just thanks very much, um, um, Michael. So any questions? I think we have time for one question, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yes, please go ahead, Ahmed. Uh, I just want, uh, uh, Michael, uh, thank you for, uh, for the talk. Uh, why do you think uh, the uh, these transfer, I mean, trans transfer learning improves the performance uh, even, even eventually? Uh, I mean, you physically getting from the same graph, it's not like you're transferring from a different similar graph or from different domain, and uh, the, the graph is smaller version of the original graph, right? Yes, so that's correct. With this, setting, with this setting, usually it's it's surprising for me that you get actually improved uh, performance a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have an explanation for that? Um, I, I have a, I, I don't have an explanation, but I have a, um, I, I can give an um, informed guess, let's say, because we are not 100% sure why it happens yet. Um, uh, the, the thing is that what we have with the smaller graph is that we basically throw away information. Right, we sort of filter out noise in a way. Um, and what this means is that our model is actually, like the, the summarized model is actually pretty well able to, um, to generalize, right? So it generalizes better to the data. So if you have some spurious links in your data, they will basically not be taken into the, um, into the summarized model or they will be taken on, on to a very small extent. And so uh, this way, the, that, it, that is what we think is the reason why this happens. And also then we transfer back to the original graph um, we, we think that you have less chance of getting stuck in local optima because you basically have already found a better global one. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it's, specu it's speculation. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a good uh, explanation because I was thinking the same. You didn't introduce new information. You rather highlighted the signal from the original graph. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's what we suspect indeed. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Michael. Yes, thank you for your question. Thank you, Michael, again, for your wonderful uh, presentation. So very interesting. And uh, let's move on to the next presentation, which will be the last one for this session, I think. It's about JGCL, I think. So yes. Hello. Hello, everyone. I can hear you. Over uh, to you. Great. Uh, okay, I'll share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, that's great. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Salat Nakas from Indiana University Bloomington. It is a joint work with Ariful Azad. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. I will first give some background information and talk about our motivation. Then I will introduce our proposed methods, explain our results, and finally conclusion and future work. First, I want to give some background information and uh, explain graph representation learning. Graph representation learning aims to learn low dimensional node embeddings using both node features and graph structure. Then we can train a linear classifier on top of representations to get classification results. And uh, there are four main representation learning approaches for graph representation learning, which I will introduce uh, them in the following slides. First, uh, the first approach is unsupervised learning. We can use methods like deep walk and not to wake. In this setting, uh, we can use all nodes to learn the representations and uh, we don't need any label information for unsupervised methods. Moreover, these approaches don't use node features. The second approach is semi-supervised learning. We can learn representations using supervised learning, but uh, 
We also aggregate messages from test nodes. Therefore, uh, this approach is uh, considered as semi-supervised learning. Also, we can use uh, graph neural networks like uh, GCN and GIN for this setting, and semi-supervised approaches use labels of training data nodes. Another category is uh, another approach is uh, self-supervised learning, SSL. It learns representations by contrasting augmented pairs using a similarity function and contrastive loss. To learn the, uh, in this example, to learn the uh, representation of this red node, we first generate two views by augmented graph, then we get their embedding and uh, we compute pairwise similarity. And in this example, we have one positive pair and two and minus two negative uh, pairs. And, uh, while representations of augmented nodes uh, from uh, same source become similar, others become dissimilar. Also, uh, in SSL representation learning, sorry, uh, we can use uh, two different augmentation approach. Actually, there are more, but I will mention just two. Using random uniform, uh, we can just drop edges or features uh, randomly as in grace, or we can consider degrees, not degrees, and uh, drop edges based on no degrees. Uh, the last approach is uh, supervised contrastive learning. It is like uh, self-supervised learning, but uh, and uh, we learn representations by uh, contrasting augmented pairs, but uh, we consider pairs from same class as positive pairs. Uh, in this approach, uh, we only use uh, training labels, and the goal is to have similar embeddings uh, for nodes from the same class. In our example, we have uh, three blue nodes here, which are which belong to same class, and uh, we generate two views. And now we have uh, six nodes from the same class, so uh, we get their embeddings and apply. Uh, Supervised contrastive loss. In this setting, we have uh, for a blue node, we have five positive pairs and uh, two and minus two uh, negative pairs. As motivation, uh, we have an example. Uh, the figure shows uh, node classification uh, test accuracies for Amazon computer data sets for uh, various training data radio. Uh, firstly, uh, Semi-supervised learning, uh, the dashed line here, uh, performance not good for limited data. And uh, for this uh, training ratio, 0.5%, uh, self-supervised learning uh, performance is better. But for uh, SSL, uh, it is good for limited data and we don't need to use label information. On the other hand, uh, it is not very good when we have uh, enough data. It is uh, worse than self, uh, sorry, uh, semi-supervised learning. Also the last uh, category is uh, supervised contrastive. We use labels, but uh, when we have really limited data, it is performance is uh, really bad. So, uh, we can say that there is no method good for all settings, and this motivates us to combine SSL and supervised contrastive learning to obtain better results. As proposed methods, we propose GGCL, joint self-supervised and supervised graph contrastive learning. We first generate uh, four views, two for self-supervised learning and two for supervised contrastive learning. And we also propose a new augmentation technique, label augmentation. It controls the edge drop probability between labeled nodes in uh, supervised contrastive learning. We can drop more edges or fewer edges between labeled nodes. And then we apply, uh, we merge their losses with a weight. 
We propose uh, another approach supervised contrastive mixed. It is uh, in supervised contrastive learning. Uh, we only we can only use uh, training data labels, while SSL can use all nodes. Our proposed approach uses uh, supervised contrastive loss, but uh, uses training data nodes as subcon and test data as SSL. And, and test data nodes are used as uh, single instance classes in this setting. So there will be one positive pair and two and minus two negative pairs. So we use uh, training data labels as is, as can be seen in the example. And these are the training masks. So these are training labels. And for the rest, we assign a unique uh, labels in supervised contrastive learning uh, setup. These nodes uh, will be considered as single instance classes, but uh, one limitation is uh, we will have some false negative pairs uh, in this example, we have uh, two nodes belong to the same class, class four, but we assign a unique ID for the one of the test nodes. So this will be considered as negative pair. As data sets, we, we use five node uh, classification data sets to uh, co-purchase uh, networks, Amazon computers and Amazon photo, and three citation networks. Data set summaries are provided in the table. An experimental setup, we use two layer GCN as encoder. We use 10% of the data for training, 10% for validation, and 80% for testing. We use uh, the same hyperparameters with uh, previous methods, uh, GRACE and GCA. These are self supervised methods. And we also introduce uh, three new hyperparameters, one is SSL ratio, it gives uh, 0 0.3 for SSL and 0 0.7 for uh, supervised contrastive loss. And we experiment 0 0.3, 0 0.5 and 0 0.7. And we also introduce uh, label-based augmentation for that. We have multipliers 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5 and 2. So these parameters control uh, edge drop probabilities between labeled nodes. And we select the best hyperparameters for each data set. And we repeat experiments 10 times. As baselines, uh, we use uh, raw features, not to x deep bulk, and deep bulk plus features uh, as unsupervised methods. And for semi-supervised, we use two-layer GCN. And for self-supervised learning, we use grace and GCA degree-based implementation. And for supervised contrast, we use subcon. As preliminary results, our joint approaches uh, give the best classification accuracies for uh, four data sets out of five. And for DBLP, GCA degree gives the best result, this one. And uh, for uh, GGCL, we have uh, two different implementation. One is uh, without label augmentation and one is with label augmentation. Uh, with label augmentation, it gives better results than uh, without label augmentation counterparts for uh, all the data sets. So we can say that label augmentation is helpful. And as conclusion, uh, we can say that uh, no graph representation learning approach gives uh, the best results for all settings. And we introduced a new method, GGCL, which combines SSL and subcon. And uh, our joint approaches give uh, better classification accuracy on uh, four data sets out of five. And as future work, we plan to improve label augmentation, which will lead to better results. And we also aim to develop a new method that automatically adjusts uh, the SSR ratio in joint learning. And I would like to thank you for listening. So hello, everyone. My name is uh, Renaud Lambiot. I, I, I'm going to be chairing this session. Uh, so it's the afternoon session for the people in Europe. So, so we have the pleasure to have our first invited speaker, who is Michael Brownstein, who is a, a colleague of mine from computer science in, in Oxford. 
and also working for Twitter. And he's going to be talking about graph neural networks, geometric, geometric flows, sorry, and neural diffusion. So the, the whole talk, including question, would be for 40 minutes, and the whole floor is yours. Thank you very much. So pleasure to be here virtually. So I will talk about uh, some of our recent works uh, that try to connect uh, graph neural networks to, to differential equations and uh, geometric flows. And uh, let me start maybe a little bit from uh, far away. Uh, so I would like to quote uh, uh, these uh, two quotes. So one is from Herman Weil, who said that symmetry as wide or as narrow as you may define its meaning is one idea by which man through the ages has tried to comprehend and create order, beauty and perfection. And the second one is from Philip Anderson that it's only slightly overstating to say that physics is the study of symmetry. So I hope this highlights the importance of symmetry in uh, mathematics and physics and in uh, other areas of science. And uh, so it has been also in uh, geometry where the, the, uh, uh, the Erlangen program of Felix Klein that was introduced about 150 years ago brought a unification of different types of geometry that existed at that time and also was uh, culturally uh, very influential in mathematics and other fields and uh, spilled into physics, into uh, category theory, into algebraic topology and so on. So in machine learning, uh, the use of uh, group theory and the use of symmetry and invariance to study neural networks uh, probably dates back to at least the, the, the famous, or if you call it infamous, book uh, Perceptrons by Minsky and Peverett uh, from the 60s that used uh, group theoretical constructions to study the deficiencies of perceptrons. But I think it's fair to say that, that the, uh, the power of group theory as an organizing principle for machine learning has not been recognized until recently. And that's what we are trying to address in, uh, uh, in um, uh, uh, our blueprint that we call the geometric deep learning, which uh, tries to approach uh, to, to use a group theory and uh, the, the notions of symmetry and invariance as foundations for deriving uh, deep learning uh, architectures. So the, the, the idea of uh, geometric deep learning blueprint is that you have a domain on which your data lives, uh, on which you can define a symmetry group, and then this uh, group through a representation acts on the data that is defined on this domain. Uh, and in turn, you have some functions uh, that incorporate this symmetry. Uh, that act on this uh, data on the domain. So probably the most uh, prominent occurrence of this principle are convolutional neural networks. So in this case, the domain is a plane with the translation group. The signals are images on which the translation acts through the shift operator. And then uh, um, convolutions are linear um, shift equivariant operators that are defined on images. Another instance that we'll be discussing today are graph neural networks, where the underlying symmetry structure is the permutation group and the functions that implement it uh, are, uh, have the form of message passing. And more recently, there are also architectures that implement some symmetry of the data in the form of equivariant message passing that also incorporates uh, um, continuous symmetries of data, such as uh, in molecular graphs, for example, with respect to rotations and translations of the, of the nodes. So these ideas uh, can be applied to different uh, problems in different types of domains, such as grids, meshes, and graphs. And one thing that, that strikes here is that you can think of a grid, for example, as a discretization of the plane or of a mesh as a discretization of a manifold, but uh, it is not very clear what is the continuous analogy for a graph. And uh, if you consider graphs and you compare them, let's say, to meshes and grids, then graphs have the least structure, right? So in, on a grid, for example, if you look at the, the nodes, the neighbors of a node, then they have very fixed canonical order. In a mesh, the only ambiguity is that uh, which point, uh, which node to start from, right? And then you can order all the rest, for example, in clockwise orientation, because locally you have a manifold structure. On graphs, on the other hand, you have completely arbitrary permutation of the nodes. So uh, that's why it would be beneficial if we could somehow leverage uh, the continuous structure in order to define, for example, something analogous to an isotropic diffusion on graphs. Now, the way that, that uh, graph neural networks work is indeed because of this uh, lack of canonical order of the neighbors, they resort to permutation invariant aggregation. So you look at the features of all your uh, neighbor nodes, you apply to them uh, a permutation invariant function that I denote here by phi. And uh, if this function is chosen to be uh, injective, then uh, this uh, message passing is equivalent to a classical result from graph theory known as the vice-fry-lemon graph isomorphism test. 
that essentially uh, is an iterative uh, color refinement procedure that looks at the structure of the neighborhood of every node and uh, applies an injective function to refine these colors until uh, the colors stop changing at which point it outputs a distribution of colors or some form of graph descriptor and if two graphs have different uh, color distributions then you can say that the graphs are non-isomorphic the structure is different but if the colors are the same we actually don't know so in other words it's a necessary but insufficient condition you can find examples of non-isomorphic graphs that would be deemed equivalent by this procedure and the reason is because essentially you're trying to understand the structure of the graph by walking on the graph and uh, these walks in a sense uh, might produce the same result even though they arise from different structures so uh, a typical uh, way of uh, going around this problem is what is called positional encoding. So you uh, attach some extra features, extra information to the nodes of the, uh, of the graph that uh, allow to, in some cases, to, to disambiguate these uh, regular structures that, uh, that confuse device for element algorithm. And uh, there are many ways of doing this positional encoding. For example, you can even use random features or use the eigenvectors of the graph for plus n or maybe count substructures that device for element algorithm cannot detect. Uh, the problem is that there is no really canonical positional encoding. So different applications call for different uh, uh, approaches. So we'd like to understand what is uh, the right way or a right way to do it. And the last problem I would like to bring up in relation to graph neural networks is this phenomenon of over squashing, which is not unique to graph neural networks, but it's probably the most acute there. And what happens is that if you have a problem in which you need to bring information from distant nodes, and you also have the graph uh, with a structure where there are too many such nodes, then you have uh, uh, the problem of overscoring where you need to squeeze a lot of features from distant nodes into a single uh, feature vector of a node. And uh, uh, basically, the, the fact stem, uh, the, this problem stems from the fact that the graph has dual function in graph neural networks. It's both part of the input as well as a computational device. So the traditional approach was uh, to use the input graph for propagation of information, but because some of these graphs may be unfriendly, so the, the standard uh, technique now is to use what is called the graph rewiring. So you, you decouple the two graphs and you can, it can take the form of uh, neighborhood sampling or maybe using uh, multi-hope filters or uh, maybe a learnable graph. So uh, again, there is no canonical graph rewiring that, that, that can be adopted. So what I, I'm proposing in this talk, and uh, it's good to have the following mental picture, is think of a physical system. And the, the figure here is from a recent paper in Nature that showed that you can uh, incorporate real world physical systems, whether optical or electronic or mechanical, into deep learning pipelines and backpropagate through them. So here we're talking about some uh, physical system or a process uh, which is simulated and it is used as a metaphor for learning on graphs. And uh, if you think of the most probably natural uh, process that, that comes to your mind when you, you think of propagation of information on graph, this is uh, graph diffusion, right? So we're talking about the diffusion process, which probably historically is also one of the first, the earliest processes that was studied rigorously in a mathematical way. The work of uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton himself, published anonymously in uh, 1701 in the Transactions of the Royal Society, where he described an experiment and its mathematical analysis known today as the Newton Law of Cooling, stating that the temperature that a hot body loses in a given time is proportional to the difference in the temperature between the object and the environment. So uh, this was a global law, and it was it took another hundred years and the contribution of Fourier in his classical work, the, the analytical theory of heat, where he uh, also introduced the Fourier series, uh, basically describing the local rule that, that relates to heat flux resulting from thermal conduction, uh, being proportional to the magnitude of the temperature gradient and opposite to it inside. At that point, calculus already existed, so he could write this in the form of uh, differential uh, quantities. And the final uh, piece of information is uh, a certain way of uh, conservation law that tells that temperature change in time equals to the heat flux through the volume that is described using the divergence. So pieced together, this is what uh, how it looks like. So we have some domain on which we have some quantity, let's say temperature. The difference or the gradient of this quantity creates the, the flux. Uh, and the conservation condition means that the, the change in the temperature, so the temporal derivative, 
uh, is given only by the divergence of this flux. So together it gives the classical heat equation that you probably have seen in the classical standard textbooks on uh, partial differential equations. So the main differences in how different these differential equations look like come from the assumptions about the structure of the domain. So if the domain conducts heat uh, uh, in the same way at every point, we are talking about isotropic homogeneous diffusion that can be also interpreted as the gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy. Or in the Euclidean case, we can also give a closed form solution to the heat equation as convolution with the Gaussian filter. The more interesting uh, uh, flavors of the diffusion equation when we have a position or direction dependent diffusivity function, what is called non-homogeneous or anisotropic diffusion. And this kind of diffusion equations attracted a lot of attention in image processing 30 years ago, starting from the seminal work of Perona and Malik, which uh, consider problems such as denoising, where you try to average out the noise in an image. But of course, if you just convolve the image with a Gaussian filter, maybe you will average out the noise, but you also destroy the, the edges or the discontinuities in the image that are very important from the standpoint of visual perception. So the idea was to run a, a, a nonlinear diffusion where the diffusivity function is inversely proportional to the norm of uh, the gradient of the image. And basically what it, what it allows to do is to run a diffusion that doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't diffuse across discontinuities uh, in the image. And uh, uh, if you can see the effect of this uh, here, so this is the, the face of Sir Isaac diffused uh, with standard homogeneous diffusion in the middle, and on the right you see the result of non-homogeneous diffusion. So it both removes the noise but preserves uh, the important structures in the image. And this has been for over 20 years uh, one of the predominant approaches in image processing, uh, so-called variation or PD-based image processing methods. And it was a very elegant and appealing idea that you start with some functional that tells you how ideally your uh, image should look like. Then from the earlier Grange optimality conditions, you derive a gradient flow, a PDE, that uh, evolves your image towards the optimal one. And why these methods have been displaced by deep learning? Uh, exactly because of the same reason why uh, similar constructions in uh, uh, computer vision have been displaced. It's very difficult to handcraft some functional that would be universally good across all different types of data. So what we are trying to do is essentially to revisit uh, many of these uh, ideas uh, in the context of deep learning and apply them to the graphs. And the graphs, of course, they have similar constructions, so you can define the gradient and the divergence uh, uh, on the graph, right? So basically as the difference between the, the endpoints of, uh, of an edge or the sum of the features uh, in edges that share a node. You can define the Laplacian operator, right? And uh, these are well-known standard uh, constructions that I will not go into details. So we can write a formally equivalent form of the, the uh, diffusion equation on the graph, where we have the gradient, the diffusivity function that we assume to be normalized, and the divergence. So the time here is continuous. The, 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 the domain is discrete. And it is nonlinear because the diffusivity function is nonlinear. So we need to solve it numerically. Uh, the easiest uh, of the approaches would be to use an explicit or for forward boiler scheme where we just discretize the time at fixed time steps uh, denoted by tau and replace the temporal derivative with forward difference. And this gives us an iteration formula that looks like this. So we have uh, a matrix valued function that uh, allows us to update, to obtain the next iterate as a linear uh, combination of the previous iterate where the, the combination coefficients themselves depend non-linearly on, uh, on, the, on the current iterate. And uh, the structure of this matrix is sparse, so it has the structure of the graph adjacency matrix, and you can show that uh, this scheme is stable for sufficiently small step size. So these are classical results from uh, numerical analysis theory. What is interesting to see is that uh, the graph attention type of architectures can be obtained as a particular discretization of this diffusion equation. And of course, we don't need to stop here. So here is an example of a semi-implicit scheme where we use the backward derivative and it's called implicit because now the, in order to get the next iteration, we need to solve a linear system of equations, which now is uh, uh, not anymore uh, sparse. So the, uh, basically this would correspond to a multi-hop filter. I need to bring information from multiple nodes uh, in the graph. And the advantage of uh, these schemes is that they're unconditionally stable. So we can use bigger step sizes. 
And uh, as you probably know, numerical analysis literature is full of different schemes, such as multi-step adaptive step size, explicit uh, or semi-explicit uh, implicit schemes, uh, runge kutta methods, and so on. And basically, this is in the light of our metaphor of a physical system, we can think of learning on the graph in the following way, that we start with some initial features. We have some downstream task, let's say node classification. So we solve the graph diffusion equation, uh, diffusing the initial features, and then we read out the output, right? The state of the system at certain time that can also be learnable. And the diffu diffusion equation is such that the diffusivity function is parametric. So the diffusivity function, as you've seen before, is uh, plays the role of attention in, in traditional architectures. And we tune the norms, we tune the parameters of this diffusivity function such that the, the, the output satisfies the, the, the whatever task we are solving in the best way. And this, uh, uh, this viewpoint allows us to, to uh, reimagine or uh, 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 basically repurpose existing architectures in this new framework. So we can, we can formalize uh, many existing architectures as certain discretizations of, the, of this graph diffusion equation. We also have multiple uh, efficient solvers that exist in the literature that do not have immediate analogies yet in the graph uh, neural network literature. So it means that uh, certain future architectural choices can be uh, driven by, uh, 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 by, uh, by the, these uh, efficient schemes. We also have theoretical guarantees such as stability and convergence, and uh, there are deeper links uh, that are less known maybe in general literature, such as to differential geometry and algebraic topology. So having said all this, uh, this is still uh, unsatisfactory because we wanted to uh, have a continuous uh, model for the graphs. And if we uh, look again at the diffusion in the plane, for example, right, which we discretize as a grid, and we look at the differential operations such as the Laplacian, there are many ways we, we can discretize it on a grid. So here are three different discretizations of the Laplacian. Or because it's a linear uh, operator, any convex combination will also be a legitimate discretization of the Laplacian. So we want something like this for our graphs. So we want to forget about the graph as having a kind of sacrosanct role in graph neural networks. We want to think of them as a, a convenient discretization of something continuous. And here what comes useful is again a different viewpoint uh, that was introduced in the image processing literature, actually by my PhD advisor, Ron Kimmel. And uh, instead of a nonlinear diffusion equation that, that uh, was considered in the Perona and Malik and follow up uh, papers, the idea is to consider a non Euclidean diffusion equation. So, in other words, we are thinking of our image uh, as a manifold that is embedded in the joint space that has both positional and feature coordinates. So uh, a color image would be uh, a two-dimensional surface or a manifold in five-dimensional space, where we have the positional coordinates x, y locations of the pixels, and the feature coordinates are R, G, and B channels of uh, the image. So using the standard pullback mechanism in differential geometry, we can define a Riemannian metric on this manifold, and uh, with respect to this metric, define a generalization of the Laplacian operator called the laplace beltrami operator, so the, this diffusion equation called the Beltrami flow appears to be the gradient flow of a generalization of the, of the Dirichlet energy that is called in physics the Polyakov functional. So in differential geometric terms, it's the harmonic energy of the, of the embedding of the manifold. And uh, we can think of a similar construction on a graph that we call the graph Beltrami flow. So now every node in the graph has uh, both positional coordinates and feature coordinates that are denoted by u and x. And we apply the uh, diffusion equation to both of them. And the evolution of the X component uh, is the standard feature diffusion that we've seen before. But the evolution of the positional component, we can regard it as graph rewiring. So if you think of a graph embedded in some continuous space, and we know, of course, that this embedding is not uh, exact. So usually we cannot embed iso uh, isometrically a graph into a continuous space. Basically, what will happen here is that if two nodes, if their positional coordinates come closer in this continuous space, we can decide to create a new edge between them. So in other words, we update the graph to facilitate the propagation of information that is, I remind you, would be the optimal for a given downstream task, because uh, the parameters of this diffusivity function will be minimized uh, based on the, on the learning task by backpropagation. And uh, maybe it's a little bit cumbersome description, so uh, let me show you this video that explains it, I think, way better. So here we have the core data set, and uh, the color represents some low-dimensional projection of the features of the nodes. 
the positions of the circles represent uh, some, again, low dimensional positional encoding. And here the graph is changing uh, uh, at the same time. So we are diffusing both the feature and the positional coordinates and rewiring the graph as we do this process. And here the, the task is the classical Cora task of node classification. So uh, basically we see this uh, nice uh, clustering that is happening and separates between the, between the different classes of nodes on the graph. Now this picture of uh, filtering on a domain that is moving uh, uh, under our feet is a little bit disturbing in uh, maybe in image processing or uh, in machine learning, but it's actually very common in differential geometry where it's, uh, it is completely normal to apply uh, some PDE or a geometric flow and evolution equation to the domain itself, or specifically to the Riemannian metric of a manifold. And among these evolution equations, probably the most famous one are uh, what is called Ricci flows, uh, which structurally have uh, resemblance to the diffusion equation. So here the temporal derivative is with respect to the Riemannian metric. And the right hand side is the Ricci curvature tensor, which is also second order quantity, a little bit akin to the Laplacian. And what happens to a manifold that looks like this dumbbell under the Ricci flow that, that runs backwards is that the manifold becomes more like a sphere and then collapses into a point. And uh, Ricci flow was actually introduced by Richard Hamilton as a, a way of uh, characterizing topological spheres because on the two-dimensional sphere, you can uh, say that something is a sphere by taking a closed curve and uh, being able always to collapse it into a point. So this is not something that you can do on the torus, for example, if you have a, a closed curve that goes across the donut. And uh, this was a challenge for more than 100 years uh, to, to repeat this construction in three dimensions. That is the famous Poincaré conjecture that was proven successfully using exactly this mechanism of Ricci flows by uh, Grigory Perlman about 15 years ago. So what does it have to do with graphs? Basically, what we try to do is to describe the oversquashing problem, which I already mentioned, the failure of message passing to efficiently propagate information uh, due to uh, some, uh, some uh, structural characteristics of the graph that are called bottlenecks. So we'll define uh, formally what oversquashing is, uh, attribute it to uh, geometric properties of the graph, the measured through curvature, and then use something similar to Ricci flow to rewire the graph in a way that, that facilitates the flow of information. So let me start with the first thing. So what is oversquashing? Essentially what it is, is some form of insensitivity. So if you have a multi-layer message passing type graph neural network, uh, let's say with uh, Lipschitz continuous um, uh, uh, activation functions, what basically what I can say is the following thing. I have the output of multiple layers of this network at node i, and I want to see how it depends on the input features in uh, node s that is remote uh, and connected by a few hops by uh, to this uh, uh, to this node. So I can uh, I can express it by the uh, by the absolute value of this Jacobian of this derivative of x i with respect to x s, and we can show that it's bounded by well the Lipschitz constants uh, of the uh, uh, activation functions, but also by something that is related to the graph structure, right? So this is the the R plus one power of the uh, normalized. Uh, uh, adjusted C matrix. So there is somehow the, the, the structure of the graph here, but it's not clear uh, how, it, uh, uh, how exactly it influences the, the, this oversquashing. And we intuitively understand that something that looks like a grid will probably suffer from oversquashing less than, uh, let's say, a tree, which is a pathological example where the oversquashing is especially acute. So in differential geometry, a mechanism allowing to distinguish between these kind of spaces uh, is exactly the curvature, which we can uh, define as uh, a, what is called geodesic dispersion. So if I take two nearby points and shoot geodesics from them, I can see whether they converge, remain parallel or diverge, which allows to distinguish between spaces that locally look like a sphere, a plane or a hyperboloid. So we can do something similar on the graphs. We can talk about some kind of edge dispersion. So if I take two uh, nodes connected by an edge and I shoot edges from them, if they tend to form triangles, then we uh, have something that looks like a click, so it, it is positively curved. If they remain parallel, right, in other words, they form rectangles, then we are looking at something that looks like a grid. And then if they become, uh, uh, they, they drift uh, further apart, then we are looking at tree-like structures with negative curvature. And uh, there are multiple constructions of curvature-like uh, uh, objects on graphs. Uh, so two prominent ones due to uh, uh, Forman and Olivier. So we use a, a formal-like construction that, that uh, allow me to skip the details. What essentially it does, it counts 
certain types of rectangles and triangles for every edge of the graph, so it's an edgewise quantity, and uh, our construction allows to recreate the continuous behavior. Uh, so clicks are positively curved, trees are zero curved, and trees are uh, negatively curved. And the main result of uh, our paper is that uh, if we have a graph with negative curvature, then there are many nodes for which this Jacobian that measures the over quotient is uh, small. So in other words, it is uh, the negatively curved edges that are to blame for the phenomenon of over quotient. Now, having understood it, we can do a graph rewiring that is a little bit similar to a discrete version of the Ricci flow. Basically, we cut out the, uh, uh, the negatively curved edges and we can introduce uh, new edges that, that uh, with, uh, with a bigger curvature. And by doing this, we do uh, a surgical rewiring of the graph that improves the propagation of information without changing the graph construction too much. Now, I should say that I learned uh, just a few days ago that this paper was nominated as an uh, uh, outstanding uh, honorable mention paper. And uh, we are very happy about it. And of course, what could be a better way to celebra celebrate this success with my students than a glass of champagne from the winery of uh, Ricci Corbastro, which is, by the way, the descendants of the same uh, uh, Gregorio Ricci Corbastro, who is after whom the Ricci flows and the Ricci curvature are named. So in the remaining time, I understand that I have just a few minutes. Let me show you a couple of more exotic things. And uh, one of them is recent work in collaboration with um, colleagues from Cambridge where we uh, lift the graph to cellular shapes. So it's a construction that is used in algebraic topology. And uh, this way, uh, a graph, which is a purely topological object, uh, is equipped with uh, geometry in some sense. And uh, the analogy here is to uh, parallel transport on manifolds, because manifolds, again, are also topological objects. But uh, if you, uh, you can prescribe a way how to connect two tangent spaces at different points by uh, a mechanism that is called the connection. And it is more general uh, uh, than the Riemannian metric. You can define it on the manifolds without a Riemannian metric, but a special connection called the levi chirita connection is the one that is compatible with the metric if it's given. So in this case, uh, the, the uh, cellular shift has the structure of uh, vector spaces assigned to every node of the graph and then linear maps that connect between them. So. Uh, more or less one-to-one -one analogy between this construction. And what we show is that you can define a diffusion equation on this, uh, 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 on this graph, on this cellular sheaf that uses these, uh, uh, the, the, these uh, maps, these extra structure to, to transport information from one node to another. And we can think of problems such as nose classification as uh, the limit of a sheaf diffusion equation with an appropriate sheaf. So we can ask the question, can we find a sheaf that solves a certain node classification problem. And we show that, for example, the standard uh, graph convolutional network type architectures, where we have symmetric scalar transport maps, can achieve separation in homophilic settings, but they fail in heterophilic settings. So heterophilic requires uh, asymmetric transport maps between neighbors uh, that, that belong to different classes. And this is a theoretical explanation to some of the recent works that address heterophilic setting by using negatively weighted edges. We can also, for example, relate uh, the dimension of the sheaf to the number of classes that, that uh, this diffusion can separate and also study some uh, restrictions such as orthogonal uh, maps or orthogonal message passing functions that have been studied so far empirically due to the, the uh, uh, numerical considerations. So it is interesting that, that in graph neural networks, uh, the main way of studying the expressive power is uh, resorting to the vice versa lemon uh, hierarchy. So this is an alternative way that doesn't follow the vice uh, versa hierarchy, but uses uh, the limit of the diffusion equation. So uh, I know that these are slightly exotic constructions that maybe are not so common in uh, graph neural networks and allow me to reproduce this this funny picture that that, that was apparently done by by Michael Galkin from which was a postdoc at Mila uh, that that. Uh, uh, that makes fun out of the, the, the standard techniques that are used in the graph neural network community. Uh, but I hope that, that uh, this doesn't seem too much exotic and uh, it really uh, highlights the interesting links between graph neural networks uh, and uh, differential geometry and algebraic topology and partial differential equations as uh, new and powerful tools that, that give a new perspective on some uh, standard problems in these fields and uh, allows also to take a mathematically principled take on 
some otherwise arbi uh, arbitrary choices such as positional encoding, graphy wiring, uh, the phenomenon of over smoothing and, and heterophilic settings. And uh, I think it's just the beginning. There are many uh, interesting open questions and uh, hopefully many uh, works will emerge in this direction. So at this point, I will stop and thank you very much for your attention. Well, uh, thank you very much. So, thanks a lot, uh, Michael. So uh, can you hear me? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so uh, actually, you're very much in time. So you, your talk has been like for 32 minutes, if I'm right. So we have eight minutes for questions. And so, so I remember that if, for those of you in the audience, so if you want to ask questions, the easiest would be to write them in the chat. Uh, and then I'm going to be trying to, to convey them to, to Michael uh, directly. So, but maybe, uh, can I ask, can I start with the questions? Because in, in some way, and correct me if I'm wrong, so, so, so okay, so, so, so clearly rather more, and essentially uh, would, be, would be the equivalent of the diffusion equation. So they've been used in order to explore and to analyze graph for, for many, many years, right? And in some sense, in many of the works that you've been presenting, you've been enriching uh, or compl complexifying somehow like the classical sim simple linear diffusion equation, either to a nonlinear setting or by incorporating like things that you've associated to, to geometry. Uh, so, no, something that I wondered is, so, so there have been quite a few works, especially in community detection, where people have been also generalizing random works, but by going to higher order or mark of random works, like, like for instance, not by non backtracking random works. And, and it's been shown that non backtracking random works also have very much desired properties, for instance, in the case of cluster infographs. And I was just wondering if one way or the other, these works on like high order Markov in, and more specifically non-backtracking run works could be somehow related to what you've been talking about today. Yeah, so I think uh, things are certainly uh, related. So I think the main difference here, or at least uh, from the formal perspective is that in random works, uh, the, the time step is discrete. So you take yeah. some, some, uh, some integer powers of some transition matrix. In this case, the time is continuous. So, and uh, uh, similarly to what has been done in neural ODs and well, semantically, it's probably more a semantic question. What we are dealing here with is a system of coupled ODs, right? Because uh, the, the graph after you discretize your domain, essentially PD becomes a system of coupled, uh, coupled ODs. Um, uh, so the time here is continuous. And you can uh, basically, the, the time replaces the layers of uh, a neural network. So you can decide for how much time you, can, you want to diffuse, right? So the, how long uh, uh, each iteration is, uh, uh, depending on uh, how your problem and your data, your graph and your solution looks like. Uh, so I think this, uh, this uh, extra level of flexibility is not immediate, at least to me, how to use it in, in random walks. But uh, indeed, random walks are a form of diffusion. So it's, uh, the, the concepts are very much related. Yeah, because uh, and if, if you if you don't mind, because it seems like I, I'm the one asking questions and I'm the chair. So, uh, but uh, because, because it, I, I agree that the, the, the classical sense of random walk would be the discrete time ones. But actually, you can for every discrete time random walk, you can translate it. Or you can you, you can define a continuous time random walk where essentially what's happening is that the times at which the jumps take place are a random variable instead of being the same variable all the time. And, and then basically, in that case, you can have the Laplacian that appears, uh, well, different forms of Laplacian depending on the statistics of the timings at which the events take place. But uh, so it means that in principle, it, it, it would be possible to have like a, a non bad tracking random work in discrete time. I don't know if people investigated it, but it would, it would in principle be something possible. Yeah. No, so it's, uh, I agree. So uh, again, I think uh, the, 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 the connection is, uh, is very much, uh, is, very, is very strong there. Uh, probably the fact that we consider nonlinear diffusion equations, whereas uh, random walks, well, they, they, usually the transition matrix is uh, data independent. It depends only on the structure of the graph is, uh, is another difference. Yeah, but, 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 but overall the concepts are very much similar. Okay. No. Uh, well, um, I'm going to read read a bit more about it uh, before uh, before I ask you a question, uh, but, but not today because actually there are like there are two questions from from the chat. So the first one is from Michael Koshes Kosh Koshe, uh, who writes. So you you mentioned that you rewire the graph by removing edges with negative curvature, 
but does, does that not change the curvature for all other edges in the graph? So is it possible to find the optimal set of edges to remove? Yeah, it's a good question. So, so first of all, yes, it does change uh, the curvature of other edges of the graph, but uh, locally only. So it will affect uh, only the, the well, uh, some, some of the edges in the, in the, in the proximity of the edge that, that you remove. Uh, and uh, well, I'm not claiming that, that what we did, so this, uh, this discrete uh, Ricci-like procedure is uh, the right one. So it's just, uh, I think the, 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 the main importance of the result is relating over scorching to, to, to the curvature of the graph rather than a specific rewiring uh, method. Uh, there are probably many other ways of doing it. I, if, I personally don't like the discrete uh, structure of it. I think uh, we can do it continuously by uh, basically by uh, rather than removing edges, reweighting edges. And uh, as usual, uh, removing is easy, adding is hard. So uh, uh, if you want to add edges, it means that you need to consider some some uh, uh, some latent connectivity that doesn't uh, exist in the graph. So you need to invent edges. And uh, then it makes the neural network look more and more like a transformer, which of course has uh, comes with uh, computational disadvantages. Okay, yeah, thanks. And so maybe we would have, a, have a, a last question. So from Khaled Rahman. So considering the difficulty of heterophilic networks, should we separate benchmarking for both heterophilic and homophilic networks for a proposed method? The performance can vary based on the network's types. As an expert, what is your suggestion on this? Yeah, I certainly think that, that uh, well, maybe uh, at least the initial benchmarks that were used in the graph learning literature, such as SCORA or sites here. So they, we know that all these uh, uh, data sets are homophilic, or at least they have high degree of homophily. And in a sense, they are too easy and maybe too optimistic and uh, 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 people are too excited about uh, using maybe certain architectures that, that um, work well in these, uh, in these cases, but uh, do not work necessarily well in other settings. So I think it's uh, far from being uh, answered. What actually makes a work a graph neural networks work and fail in which situations? So there is some evidence that even simple models uh, can be made uh, uh, work uh, also on heterophilic uh, set, uh, on heterophilic data sets. But uh, the, the main question is basically what is the value of the graph, right? So uh, heterophilic means that the structure of the graph is uh, incompatible with the structure of the data, and uh, if you can better align them or if you can uh, basically you can make the graph useful and there are many ways of doing it right it's so one of them is for example the, the seller shift theory allows you to to use your neighbors uh, in a different way basically to, to, to learn some rule that, that tells you that that for example if your neighbor is different you can still uh, transform it in such a way that it will be useful uh, um, so uh, yeah uh, so to answer to, to answer the, the question I, I think uh, we should probably do more careful uh, benchmarking and evaluations uh, in these settings and maybe even for different applications. And there are many applications where heterophilic data is encountered. Okay, well, uh, wonderful. So, so thanks a lot, uh, Michael. So I think that we are running out of time. So it's just like uh, 12.50 here in the UK. So, uh, so I wanted to thank you again for accepting the invitation to, to talk in, the, in this workshop. And yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, and, and now we're going to be moving to, to the next uh, talks. So we have like a technical session that starts just now, where we, we're going to be having six talks of 15 minutes each. And I don't know, so the first one is by Fuling Huang and his collaborators. I don't know, are you here in person or? Did you upload the video for your talk? Uh, it will, I think it will be in person because we don't have any video records for the, from the authors. Okay, thank you very much for letting me know. So, are, is any of the author of the first uh, of the first talk presence. Uh, yes, is, is it Markov Zienen paper? Uh, if I'm correct, that would be unsupervised super pixel driven parcel segmentation of remote sensing images using graph, convol graph convolutional networks. 
Okay. And that would be with fooling. So I think that uh, Hagawal is the second one. Uh, on the website, the mark of this GNN is first. So, excuse me? Uh, on the website, the mark of GNN is first, but I don't know whether there oh. is a difference. Oh, maybe, oh, sorry, maybe I don't have the right, oh, then that would be my fault. So it, I, then I presume that the, the website one is the, the right one. So, uh, so let me see. So, Damn it, I'm just having some issue. Uh, yeah, Markov can graph neural networks on Markov diffusion. This will be like the first uh, presentation for the session. Okay, uh, and are the authors present? And could you possibly send me back the link to the, to, to, to the latest program, please? Sure, 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 I'll say. Thank you so much. Okay, so it means, uh, but nonetheless, we are looking for the for, for the speakers. Um, so if we don't, I think Paulette Rahman, yes, participant. I'm, I'm no, one of the authors. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes. Okay, great. So are you, are you uh, a speaker for the first for the first talk? Uh, yes, I'm the speaker for the Markov Zillian paper. Okay, well then uh, then so so basically you have like 15 minutes. So apologies, I I I didn't have the the latest version of the program, it seems. So, uh, so okay, so wonderful. So, so well, mark of GNN, graph neural networks, and mark of diffusion. Well, the whole the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Um, can you see my slides? Uh, yep. Okay, hi everyone. Um, this is uh, I'm Bikal Rahman. I'm a uh, PhD candidate in the CIS department in Bloomington, Indiana University, Bloomington. Um, this is a joint work uh, with Avika Agarwal and Professor Aripul Azad. Um, so today I'm going to present our paper of Markov diffusion uh, for graph neural networks. Um, so let's, let's get started. So here is the outline of my presentation. Um, I will uh, go through each of these uh, points uh, in the rest of my uh, presentation. Uh, let's start uh, with the background first. So uh, typically graph neural network is a popular class of uh, neural network for various graph learning tasks. For example, uh, node classification, link prediction. So nowadays, uh, GNN has become a very popular. And in a typical uh, GNN, uh, mostly we uh, get a vertex in a graph, get the information from its neighbors and it uh, learns the intrinsic uh, representations uh, effectively. So it, it has been um, it has been popular for different uh, different learning tasks that uh, are required to do some kind of uh, prediction on a node classification or like prediction. And in a typical GNN, mostly we use uh, the same uh, adjacency matrix of a graph in different convolutional layers. Uh, as an example, in this block diagram, we can see uh, that the input feature of a graph uh, is fit to uh, the input layer uh, along with the adjacency matrix of the graph. And then um, the output of this first layer are, uh, are forwarded to the, the hidden layer, next hidden layers, and this process continue. And we can uh, represent this using this, um, this simple uh, mathematical uh, representation. Uh, this is from uh, the graph convolution letter paper. So now here we have one uh, question like, uh, is it a limitation of GNN that uses the same um, essence matrix in all, all convolutional layers? And several, uh, several existing methods have already explored this area. For example, graph diffusion convolution changes the original um, graph structure and then uh, uses that uh, graph uh, in 
all layers of the GNN. Uh, similarly, cluster GCN is also apart from some kind of graph partitioning um, algorithms that uh, get clusters of the initial, uh, original graph structure and then forward that graph structure in on convolutional layers of uh, the GNN. So now uh, we also observe that all this existing technique also uses the same graph structure, even though they modify the original graph, they have the same graph structure in different layers. Now in this paper, we actually explore can we uh, use different graph structure in different convolutional uh, layers and can we get some benefit out of it? So uh, the answer, the quick answer is like, we can, yes, we can use it and we get some promising results out of it. Now the motivation of our work is like, uh, as uh, in the previous talk, uh, Michael uh, described like how a work is squash problem uh, in GN is uh, important. So here in the second layer of the GNN, vertex V1 will um, gather information from vertex uh, V4 and vertex V5 via vertex V2 and vertex V3. So it is just to dilute the information uh, and creates the over squash problem. And another thing is like, if you have these four vertices uh, and these uh, three other vertices, vertex V5, V6, and V7 are in different uh, classes, then vertex uh, VN will also get the information from vertex uh, V5. So it is becomes a little bit problematic in the prediction model if we uh, get information from different levels, level vertices. So now uh, our paper is basically explore this uh, expected message passing system. Can we have some kind of um, approach where uh, we would like to pass messages from vertex V4 to vertex V1 directly? And we also would like to um, distinguish vertex V1 from vertex V5. That is, there is no edges and, we, uh, and no message will be uh, forwarded. So uh, to explore this um, expected message passing system, actually, how can we uh, design this? And, and in our paper, we define the problem in similar way, like other uh, semi-supervised methods. And here we'd like to uh, learn a GNN model uh, for different uh, um, machine learning tasks, graph machine learning tasks such as node classification, clustering, and so on. Um, so now in our uh, methods, we actually uh, try to have some uh, objectives in mind and then de uh, design the model, such as uh, the average cost problem is reduced. And you also would like to reduce the information aggregation from these similar neighbors. And, uh, and also like to focus on another thing, like when you have uh, the graph in different layers, the original graph in different layers, actually where our computation can be very high, but can we reduce it by modifying the graph or reducing some edges in the graph? So keeping all this in mind, um, yeah, in, the, in the literature, there's a Markov diffusion process. Like in Markov uh, clustering or Markov process, a graph, uh, a graph is modified through different iterations. And then finally, we have a cluster um, or micro clustering uh, graph that is more sparse compared to the original graph. So, can we use it in our GNN model? And uh, can we uh, can this uh, be beneficial for our for, for the GNN model? I would like to mention this. This is a more or less uh, general purpose um, GN, uh, micro process, and this can be used in various um, GNN models. In, uh, here we show an example like our Markov process in, in this uh, bottom panel where we have an original graph and uh, this Markov process uh, iterates uh, and after five or four iterations, the Markov process uh, converges and then we, uh, we, we use uh, different Markov matrices in different convolutional layers in this um, top panel. And you can see we have uh, three hidden layer convolutional layers in the GNN. And since we have more, uh, we have more than three Markov matrices, we need to sample some matrices from all those uh, Markov uh, matrices. And now um, there are several ways we can sample it. So we'll discuss uh, two of them uh, in our uh, paper. Now from this uh, Markov division process, uh, we can also generate other variants of um, GNN. For example, we can get uh, GDC, 
uh, here. We can also can generate uh, equivalent uh, GNN model for cluster GCN and so on. And in this paper, we basically used to uh, do variants uh, where let's say we have uh, five iter fast iterations of uh, Markov process and we have five ZNN layer in the model. Now we use these five uh, matrices in five different layers of the GNN. And we also, this is, this is uh, called the sequential Markov matrices. And then we also have another um, variant, for example, if we have, if the uh, Markov process converges after 20 iterations and we have two GNNs, then actually we use the first and the last converged matrices in this uh, two GNNs. So this is another variation. And uh, if the number of layers is much less compared to the number of iterations record for Markov uh, process to converge, we actually sample in fixed distance from these different Markov matrices. Uh, we uh, we use this uh, widely used benchmarking uh, graph data sets for our experiments, and we have implemented our methods in PyTorch geometric framework. And we conduct all have conducted all these experiments in a server machine uh, to evaluate the performance of um, of state of the art methods and the proposed method. We have used uh, adjusted random index method for clustering tasks and accuracy for node classification tasks. So here we show some results for uh, clustering task, and uh, we can we can see this for this US uh, year data set. Um, this um, this gray color bar basically shows the performance of uh, GNN, uh, GCN, and this um, blue uh, this blue color shows the performance of GT, and this green color shows the performance mark of GCN. So here we can see that the performance of mark of GCN is Compare, is better compared to the GCN, the, the base, uh, baseline model. Similarly, the performance of Markov GT is better compared to the baseline GT model. So it shows that the performance is improving comp uh, compared to the baseline model when we use this Markov diffusion process. Similarly, for other um, networks, for example, email uh, graph data set, actor data sets, we also observe the same results. But it is not true for all the data sets. For example, um, the score data set, uh, we see that um, Markov GCN improved the performance, but um, Markov GAT uh, didn't get any benefit out of it. Similar, the Markov graph and didn't get benefit out of it. So then we also explore the node classification tasks um, and we also observe the similar results, for example, this US data set and actor data set, we uh, get some benefit out of the uh, Markov uh, process. But for some other uh, networks, uh, for example, this chameleon and core data set, um, we don't see so much improvement or maybe the performance is not uh, that much for these models. We also observed the visualization tasks. For example, when you have MDD, we um, use TSNE, um, TSNE method to uh, draw the two-dimensional plots. And here for this chameleon data set, we have three classes and we use three colors to, uh, to uh, identify different class levels in this graph. And we observed that the GCN um, plot is not that uh, differentiable. But if we observe the Markov, the plots of Markov uh, GCN, we see that we can uh, more or less identify three different clusters in this um, plot. We also uh, explore the sensitivity sensitivity of uh, different hyperparameters in the model. Uh, for example, um, pooling threshold is a uh, hyperparameters in um, Markov process. And here, um, as I mentioned uh, previously. In the higher layers, we would like to have a, a more sparse network so that the computation time is, or the training time is reduced. So here observe that for pruning uh, threshold value 0.15, uh, the number of uh, ages drops compared to the original um, graph. But we also observe that the performance like that rand index uh, is higher compared to the original graph structure. So. Uh, it actually uh, shows that we can actually um, sparsify the graph and we can also get the baseline performance from it, which reduces the computation times in higher layers. 
So now, in, now in summary, um, Markov uh, actually proposes a more or less uh, general purpose uh, Markov process, which can be used in different um, graph neural network models, and it reduces the wire squashing and neighborhood explosion problems, and uh, it improves the performance for various um, uh, graph learning tasks such as clustering, classification, and visualization. For more results, we have uh, those uh, computation or runtime uh, information in our paper. So we'd like to um, we'd like to uh, refer the audience to our uh, main manuscript to get more uh, information about it. And um, that's all from me. Thank you so much. Now, if you have a question, please go ahead. So, Khaled, so, so many thanks. Thanks a lot for the talk. So. So as before, if someone has a question, so please, please type your question in, in the chats. Um, so, so the things that we have just like, we are running just a little, so, so I think that, okay, so, so maybe we can then move to, so, well, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Khaled. So I think that we'll have to move to the next question, to, to, to the next talk. So thanks a lot for, for your presentation and yeah, for being here so in person. I hope it's not too early in Indiana right now, uh, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so if I'm correct, but I hope I'm not wrong. So for the next talk, what we would be having now would be uh, unsupervised super pixel driven parcel segmentation by Fulin Wang and colleagues. If I'm correct, and is it going to be okay? So it's going to be like a video then. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, there is no sound on my end. So I think that's. The sound is missing. Okay, so it seems like we are running into a small technical issue. Uh, so is it maybe because uh, uh, this Is it audible now? We can hear you. Is it but audible? I the... Well, I can I can hear your voice. Yeah. Sh uh, Sh Shivangi, but, but I, I hear your voice, but I don't hear the sound from the video. Well, that would okay. be on, uh, for me. Okay, okay. So let me check this. Okay. 
using graph convolutional network. Yeah, I will briefly now. give an introduction about partial segmentation and some related background. Then I will discuss our methodology and our framework, followed by experiment and then conclusion. A little bit about the background. Parcel segmentation is the segmentation of agricultural parcels and satellite images. It is the building block of many environmental remote sensing applications, such as crop classification and growth monitoring. These applications help to make business decisions related to food security, climate change, and environmental protection. There are two main deep learning approaches. Accurate ground truth is necessary in a supervised model, but annotating parcel level reference is time consuming and later labor intensive on satellite images. These algorithms also suffer from unsatisfactory generalization in other regions. On the other hand, unsupervised learning based segmentation methods do not need expensive ground truth information during the learning process. These methods purely rely on image content, leading to much better generalization capacity. Specifically, SuperPixel is widely used in remote sensing segmentation tasks. It is a group of pixels that share similar properties in an image. A SuperPixel level result can facilitate image processing and significantly eliminate the salt and pepper noise. Recently, graph learning has uh, numerous applications in computer vision, recommender system, and natural language processing. Among various graph problems, graph partitioning is one of the most important topic. The idea is to divide the vertex set under constraints and try to minimize the edge cut across the partitions. In this work, we propose an unsupervised GCM-based framework of superpixel-driven parcel segmentation. The main idea of our approach is that we generate superpixels from a remote sensing image. These superpixels are transformed into nodes in a graph. We leverage graph neural networks to learn the latent relationship among the superpixels. And finally, the superpixels are partitioned into fewer larger segments in an unsupervised manner. These larger segments are the aggregations of superpixels, and visually it is the segmentation results of an image. Some of the key contributions are, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first end-to-end -end unsupervised GCM-based framework for superpixel-driven parcel segmentation of remote sensing images. It incorporates the powerful graph learning capacity of GCMs and the grid generalization of superpixels. In our framework, we design GUSA, which means graph-based unsupervised superpixel aggregation with a novel loss function to effectively learn the latent affinity relationship among the superpixels and better aggregating similar ones in spatial and spectral spaces. We also conduct extensive experiments as well as ablation studies on our multi-temporal, multi-location Sentinel-2 image dataset. Our result demonstrates the robustness and generalization of GUSA, and it achieves the best performance compared with other competing methods. The figure on the right illustrates the proposed framework. The first step is to crop the remote sensing image into smaller patches for efficient processing. Superpixel generation is next performed on each patch. The patch and the superpixel result together construct a graph, and each node represents one superpixel. The graph is fed into the graph-based superpixel aggregation module to classify the superpixels. The partition result is equivalent to the superpixel aggregation on the image patch. In the patch mosaic module, each patch is mosaic back into the whole image size. And finally, an artificial border removal algorithm eliminates fake resultant boundaries at the patch mosaic and borders. The output is the final parcel segmentation result of the entire input image. In the first step of the framework, a single Sentinel-2 image is crafted into smaller patches because the original image is very large, and it is rare to directly train on a deep learning model due to hardware limitation and expensive computation. Each crafted patch has a fixed width and height with four channels, and each patch is processed individually for superpixel generation using the simple non-iterative clustering algorithm because of its overall satisfaction in terms of visual quality and compactness. A superpixel graph is constructed by the original image patch and its superpixel result. Each node in the graph represents a superpixel. The graph is then fed into the GUSA model to learn the superpixel aggregation. Recently, GAP is proposed to partition a graph into an unsupervised manner for network parameters optimization task. Our GUSA model is inspired by this GAP model. 
The gap model accepts node degree, node features, and node adjacency matrix as input. There are two modules for uh, graph embedding and graph partitioning, respectively. And a trainable multitask loss function is designed for minimizing a continuous relaxation format of normalized cut and a balanced cut with uh, ground truth. However, the GCN has several limitations when it applies to our parcel segmentation task. The GCN in the graph embedding module of the GAF model suffers from the vanishing gradient problem, so only shallow model can be built. Another limitation is that the graph edges in GCN are fixed, so the relationship of a superpixel node and its neighbor are not dynamically learned during the training. The third limitation is that the adjacency matrix of the superpixel nodes does not make full use of the spatial and spectral affinities. Therefore, we designed GUSA by modifying the architecture and the loss function of the gap model to effectively consider the specific city of our superpixel graph. Like the gap model, we have three inputs. The nodes featured of our model are the BGRN values of the superpixels. Instead of using the GCN graph embedding module in GAP, we leverage deep GCN inside the GUSA to overcome the issues listed in the previous page. The rest GCN backbone alleviates the vanishing gradient problem by adding residual connections between the layers. It also has a dilated k-nearest neighbor function to dynamically compute node adjacency. This allows to dynamically change neighbors in the GCN to learn better graph representations. The Fusion blocks fuse the global features as well as local features from the REST GCN backbone. The last MLP prediction block is modified such that it maintains the spatial information and classify um, the original N superpixel nodes from the input to G partitions. The deep GCN is an improved holistic combination of the graph embedding and partitioning modules of GAP. We designed a new adjacency matrix to consider both spatial and spectral affinities. In the equation, the first term is considered when two nodes are spatially adjacent, and the second term measures the weight of similarity in spectral space. We also define two new hyperparameters to address the dominant terms in the loss function. The sigma investigates the importance of balance cut loss. The new adjacency matrix mentioned before is also updated in this loss function. The normalized cut loss represent an optimal partitioning of a graph that minimizes the cut in a differentiable function. And the balance cut loss ensures the number of nodes for each partition should be similar. When the training process is compu computed, the output classified the superpixel into G partitions, and visually the adjacent superpixel with the same partition label appear aggregated together. Each individual patch is trained on GUSA. Once all patches are processed, they are fed into the patch mosaic module. They will sag back together into the input image size with the superpixel aggregation results. However, due to the individual patch-based result, artificial borders are present on the patch edges, leading to fixed segmentation boundaries. The yellow lines in the figure illustrate this effect. Therefore, we design a procedure of artificial border removal to eliminate those artifacts while keeping the original segmentation results. The idea is to merge the similar segments at a shared patch border across the adjacent patches under a certain threshold. The artificial borders are then removed as the result of merging. The full lambda schedule algorithm is utilized to calculate the merging cost of two segments. We conduct extensive experiments to evaluate the performance of our GUSA model. We collected a multi-temporal, multi-location Sentinel-2 dataset, which has high spatial resolution and high temporal resolution. In the dataset, there are four different county regions with parcel-level ground truth labels. Every large remote sensing image is crafted into patches with the size of 512 times 512. There are a total around 9,800 patches in total. The figure on the right presents an image patch with examples of land cover variation at Fuyu County throughout four quarters. We adopt probabilistic rent index, or PRI, as our segmentation evaluation metric. It quantifies the partition similarity between the segmentation result and the ground truth. A higher PRI means a better segmentation result. We calculate the average PRI value over multi-temporal images to evaluate the performance of a model. 
we evaluate our model both quantitatively and qualitatively. To perform the timely and fair comparison, we select recent models that are unsupervised deep learning based and superpixel involved models, including DIC, URSB, and GAP as the competing methods. Every model used the same superpixel generation input and the number of partition G. The table lists the average PRI values of partial segmentation results on our dataset using the four models. As we can see, the graph-based models GAP and GUSA have better performance, and GUSA achieves the best performance compared with other models across all counties. For each county, FUYU has the highest PRI values as it has simpler parcel layout and lower urban density. The hilly topo topography in other counties, such as Xiangzhou, indeed impacts on the segmentation results of all four models due to more irregular parcel shapes. Yuanyang and Taoxian are located close to each other, so their terrains and parcel layouts are comparable, therefore they have similar PRI results. The figure on the right shows the results of an image patch example in Yuanyang County. The first, Im the first two images are the original image and the ground truth label. Both DIC and URSB model maintains the boundaries between the urban and cropland areas, but they do not perform well on cropland parcels. And more specifically, the DIC model over-aggregates the cropland parcels, and the URSB model has lots of tiny segments. These two models do not utilize the spatial affinity among superpixels, so the cropland boundaries are ignored. The GAP and QSA are graph-based models. The GAP model obtains clearer boundaries, but it is unable to separate the croplands from the urban areas well. Many incorrect segments can be found at the actual urban boundaries. The GUSA model achieves better parcel segmentation results as it generates clearer boundaries in urban and cropland areas. We believe that the reasons are threefold. First, the deep GCN learns the graph embedding better than the conventional GCN by mitigating the gradient vanishing problem. And second, GAP model does not contain the model structure to preserve the spatial information of superpixels. And lastly, we improve the adjacency matrix to consider both the spatial and spectral spaces in superpixels affinities. We introduced two new hyperparameters in the GUSA loss function, sigma and delta. For efficient ablation experiments, we fix one representative county Yuanyang as it has a relatively balanced percentage of urban and agricultural areas. We set different orders of magnitudes of sigma and different values for delta. Table on the right shows the average PRI result of GUSA under various combinations of the parameter values. The best result is achieved when sigma is 1 and delta is 0.7. This indicated that normalized cut and the balance cut loss are contributes to the learning process. Decrease the dominance of the balance cut loss can significantly degrade the performance. In the adjacency matrix, similarity in the spectral space is valuable and it's dominant, but spatial adjacency is not ignored. And lastly, we observed that purely rely on similarities in either spectral space or spatial space is not ideal. Remote sensing images can vary a lot in the same region due to environmental change and plant growth. We want to evaluate how the model generalizes to different quarters. We evaluate the performance of GUSA in four individual quarters on our dataset. The PRI values are shown in the table on the right. The result has demonstrated the overall robustness of GUSA across different seasons in four counties. We observed that the performance is most stable in Fuyu, but fluctuates in Xiangzhou. This could be due to the topographic simplicity and low urbanization in Fuyu. Another possible reason that the performance has a slight difference in different county is due to the intra-annual climate and vegetation variability. To summarize, we propose the first end-to-end -end unsupervised GCN-based framework for superpixel-driven parcel segmentation of remote sensing images. Our GUSA model effectively learned the latent affinity among superpixels and better aggregate similar ones in spatial and spectral spaces. Extensive experiments are conducted on our Sentinel-2 image dataset to demonstrate the outstanding performance and robustness of our proposed framework. The newly defined hyperparameter in GUSA also validated using ablation studies. We are currently annotating more regions to expand our dataset size. We will also investigate the effectiveness of some edge-enhanced approaches to improve the performance of our proposed methods.
This is the end of our presentation. Thank you for listening. Okay, so so wonderful. So so we managed to make it work. So that's just perfect. So so I think that the authors are, are not here, but in any case, we are running a little bit late. So so I propose to move to the next to the next talk. So for the next talk, uh, which is, if I'm correct, improving bundles recommendation coverage in sparse product graphs, that should be given by Salini Agarwal and his collaborators. Oh, are you online or is it again a video that has been uploaded i'm present online so i can present it uh, now instead of going through the video Hello everyone, I'm Saloni Agarwal and I'll be presenting our paper on improving bundles recommendation coverage in sparse product graphs. This is the outline of the presentation. First, I'll talk about the bundles recommendation and the problem we addressed, followed by product graph creation for bundles recommendation. Then our approach on predicting bundles using link prediction followed by efficient ad selection for inference, experiments on our data set and public data sets, results, and at last key takeaways. Re retailers often bundle products to offer an improved shopping experience to the customers. For example, in this figure, we show an example of product bundle formed for the car set. When a car set is clicked by the user, a bundle with backseat mirror a support cushion and a car seat cover is displayed. A group of similar or complementary products based on the product category forms bundle. Similar and comp complementary product recommendation is widely studied problem, but bundles recommendation is different from the rec recommendation of similar or complementary products. Existing bundles recommendation include personalized product recommendation and association rule-based recommendation, but they suffer from cold start problem. They cannot produce satisfactory results for users with no historical data and pr products with little purchase history. Bundles recommendation based on behavioral data mining leads to many products without any product recommendation in the bundles. The proportion of products with empty bundles recommendation out of all the products in a category is defined as the coverage for that category. The distribution of the coverage for different categories based on add to cart customer behavior is represented here. We can observe that few categories have a convergence of a coverage of even less than 10% in the bundles recommendation. So we propose a method for obtaining recommendations for more products in the catalog by overcoming the cold start problem. An improved bundles recommendation will provide a consistent user experience and increase dependence of customer on the bundles feature while benefiting the seller by better user experience and additional sales generated from the recommendations. We generate new recommendations first by first building product graphs from the add to cart data and then use the predictions in the product graph for forming the bundles. We form weighted directed product graph where the products added first in the cart in the session from the add to cart data are the source and the products added later are the destination. The weight of the edges in the product graph represent the normalized number of customers during add, adding source before the destination in their cart. We predict the edges based on the edge prediction. We render the top prediction as bundles recommendation. In this example, we see that the car, car seat is added before the back seat mirror in the cart. So we have an edge from the car seat mirror to the back seat mirror 
in the product graph. Let us assume that the back seat cover, uh, that the car seat cover has, this link has been predicted by using our method. Then the proposed bundles recommendation will contain car, car seat cover as a recommendation for the car seat. Now let's delve into the, into the details of the product graph creation. For every category in the catalog, separate product graphs are created. The products in the category are represented as vertices in the graph and the edges represent the add to cart information. The formed bundles graph can, can be directly used for bundles recommendation, but it suffers from both cold start problem and coverage problem. The filled nodes that, that are connect, uh, represents the nodes that are connected in the bundles recommendation graph while the hollow nodes represent the isolated nodes that are not connected to other nodes in the recommendation graph. So we propose to predict links between the isolated nodes and the connected subgraph for reducing the sparsity of the bundles graph. In order to predict the link, we propose bundles sale framework. We first form the bundles graph based on the user add to cart data, product price data, and item attributes. The customer add to cart data is used to create the bundles graph as described before. The product price is used to filter the edges having, a, having destination product price significantly higher than the source because recommending a highly priced item as a recommendation has a negative impact according to business rules. And we use the product information like brand category and embeddings for defining the node attributes in the graph. We build GNN model based on this inputs and then train and then finds a subset of the edges for efficient, um, uh, for efficient inference. We use the subset of the edges for inference based on the similarity graph using the built GNN model and render the bundles recommendation as output of the bundles sale based on this predictions. We, ex we experimented with various approaches for link prediction, including both heuristic and GNN based predictions. We used different base GNN networks like graph convolution, neural network, graph sage, gene, etc. The node attributes in the G GNN network consists of a combination of node labels, product embeddings, and product attributes. We experimented with different node labels representing the subgraph information. Product, product embeddings is based on the input graph to capture the graph structure. We train different GNN models using this inputs and get predictions for link, for link existence and weights as the output. In order to reduce the sparsity, we can predict all the non-existing edges for inference, but it is not feasible due to the number of products in these graphs. So we apply a heuristic to, sub, uh, to select a subset of the non-existing edges for inference. We form a graph containing both add to cart based bundles graph and similarity edges from the substitute graph. The substitute graph was formed based on the nearest neighbor of the nodes, text and image attributes representing the similarity relationship. We reduce the number of uh, inference edges by considering only those edges that are two hop neighbors in this graph, including the similarity edges, and where both the edges do not represent the similarity relationship. In this example, we have a black car set similar to a gray car set connected by a blue edge. And the black car set contains the black back set mirror, the cushion, and the car seat cover in the bundles recommendation. So it is highly likely that the gray car seat can also have the same three products in the recommendation. And we infer using the trained GNN on such edges. We, experiment, we experimented on both our in-house data set and available, um, publicly available Amazon metadata data set. 
we choose baby and beauty category with a coverage of 27% and 69% respectively from our in-house data set and toys and arts and crafts categories from the Amazon data set. We use add to cart to, for creating edges in our in-house data set and co-purchase in the absence of, of add to cart for the Amazon data set to form the bundles graph. As we observe, we have nodes in the orders of tens, tens of thousands and inferring on all the non-existing adjustments, inferring on around 10, 100 million or maybe close to billion edges, which is practically impossible in our production environment. The table here represents the mean and standard deviation of the AUC values for link, prediction, for link existence prediction binary classification task on the baby and beauty categories using different heuristic-based approaches and GNN-based predictions. We observe that the GNN-based approach performed relatively better than the heuristic-based approach and gene-based GNN approach performs better than the other GNN-based approach. So we choose gene as the base network in our bundles sale framework. The plots here represents the main reciprocal rank as percentage for all for the existing edges that that result in isolated source node by removal of the considered edge for the baby and beauty categories from our in-house data set and toys and ad, uh, arts and crafts from the Amazon data set. We observe that the DRNN node labeling technique for link existence classification represented in the red lines in these graphs perform better than the other approaches. Further, using product attributes and BERT embeddings of the text PABE as input defining the nodes results in better prediction than the other inputs represented along the x-axis. We deploy this best performing model, which is PABE and DRNM node labeling based classifier in the production. The figure here shows the recommendation for a newly launched self-owned brand. When a new brand is launched, the lack of customer shopping history containing that brand's product means we cannot predict bundles based on bundles graph. In each row, we have bundles recommendation for the products in the yellow box. After a few days of launch, the blue box represents products that are recommended from the bundles graph, while the green box represents the products that are re recommended by the bundles sale. Many newly launched product like add to cart history, hence requiring recommendation based on prediction. The product in the gr green box are predicted from the bundle sale are highly relevant and also include products from other brand categories, from other brands in the store. The top table here, shows the revenue boost using the designed bundle sim framework in the online A-B test. We observe a 35% increase in the revenue over co-purchase based baseline in our A-B test and 20% improvement in conversion over the baseline. So the key takeaways from this presentation are, we propose bundles, based on add to cart data, recommendation by mining the sequence in which customers add products to their cart in a session lifts 15% in revenue over purely co-purchase behavior-based recommendations. We proposed bundles sale, which is a GNN-based method to predict new pr recommendations for products that had no coverage in the add to cart behavior-based data. We propose a heuristic that helps to apply bundle self for infer inferencing in a scalable way. The impact of our proposed approach is that it leads to an increase in the number of products that have bundles recommendation by nearly 50% and has boosted the revenue in the AB test by, by 35%. I want to thank you all for attending this presentation and now answer any question that you might have. So hello, uh, Saloni. So uh, apologies, my internet connection has been broken at some point, so I disappeared. 
but I'm back just in time. So thanks a lot for being uh, on time. Uh, so that's just great. So, so we, we maybe have, so I, I, I could only see partially your talk. So I'm afraid that it's gonna be difficult for me to ask questions, but is there anyone who would have some questions? So if you do, please write them in the chat and I would be more than happy to, uh, to share them with uh, Saloni. No. So it seems that we don't have questions. So in any case, we just have a little, like one or two minutes. So, so I think that uh, we're gonna be switching to the next talk. So thanks a lot for, for the presentation. Yes, congratulations. And so I'll, I'm gonna move then to, uh, to, the next, uh, to the next talk. So the next talk is uh, revisiting neighborhood-based link prediction for collaborative filtering, if I'm correct, by uh, Hao Ming Fu. Uh, are you here? Oh yes, I can see you, perfect. Yeah, yes, okay. And so, just so that you know, my internet connection still seems to be a little bit unstable. So, if I disappear, I'll do my best to come back. Okay, sure. Uh, so, can everyone see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let me get started. Perfect. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Haoming Fu, and today I'm presenting the paper Revisiting Neighborhood-Based Think Prediction for Collaboration Filtering. And this work was done at SNAP, and it's uh, supervised by Patrick Poisson, Kwasin Lee, and Chen Wang. So uh, the task we're doing here is collaborative filtering, which is the most widely adopted algorithm for recommendation systems. So we are not using uh, any context information for the users or items, and we are only using those implicit feedbacks like purchases or clicks in the data set. So uh, the data we have can be viewed as a bipartite graph where uh, the users and items are the nodes and their interactions are the links. So from this graph's point of view, a recommendation system can be viewed as a link, link prediction task, which has a long history. So uh, the motivation for this work is that uh, most graph neural network based methods are focusing on nodes, meaning that they are trying to learn representation for those users and items, and then later use this representation to predict the existence of a link between a user and item. So our idea for uh, in this work is that for a link prediction task, like we mentioned, why don't we directly focus on the links rather than the nodes? So the key success of the work is that we try to model those links directly and instead of modeling the nodes first and then use the learned representation to predict, predict the existence of a link. So uh, I'll briefly go through uh, our contribution. So we propose a linkage score uh, approach, a model called link prop, which is non-deep learning and has only six parameters. Uh, for link prediction, and which significantly output uh, outperforms uh, SOTA gene-based models on item recommendation. So we also show that uh, this approach has a link with several ca classic linkage scores uh, in the literature, and it further generalizes them by making some parameters learnable rather than predefined. And also we demonstrate the robustness and efficiency of our approach. So uh, this is our proposed model link prop. So uh, for each user item pair, we calculate the linkage score between them. So the linkage, linkage score is basically the summation of contributions from each path between this user and item. So let's consider a single path. This contribution to this uh, link score will be shown in the figure on the right. So we can see that this contribution is the inverse of the powered degrees of those users and items along the path. So the D are the degrees for the users and items and alpha and beta, gamma and delta are learnable parameters. So we will use our training data to find the best set of alpha, beta, gamma and delta for this data set. So the intuition for this uh, linkage score definition is that with more linking paths between this user and item, 
the uh, score, the resulting linkage score should be higher. So that's why we are summing all, this, the, all the contributions from these paths. And the other thing is that the lower degree should lead to higher score, meaning that the uh, importance of a certain user or item is negatively, negatively related to uh, its popularity. So uh, by calculating this linkage score, we are directly modeling the links rather than uh, focusing on the nodes first. So uh, here's the relation between link prop and some classic linkage scores. So we can see that uh, link prop is a more generalized form and it's able to recover these uh, linkage scores in the literature. And it further generalizes them by making those uh, powers alpha, beta, gamma, and delta learnable rather than predefined like in uh, previous methods. So uh, another technique we use uh, is iterative entity degree update. <clears throat> so basically we are doing this link propagation multiple times with better and better updated uh, degrees of user and item. So uh, the process is like this. First, we calculate the linkage score like, uh, using the equation we showed in the previous slide. And then we keep top K, uh, top T proportion of those new links. And then we use these new links to update all the uh, user item degrees. And then we, we go back to uh, step one to use these updated degrees to recalculate the linkage scores. So there will be uh, our iterations in total. So the intuitions for doing this is that a better linkage score we calculate should give us a better estimation on those entity degrees. And then the a better entity degrees can again help us calculate better linkage score. So we just allow these two components to improve each other back and forth and uh, in an alternating manner. So uh, this technique will introduce two extra uh, learnable parameters, T and R where T is the proportion of new links to keep and R is the number of iterations. So combining them with our original four parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, we have uh, six learnable parameters in, in our model. So for model training, uh, considering that we have such a small parameter space with only six parameters, we can directly quantize the parameter space and then use exhaustive, uh, exhaustive research to find the best set of parameter to use for a certain data set. So a good thing about this is that we can directly optimize ranking metrics like NDCG, which is not even differentiable. So uh, we are directly optimizing them uh, without using any approximation, uh, any, any loss function to approximate such metrics for ranking. So uh, here is the main performance from our model on item recommendation task. So we can see that despite the simplicity of our approach with only six parameters, <clears throat> the, uh, it's outperforming existing uh, GAN based models. And specifically on Amazon big data set is outperforming existing models by over 60%. The reason for this is that uh, actually Amazon Book is a significantly larger data set than any other data sets listed in the table. So uh, those GAN based models are trying to learn uh, representation space for the users and items. They are using a fixed dimension for this representation space to control the computational cost. But when the data is getting, when the data set is getting larger with more users to be considered and more items to be ranked correctly, this fixed dimension back in space will not have enough representation power to capture all the relations between these uh, many users and items. So in this case, the performance of these uh, GAN based models will be limited by the representation power of this back in space. So this is one of the advantages of our approach because we're not even learning a representation for the nodes before we do link prediction. So uh, we are not limited by the Latin dimensions, especially on larger data sets. 
So an ablation study we did was that we tried to uh, observe the contribution of each parameters in our model. So uh, the table here shows that making those parameters learnable rather than predefined is really crucial. So here we are comparing our result with uh, those linkage scores in the literature we mentioned earlier. So we can see that even when we are only learning uh, the parameter delta, which is also used by uh, previous linkage scores, we are still outperforming them by making it learnable rather than predefined, like in uh, earlier approach. So for model robustness, we randomly insert uh, fake links into our training data to test the ability of a model to uh, learn robust results based on this noisy data. So we can see that even up to 30% uh, fake links in the training data, ThinkPub is still performing, uh, is still reaching reasonable results, while uh, JN-based approach often has a, a larger performance decrease with uh, like fake links up to 30% in the training data. So uh, for model efficiency from the algorithm on the right, we can see that calculating the linkage score of ThinkPub can actually be modeled as simple metric op matrix operations, which is highly efficient and highly parallelizable with GPUs. So also in terms of uh, time complexity, we are enjoying a lower time complexity than most GNN based approach. So the details are in our paper. So uh, a quick conclusion is that for a recommendation system, which is uh, basically a link prediction test, directly modeling links is highly effective. And uh, we also we propose a really simple link prediction approach called link prop with also six, uh, with only six parameters and non-deep learning. Uh, it can still outperform complex node modeling models. And uh, also link prop can recover uh, many classic linkage scores in the literature while we further generalize them by making these parameters learnable rather than uh, predefined to a fixed body. So, uh, and also approach is efficient and robust and especially performs well on huge data sets. So uh, with this work, we hope to inspire the com community to revisit using uh, link prediction approaches for collaborative filtering and venture along this direction. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and well, excellent. I'm open to any questions. So, so thank you very much, Hao Ming. So, 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 so may I start with, so I actually have two short questions. So uh, I'll yeah, ask sure. them both together and you ask, answer, you choose the answer, the, uh, the question that you want to answer or both of them. So, so the first one is that, so does this, so, so there have been some works in, in graph clustering or community detection where people have been trying to, to cluster the edges of a graph instead of clustering the nodes of a graph. And that's something that people have been using in part in order to, to produce overlapping communities where you would have a node that may belong to different clusters because each of the cluster involved edges. And I was wondering if somehow that, that was something that would be related to, to the kind of philosophy you have by focusing on edges. And the second question I had was, so here you have these uh, four parameters for the, uh, for, for the degrees, right? So yeah, that's correct. What are the typical values that are associated to, uh, to the optimal predictions you have? So, and, and are the values of alpha, beta, gamma, delta, uh, roughly the same across different data sets? Oh, uh, we are listing the resulting uh, learned values in the paper, and uh, they are not the same across data sets, but they are uh, close to each other. So, uh, yeah, we can also, we will also try to use a single set of parameters to uh, adapt to all the data sets, and the performance is uh, still quite strong, but it's still better to learn these parameters uh, for each data set in individually. And, you, and, and do you tend to have values of beta, gamma, and delta close to one? Are they closer to one or closer to zero? Which would be oh. the two natural choices? I, I think in most cases they are uh, like in between, like maybe 
around 0.5. Okay, like, so I think it's, it's from like 0.2 to 0.7. So basically it's uh, like in the middle of the range. Okay, thanks. So, uh, okay, cool, perfect. So, so I think that we are just on time. Well, we are late as, 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 as was expected, but we're not too late. So I don't know if there's anyone else who wants to ask a question. Otherwise, well, otherwise, well, uh, thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot for the presentation. Thanks. I'll probably send you a, a, an email with maybe a link or two to some papers that could be interesting, just in case. But thank you very much for being with us and for the presentation. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, so then we are coming to the next uh, talk. So the next talk is uh, Understanding Dropout for Graph Neural Networks by Juan uh, Shu and colleagues. So are you here in person or is it uh, a video that needs to be uploaded? Okay, so it seems to be a video then. Perfect. So let's hope that the sound will be here. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jen, uh, and I'm going to present this paper titled uh, Understanding Dropout for a Graph Neural Network. Okay, so let's first understand what is a graph neural network. So for a graph neural network, it's a deep learning method or a representation learning method. So the input of this model is a graph uh, with node edge and possible we, possibly we have a node feature or edge feature. And as the Euro uh, neural network structure, uh, we have different layers for this model. And after uh, each layer, we have this uh, uh, activation function, this ReLU activation function. Okay, so the layer I listed here is a graph convolutional layer. So um, how does this uh, graph convolutional layer work? So for example, for the first layer, uh, each dimension we focus on one node. Uh, we have this target node, this pink node. And we want to learn a new representation for this uh, target node uh, for each layer. So uh, we first find their neighborhoods, and then we aggregate or pass the information from their neighborhood to this target node. Okay, so the target node learn new representation by aggregating information from their neighborhood node. Okay, uh, and for each uh, graph convolutional layer, we did the same thing: pass information from neighborhoods to the target node. And then after uh, all the convolutional layer, we have a node embedding, the new node embedding for um, this graph. And then we can pass this uh, new node embedding to the fully connected layers and then uh, match to the output. So this graph neural network is trained uh, with uh, backpropagation and uh, uh, gradient descent optimization method. Okay, so the diagram is just help you to understand, uh, intuitively understand how graph neural network uh, works. And here we have a graph neural network defined from two domain, uh, one is spectral domain and one is spatial domain. Okay, so for spectral domain graph neural network, we mainly uh, rely on this adjacency matrix is A because uh, adjacency matrix reflects the one half neighbor information, right? So uh, we uh, make use of this adjacency matrix uh, to help us learn a new embedding for each node. And um, the GNN defined from spatial domain, we basically uh, uh, applied the idea uh, of a, uh, information flow or information aggregation, uh, this process. We directly define this formula based on that process. So it is more flexible compared with uh, this spectral uh, GN defined from spectral domain. But their key, uh, the key idea is the same, it's just to uh, make use of neighborhood information to learn the new representation for the target node. Okay, and we have two uh, type of uh, graph learning task. One is uh, transactive learning and one is inductive learning. Okay, so for inductive learning, we, uh, the training data are multiple graphs and we want to generalize our model trained on these multiple graphs to a new uh, graph. Uh, for transactive graph learning task, uh, we just have one graph. But in this graph, we have some nodes having a feature, uh, I'm sorry, uh, having label and some nodes do not have label. Okay, so for nodes do not have label, they're a testing node. For nodes that have uh, label, it is training nodes. 
Okay, so this is uh, definitely a semi-supervised learning task. So we will test our methods on uh, these two uh, graph learning tasks. And next is our motivation of our work. Uh, we want to introduce dropout from CNS to GNS. Uh, and we all know that GNN, uh, I'm sorry, uh, dropout is a regularization technique to prevent a neural network from overfitting. So basically we generate, uh, generate a Bernoulli random variable and multiply this Bernoulli random variable with uh, each neural. So each new neural has probability P to be uh, zero out, right? So we end up with this uh, dropout neural net on the right-hand side. So you can see we reduce a lot of uh, parameters, which can help us from overfitting from uh, over parameter trace model. Okay. Um, and dropout uh, is frequently used in graph convolutional layer. So it also be a, uh, it has already been applied to graph neural network, but it's frequently used in graph convolutional layer. So here we can pair the dropout in convolutional layers in CN and also in uh, GNS. Okay, so for CNS, we can see that we have many feature maps depending on how many filters we have. And you can drop a whole feature map or you can drop uh, some features in uh, some certain uh, feature maps. Okay, but for a graph neural network, we just have one feature map. And you, we have uh, three uh, dropout schemes. One is uh, dropout node, uh, one is drop edge, we drop some connections between nodes, and we also can drop some feature dimensions. Okay, so as you can see here, uh, for CNs, we have uh, multiple feature maps, right? So if we drop some information in these feature maps, then this information can still be included in other feature maps. Right, so this information probably will not be lost. But for GNN, if we drop uh, some information, this information will be lost uh, in the following propagation steps because we just have one feature map. Okay, so directly apply this Bernoulli dropout from CNS to GNS might not be adequate because we probably will lose some information. Okay, so this can also be reflected from uh, the further experiment in the paper. And next problem we want to see is the uh, over smoothing problem. So uh, as GNN goes deeper, uh, node representation are gradually uh, indistinguishable because for each layer, we aggregate information from the neighborhood to the target node. And as layer gets deeper, actually the target node will aggregate information from uh, almost all the nodes in this graph. So this is a uh, very serious uh, over smoothing problems make and it will make the node indistinguishable from other nodes. Okay, uh, and the dropout can help us to break uh, some of this information passing uh, mechanism, or it can help us to break this information aggregation process. So probably uh, it will help us to solve uh, part of this uh, over smoothing problems. So this is the second task that we want to uh, test. Okay, uh, at least, uh, uh, the two tasks here. Uh, so uh, the first thing that we are going to talk about is this uh, layer composition dropout, because we see that after we apply a Bernoulli variable to this uh, graph neural network, we uh, probably will lose many informations. So, uh, so why not uh, add the information from previous layer to the following layers? So this manually we can, uh, avoid uh, losing some information uh, in this propagation process. So this is the key idea of this layer compensation dropout. And a detailed formula is listed here. And we did some experiment on this layer compensation dropout and compare with uh, the traditional dropout, like uh, dropout on feature, dropout on node, and dropout on, uh, on edge. And we can see that uh, this layer composition dropout uh, outperform all the other uh, traditional dropout techniques. And uh, this dropout on node method do not perform as well as the other two dropout schemes, uh, mainly because uh, dropout node will probably significantly change the graph structure. So it will have a huge impact on the uh, prediction accuracy. So dropout on node, uh, is pretty, uh, it's not that frequently used uh, compared with uh, uh, the drop on a feature and drop on an edge. 
Okay, and besides uh, Bernoulli dropout, we also test uh, the Gaussian dropout. So instead of multiplying a Bernoulli random variable to each neuron, uh, we multiply a Gaussian random variable to each neuron. Okay, and the mean of this Gaussian uh, random variable is set to be one, and the variance uh, also can be one. But here we want to see uh, if we uh, if we can uh, optimize this Gaussian uh, variance. It means that uh, we do not want this Gaussian variance to be uh, uh, constant. Then if we can uh, uh, in, uh, improve our, mo our model pre prediction accuracy. So uh, in this adaptive pattern scheduling dropout, we uh, make a forward uh, propagation several times, then we can get the output several times, right? And then we can measure the uncertainty uh, based on this many outputs. And then we will use this uncertainty as uh, Gaussian variance in those Gaussian variables in the Gaussian dropout. Okay, so this is an uh, idea of this uh, adaptive heteroscedastic dropout. We do not want to make the Gaussian uh, variance a uh, constant. We want to use the model uncertainty uh, as a variance in that Gaussian dropout to control the embedding that we've learned. Okay, and we compare um, several Gaussian dropout uh, for two different uh, graph uh, neural network structure. One is uh, GCNN, and one is uh, graph sage. And we can see that after we optimize uh, this Gaussian variance, or if we do not set this Gaussian variance to be a constant, we have a better performance. We can see the AHD uh, outperforms all the other uh, uh, benchmark uh, Gaussian variables. And we also notice that for inductive learning task, uh, Gaussian variables perform very bad compared with a Bernoulli dropout. So we're guessing that uh, for inductive learning task, if we want to generalize our model on, on seen uh, graphs or new graphs, maybe a uh, sparse dropout structure can help us to generalize better. So that is probably why the Bernoulli dropout uh, performs better than Gaussian dropout in this inductive learning tasks. Okay, so here are some conclusion or some inspirations that we get from uh, the previous experiment. And we can see that uh, the Bernoulli dropout can works better for can work for both a transductive and inductive graph learning task. Uh, but dropout on node uh, may change the graph structure uh, too much, so the performance is bad. And uh, also, uh, Gaussian uh, dropout model cannot generalize well on new graphs. Uh, so that uh, when we want to do inductive learning tasks, we probably need to use uh, a Bernoulli dropout. And we also notice that uh, use uh, the previous layers information of following layers could improve the model performance. So which inspire us to introduce this to a deep GN model, because uh, we know that for deep GN models, the node representation loses expressive power. So we can uh, introduce the expressive power in the first layer or second layer to the following layers to maintain the expressive power of uh, this graph neural network. Uh, so next step is uh, we're going to talk about this over smoothing problems in graph neural network. We first did many experiments on different dropout schemes on this deep graph neural network. We increased the layer to 64 layers. And we can see that uh, the LCD, this uh, layer compensation dropout uh, performs uh, much, much better than the other uh, uh, graph neural network models when the layer goes very deep. It means that at the information from the first layer or the second layer to the following layer really works, really maintain the expressive power of graph neural network. Uh, and then we theoretically study uh, this over smoothing problems. We define this over smoothing problems uh, as a convergence problem, uh, the same with uh, the paper they published in uh, 2019. So if a uh, node embedding converges to this over smoothing subspace, then we say that over smoothing problem occurs. And we also define this over smoothing layer, uh, which means that uh, it is the minimum number of layer that reach the over smoothing subspace. So uh, if a dropout scheme have higher, uh, have larger uh, over smoothing layer, then it means that it converges slower to the over smoothing subspace. Okay. And then we have some propositions and a corollary. Um, 
So basically, uh, this color states that uh, when we drop on drop out on edge or when, or when we drop out on nodes, um, we possibly can uh, alleviate uh, the first motion problems, but we need to drop certain uh, nodes or certain edges to realize this goal. So not all the edge or not all the nodes can help us to alleviate over smoothing problems. But it just can alleviate the, the over smoothing problem, but it can never help us to perfectly solve these problems. And we also find that dropout uh, feature uh, cannot help us with this uh, over smoothing problem. Okay, uh, so this is a conclusion, uh, some of the conclusion of this paper. Uh, so first, we carefully study different dropout schemes for graph neural network. Uh, and second, we uh, also see uh, how dropout can help us alleviate over smoothing problem. And uh, the, for the future work, uh, I think we are going to focus more on this guided uh, dropout for graph neural network because all the current graph uh, dropout schemes are random dropout. Uh, for example, for example, we random drop out some uh, edge or nodes. But in future, we can uh, do some more guided dropout. Uh, the model can realize which nodes or which ad they're going to drop. Okay, so that is all for our presentation. Thank you. Okay, great. So I think that's uh, we are indeed like just like borderline running out of time. So, so, uh, so I propose to go to to the last uh, presentation of today. So for the last one, we we would have a surge ontological. Uh, then, okay, so ontological learning for fast, accurate, and robust hierarchical multi-level classification. So let's listen to this last presentation before we conclude. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work, Search Ontological Learning for Fast, Accurate, and Robust Hierarchical Multilabel Classification. I'm the speaker, Shang Yan, and the authors are me and my advisor, Bill Hao, and we're from University of Washington. Hierarchy and graph structure domains are becoming ubiquitous for learning tasks on and off the web. For example, Gene ontology has facilitated a lot of research in biological domain, specifically for protein and gene function prediction. Another well-known ontology is WordNet, which has advanced development in natural language processing research. There are also other ontologies in urban domain, such as Microsoft Research has proposed digital twins definition language ontology for smart cities. And there's also other research that regarding uh, web page classification using on, an ontology. We collaborate with a nonprofit organization to classify online discourses on social media onto sustainable development goals and social progress indexes. These are two humanitarian ontologies from United Nations. And the data set that contributed to the boom of computer vision research in the last decade is also organized in a hierarchical structure. But despite the opportunity for supervision, this relationship among labels, this child parent relationship among labels are often ignored. For example, the ImageNet data set led to LXNet, ResNet, and VGG, but this architecture ignored the hierarchical structure of the labels. So, hierarchical multi label classification is trying to utilize these relationships to facilitate better classification. We would like to define a hierarchical multi-label classification problem first. Given a label hierarchy where the edges represent parent-child relationships, and we have a space of input instance, hierarchical multi-label classification problem aims to find a function that map the input instance onto the label hierarchy. And this predictive, predicted 
labels have to follow the hierarchy constraints. So when does hierarchical violation occur? And we would like to offer a few scenarios to elaborate. So in this first scenario, uh, the fake circles means predicted labels. So the model predicted A, B, C, D nodes in this ontology. And in this, in this scenario, all predicted nodes follow the hierarchical constraints. So there's no hierarchical violation. And one thing to emphasize that the model is not required to predict the children of the, the nodes. So if you can see here, F node is not included in the prediction and that is okay when it comes to hierarchical constraint. In the second scenario, the predicted label is D only. And because the model does not predict no A and B, so it violates the hierarchical constraint. And in this scenario, we, the hierarchical violations are two. In the third scenario, A, D, and E are predicted, but it fails to include no B, which is the parent of no D and E. So this scenario also violates the hierarchical constraint. And in several hier hierarchical multi-level classification problem, um, the machine learning models produce output in probability form. So we would like to dis discuss those scenarios as well. So in this scenario, um, the outputs are formed instead, instead of a binary label. So in prob probability terms, the children nodes, the probability of the children nodes needs to be lower or equal to the parent nodes. So in this scenario, no B, the probability of no B as a parent um, is lower than no D and no E, and that violate the hierarchical constraint. And no A, the probability of no A is also lower than the children no E, so that one also violate the hierarchical constraint. So in hierarchical multi-level classification problem, avoiding hierarchical violations are the main focus. Wehrman et al. proposed two networks to handle hierarchical multi-level classification tasks, HMCNF and HMCNR. HMCNF is a feed-forward network and each layer represents one depth, one level of the ontology. So the network parameters increase significantly as the hierarchy grows. HMCNR is a recurrent architecture, and both networks are optimized by a global and a local loss. And they adopted post-processing to make sure the outputs follow the hierarchical constraints. Gwinjilia proposed co coherent hierarchical multi-level classification network, and this network has a hierarchy coherent layer to produce coherent predictions by construction. However, these networks are computational expensive, and current studies have not considered di consider directly embedding the ontology into their framework. And even though this, the authors of the existing work designed their network based on trying to avoid hierarchical violations, but none of the studies actually evaluate empirically whether or not any hierarchical violations occur. So in this paper, we propose a framework search to perform hierarchical multi-label classification with ontology learning. The framework learns a representation for the label ontology and then uses the representation as the labels for multi-label classification learning. 
and we also introduce global hierarchical violation to comprehensively measure whether predicted results from a hierarchical multi-level classification model violate hierarchical constraint. This is a diagram of search. First, we apply a graph autoencoder onto the label hierarchy and learn the node embeddings. And this node embeddings would capture the relationship between the nodes and the parent-child relationships. And then we use a feedforward network to um, map the input instance onto the node embedding space with cosine similarity. And finally, the model is optimized with binary cross entropy and produce probability confidence as outputs. We consider 20 datasets across multi, uh, multiple domains used as benchmark in previous studies. And this data sets consists of protein function prediction, annotation of medical images, and text classification. Here's a summary of the benchmark data sets. These data sets are particularly challenging for neural networks for multiple reasons. First, you can observe that the training examples are relatively low. It range from hundreds to a couple thousands. And for neural network to train properly, you, we would need sufficient training data to, for the large para parameters. Secondly, the number of features vary significantly across the data sets. And third, the hierarchy exhibit a wide range of depth and number of classes. You can see we have uh, trees with only 50 classes and trees with thousands of labels. And the depth also range from 3 to 12. And we adapt the area under the average precision rec recall curve as our metrics to evaluate uh, the mo model performance. And this is following the previous study. Even though thre thresholding is a common practice to acquire binary prediction, but selection of the threshold value is difficult to obtain and arbitrary. That's why we use a more fair way to evaluate the performance of the model. And we also apply global hierarchical violation to examine if there are any hierarchical violations occur. And global hierarchical violation is defined as the total number of occurrence of the ancestor node associated with the lower probability in all valid node pairs. So in the scenario A that we have, we have encountered before, because node B, the probability of node B is lower than its children, node D and E, so that count as one occurrence. And because node A is also lower than node E, that counts another occurrence. So in this scenario, the global hierarchy violation will be two. And we also aware that global hierarchy violation has a blind spot. Consider the scenario in the figure B. It remains the similar predicted probability pattern a scenario A, but with much lower probability confidence. And this could generate by noise. And in real life applications, most set the thresholds around 50%. And the violation happens in this scenario will be irrelevant. So the global hierarchy violation is designed to detect all hierarchy violations and we encourage future hierarchical multi-classification research to incorporate, in, incorporate this metric in the evaluation purpose. Here's the result in our paper. In the last row, average ranking is the average of the rankings compared to other compatible algorithms among all the assets. And all other numbers are represented in AUPRC. Our model search is outperforming all competitive algorithms 
in 17 out of 20 data sets. This chart helps us to better visualize the perf performance of our model. The x-axis is the margin of between a model performance and the solar number, the state-of-the-art number. And we can observe that our model, the red dots, demonstrate dominance among fun and go data sets. And even when we are not the best, our model remains competitive. Then we apply global hierarchy validation to our model to examine ex if the predictions follow the hierarchical structure. There are no occurrences of hierarchy violations in any of the 20 data sets. We also perform global hierarchy violation for CHMCNN in fund data sets, and CHMCNN also achieves zero hierarchy violations. Then we perform ablation analysis to evaluate the contribution from ontology learning. And we can observe that with ontology learning, it produced significant improvement compared to without ontology learning. So in this analysis, we can observe that the ontology learning helps to um, improve the performance. And last but not least, we also perform training time analysis compared to CHMCNN. And we can observe that our model is training significantly faster than CHMCNN, ranging from 5 to 40 times. In conclusion, CERT achieved the state-of-the-art result in hierarchical multi-label classification in 17 out of 20 benchmark datasets, and that it is hierarchy violation-free and computation efficient compared to competitive methods. And global, we also introduced global hierarchical violations, which fills the gap in hierarchical multi-level classification studies and allow future studies to evaluate hierarchical violations. And we also perform a number of so, auxiliary studies like to show the robustness of search and a significantly faster training time than competitive methods. Thank you for your attention, and please do not hesitate to email me if you have any questions, and the email is on the slide. Thank you. So, so hello everyone. So, apologies, it seems, it seems I've been disconnected again. So, well, in any case, uh, I wanted to thank you all for your participation in, in today's event. So, it was the first edition that we ran uh, on this uh, workshop, that's, whose goal was to to look at the connection between graph and learning. And so it was this first inter international workshop on graph learning. We've had plenty of wonderful talks in a variety of topics using yeah, a variety of methodological tools as well. So it's been, I think, a fascinating uh, event. And yeah, so before we conclude, I wanted to thank you all for your participation. I also to thank my two organizers. So clearly, Fang has been uh, the driving force behind this, this event. So Fang Chia, who unfortunately is not here anymore, and Charu Agawan was also like extremely useful in this organization. So I, I thank you all for, for, uh, for being with us, and, and I will conclude.